Block 2. He probably doesn't think like that. How should I say it? It's hard to come up with such a vile idea, and he wouldn't be able to carry it out. I think he'll just figure out a way to raise the money and pick her up. When I said that, he said, I wonder. And shook his head, yeah. I guess this guy doesn't just have one screw loose, but dozens. I have to stop thinking about this guy so much. I can't understand what he's thinking just by trying to be understanding. He's a pervert. It's hard to understand how a pervert thinks. After all, that's what I'm the most worried about. Sir Henry, you're with Sir Kane a lot. What do you think of Sir Kane? Does he know how you think? I thought they were friends. After all, they were getting along well, talking and eating together. Oh, Kane, he's the best. He's the ideal human, beautiful, healthy, strong, and obedient. With that in mind, don't you think Kane makes good livestock? I've never told Kane that, but I'm sure he understands. I doubt it. I answered without thinking. Because I can't allow you to insult Sir Kane. Even if you didn't consider it an insult. Oh, you. You don't like being considered livestock. Sometimes humans are like that. The pigs, cows, and goats understand properly. Don't look at me with such a pitying look. It's not just me. Most people think the same way. Probably. Anyway, Sir Kane is definitely beautiful and strong. But obedience is a little different. If he thinks you're wrong, Sir Henry, he'll tell you that you're wrong. I wonder. Well, it's fine. Kane's been my favorite the last few years. But I've found something else to interest me. Chicky. Can we talk like this again? What activities do you want to do? You want to be able to read the books in the library? I don't think that's necessary for livestock. But I'll cooperate. Saying that, the sleazebag gave me a really annoying wink. Ah, I've had enough. When I'm with this guy I either feel sick or angry. No, I'm fine without your cooperation. I only came to the farm with you, sleazy, because you said you'd interfere with my plans. You made a promise, so please just don't disturb me. No matter how strong my language. Sleazy didn't mind, laughing, by Sleazy. Do you mean me? That's a funny name, ha ha. Uck, I need to get out of here soon. Ah, with the way things are going, let's go home. I thought, but Sleazy slowly approached me. His hands reached for my head. When I swiftly avoided with my mountain life agility, he looked confused. Don't avoid me. I just wanted to touch it because it's so shiny. I'll pat you gently. D don't judge me like you're at a fair. I didn't clean my hair just so sleazy could touch it. What's this, all of a sudden? No way. Please don't touch me. I'm going home. I took advantage of the way things were going and decided to go home. I'm being rude for a woman on a date, but I can't help it. I turned around and ran. Somehow I'll get picked up by a carriage on the way back. As I was wondering how far it was from here to the school, I heard Henry's voice. He was reciting a tanker. Oh no. A spell. I looked back. Henry was a long way off, so I tried to throw the thing in my skirt properly. But I was too late. My foot didn't move smoothly and the throw failed. When I looked at my feet, they were covered in ice. My legs wouldn't move. It was magic. I didn't make it. Don't run wild. I'll take you back to school. Now take my hand and I'll dispel the magic. Saying so. He reached out like a gentleman is courting a lady. No matter how you look at it, he is a refreshing smile. I raised my hand and thought of scratching his beautiful face. But what could I do? What would happen if I hurt him with, say, a secret weapon under my skirt? What if I was forced to quit school and leave? Could Mama Ku get in trouble? But I was afraid that such thoughts would make me unable to disobey, like livestock. Right. This country was originally formed when tame humans flocked around magicians, throwing away their fangs and claws. That's true, but I quietly put my hand in his, and he dissolved the spell. My feet were free. That's right, you. I'm sure you'll understand someday. Obeying magicians is what's best for humans. So I'm going to wait for you to come to me and ask me to pet your hair. I silently let him escort me. It may be natural for humans to flock like cattle and for magicians to think of them as livestock. But I still don't like it. As he was gently guiding me to the carriage, I lifted some pig dung with my toes and secretly dropped it into the cuff of Sleazy's clothes. When he gets home, Sleazy's family and servants will hate him and say, Uck, 
It smells like he put crap in his pockets. 77. Student activities 5. Going to the principal's office. Is that okay with everyone? I was speaking to Alan, Miss Charlotte, and Ritz, who were always together in class, about the signing event. Ultimately there were only four people in the signing event, including me. I wanted to get one from Sir Kane, too, but whenever I saw him that sleazy guy was always around. The number of signatures was low, but three of them were magicians, so maybe it will be okay. It would be more impressive if all the signers went to the principal's office, and today I needed to use everything I've got. Oh, you. Are you going to present that petition from before? All right. We'll come with you. Alan said, and Ritz and Charlotte agreed. I didn't even have to ask. How helpful. Oh, Chicky. Are you going to the principal's? Is it the petition? Will you be okay without me? See you after school, then. Thank you, everyone. I said, but I put my hands together in a cute pleading gesture. All right, I'm sure we'll be able to have a good conversation with the principal after school. Chicky, Chicky. How mean, you're ignoring me. There have been random noises around for a while now, but I haven't paid them any attention. I didn't care about them at all, but kind-hearted Charlotte sitting next to me seemed worried, looking at that person. Are you, Sir Henry has been trying to talk to you for a while. You know? Charlotte said into my ear anxiously, yeah, I know, I know, ah, it's no use ignoring him, even if I ignore him, he keeps talking to me without a care, Sir Henry, greetings, I'm sorry, I didn't notice you until now, ha ha, it's fine, but aren't you gonna be casual like before and call me sleazy, the pervert who likes being called sleazy has a cheerful face, this is bad, I'm the type of person who backs down if someone puts up a strong front. Sir Henry, what kind of business do you have with you all the time? Alan yelled. It's true, since my farm date with Sleazy, he's been all over me. Often he'll sit near me like this. Nothing in particular. I just want to talk to her. I like her. Hey, shut up. Don't say anything weird. You perverted bastard, Slee. Sir Henry, would you please stop using such strange language? I'm no longer fooled by the way this slender blonde pretends to be all handsome and shiny. I know you're always appending the words, as livestock, to your lines. Sir Henry, you like you? No way. Alan looked completely dumbfounded at this. Hey, minion. Aren't you a little too surprised? I do actually pay attention to my appearance. So it's not that strange that I'm popular. Well, in reality, Henry doesn't actually like me. It's just that he likes livestock. What? Nobody of the opposite sex has ever said they like me. Claude was totally like, not really. Wait, am I not popular? Is my girl power too low? B but I'm still a child. It'll start soon. After Sleazy made such an insinuating remark that my rude minion made a face like, there's no way my boss is that popular. I managed to compose myself. Ugh, I hate this. If this keeps on happening, I'm gonna get a stomach ulcer from the stress. After school, we all went to the principal's room with a leather sofa, a large stone table, and a plush carpet. The room was impressive, befitting the chief of the academic world. I see. There are three signatures, all of whom are magicians. The principal nodded, looking over the petition again. By the way, didn't you hear anything from Mr. Henry? I actually spoke to him as well. He told me with a cheerful face. His eyes seemed to say, I've been doing my best, too. I know, teacher. Because of that, I had to go on a farm date. Sir Henry and I don't get along. Unfortunately. Oh, is that so? Mr. Henry is a good-hearted student, so I thought he'd help out. That's too bad. All right, I'll accept this petition for now a good-hearted student, yeah, Sleazy does look good on the outside, for the time being, he kept the documents, I suppose the rest is up to the king, however, the principal's reaction wasn't very good, were there not enough people after all, knock knock, it's me, I'm coming in, I heard a loud voice and the principal's door opened, it was a tall man who parted his black hair to one side, I've seen him before, this is the magic teacher and vice principal, Professor Thomas, it's good to see you. The principal happily stood and urged the vice principal to sit next to him. 
Actually, there's something I want to you to see. Me and these students are. Oh, aren't you Mr. Ritz? The vice principal seemed a little troublesome, but as soon as he saw Ritz he got excited. I wonder what's going on. He might be an opponent here to mess with us. Ritz seems more like the cute, naive type. I'm surprised to see Mr. Ritz in the principal's office. What's going on? Professor Thomas, sorry to bother you. Actually, we had a request for the principal. Ritz and the vice principal started talking together. Unlike Alan, Ritz has common sense and won't say anything weird. So it should be okay. He just needs to be careful in the clutches of an opponent. While I was watching the conversation between Ritz and the vice principal, Alan, sitting next to me, whispered in my ear. Vice principal Thomas is our magic class teacher, and since his best element is fire, He's very lenient to Ritz and the other students who are good with fire. Even though fire magic isn't very useful. R, that's right. When Ritz and I went to the market together last year, he said he was good at fire magic. But fire magic is unpopular or something because it can't be used without embers. So it's not easy to use. I wonder if that teacher being good at an unpopular element like fire magic is the reason he favors students in the same situation. But other matters in this petition. Necessary? They seem trivial. Said the teacher with the neatly parted hair, who was looking over the petition after hearing Ritz's explanation. H. How rude. It is necessary to me. I need it. Although I was a little irritated, I decided I would explain it to the vice principal. As an example, if you reduce the number of magic history lessons, the time can be spent on other lessons. At the Mana Drain event, we were required to hike a lot, but we didn't have the physical strength. I think that a physical education class is needed, rather than a magic history class. In addition, if the library is a little more open, more people will use it and the quality of students as a whole will improve. HMMF, the neatly parted Professor Thomas snorted, and returned the petition to the principal. Well, this has nothing to do with me. Also, I have something important to discuss with the principal right now. Sorry, but would you please make your way out? What's up with this teacher? What a difference from the way he talked to Ritz. How annoying. Though I was a little worked up, we didn't have a reason to resist, so we left the principal's office quietly. As we left, he said to Ritz, Ritz, keep doing your best. Let's stir up our fire magic and gave him a gentle hit on the shoulder. F favoritism isn't right. 78. Student activities 6. Miss Katerina attacks. Even when I check with the principal, he just starts sweating and says, please wait a little bit longer. I guess it was tough with that number of people. After all, I thought so, maybe it would be better to do a signature event for real. Assuming Sleazy is already out of the question. Another strong candidate would be Miss Katerina. When we were first years, she was at the top of the first year girls faction, but now that we're second years, it feels like she's the boss of all the girls from first to third years. WH what a scary girl. But she's always glaring at me. So it's hard to ask for her help. Still, I stole a glance at Miss Katerina in the auditorium before classes, and as usual she was staring at me. What's more? Her glare seemed more powerful than usual. She always averts her eyes, as if to say, Humphrey, it's just that our gazes met. But today, she isn't averting her eyes so easily. Rather, she keeps glaring as she approaches. Ah, she came right up to me. Miss Ryu, do you have some time right now? Miss Katerina stopped in front of me, looking down at me with crossed arms as I sat. Her usual gang was gathered behind her. You until class starts. That's fine. Actually, everyone says you've been getting a little carried away recently. Did you know? A, carried away? I felt like saying, same goes for you with all those followers behind you. No, I was unaware. When I answered like that, one of her followers said something like, how conceited, no wonder she's getting carried away. WH what's the matter with these children? I don't remember accumulating such hate. Then the crowd of followers chimed in with things like, don't get carried away just because Sir Alan and Sir Henry pay attention to you. They're just playing with you. Oh, I see. Setting Alan aside, Sir Henry might be sleazy inside, but he's good looking and popular with the kids who don't know the real him.
I guess they're jealous because Sleazy is hanging around me recently. Damn it, Sleazy. You're always making trouble for me. No matter what I say to the Sleazy lovers, they'll just say, how insolent. While I was thinking about what to do, Alan stood in between Miss Katerina and me. What do you want with you? He stood proudly in front of Miss Katerina with his arms crossed, as expected, my henchman. Oh, Sir Alan. Greetings. I'm just talking with Miss Yu. This has nothing to do with you. Yu is certainly a bit sassy, but you have no right to tell her that. It felt like there were sparks flying between Katerina and Alan. Alan, I know you're trying to protecting, and I'm grateful, but what's this sneakily agreeing that I'm sassy? henchman. Why? She's just an ordinary human. Aren't you a magician? Katerina shouted suddenly. Since she was always so stuck up and left the work of yelling to her followers, looking on elegantly from afar, I was surprised. Not just me. The girls around her looked surprised, too. Yeah, so what? Does me being a magician mean there's some kind of problem between you and me? Alan said, and Miss Katerina fell silent with a look of extreme frustration. Then, as the teacher came in, Miss Katerina and her entourage left, looking embarrassed. A sexy girl at the back of the group, in passing, patted my shoulder and gave me a look as if to say, good luck. Oh, she's definitely the one who warned me to watch out for Miss Katerina after the vacation. Miss Salome. Uck. Since I started my second year, not only has Sir Henry noticed me, as livestock, Miss Katerina has also noticed me and I was called sassy by my own henchman. For now, I think my henchman and I need to have a little talk. After the incident with Miss Katerina, she began to attack me a lot. Sometimes I had to deal with Miss Katerina. Sometimes I had to deal with Sleazy, so my breaks were very busy. If Alan didn't do his best to step in sometimes, I'd go bald. The kind-hearted Miss Charlotte was worried that it might be her fault, but she's fine. Miss Katerina thinking I'm insolent seems to be unrelated to Miss Charlotte. A although I don't think I'm being sassy, however, after hearing her speak over the course of several attacks, I get the impression that she doesn't like that someone like me who can't use magic is friends with magicians. No way. Isn't that the same sleazy way Henry thinks? I thought anxiously, but she doesn't seem to have Henry's sheltered lack of common sense, she just thinks something like, magicians should stick to other magicians. The way she thinks of magicians, they shouldn't get along with people who aren't magicians more than necessary. Therefore, she got annoyed when they were on good terms with me. Well, even if she's upset by that, I can't do anything about it. I mean, isn't it funny to point her spear at me? Shouldn't she be aiming at Alan, the magician? Despite that thought, it's clear that Miss Katerina thinks of me as the enemy. No matter how frustrated she is, I can't help but get along with Charlotte, Alan, and Ritz. Lately, just Henry's opposition has been wearing me down. I'm not sure I can manage Miss Katerina's too. It's way too late for Henry, but I was hoping I could still have a relationship with Miss Katerina. What can I do? Would she like to fight Alan and beat him to a pulp but I think he'd get cold feet dueling against a girl. And since Alan has that kind of personality, even if he took part in the duel, I don't think it would be a savage enough duel for Miss Katerina. If I can make Miss Katerina's animosity disappear, she might feel good about the signing event. While I was thinking and waiting for Alan and company by the library, I saw someone heading toward me. I'm still going to the library with everyone. But lately the magic classes have been running long, so I often wait alone in front of the library elevator. When I heard the footsteps, I thought, oh, everyone's here, finally. But the distant silhouette isn't Alan and the others, it looks like a group of schoolgirls. Isn't that Miss Katerina at their head? Her ringlets are bouncing. Why is she here? To be clear, we are the only students who regularly use the library. Greetings, Miss Wu. Katerina approached and greeted my with a sneer, so I decided to return the greeting. Greetings. How did you all come to be here together? Miss Katerina had a squad of about seven girls behind her. We decided to come here so that we could talk to you alone. Don't you always gather in the library? You're such good friends. But aren't you tired, talking to magicians as though you're on the same level? Miss Katerina had a roundabout way of talking. So, what's your point? You're so impatient. Fine. Actually, 
I've got something good to tell you. Why don't you come with me? You're tired of only hanging out with magicians, right? I'm a magician, but I have a lot of friends who aren't magicians, too. I'd like to introduce you to some of my friends who aren't magicians. I'm sure you'll get along right away. Miss Katerina's network. Certainly. Miss Katerina has many friends, or at least a lot of minions. I'm happy to be introduced, for the sake of the signing event, but, I'm happy to be introduced, but I'm not going to quit being friends with Alan and the rest. At my declaration, Miss Katerina's face, which had a generous smile, distorted, but why, wouldn't you rather be with people in the same position as you? I don't really think about our situations, though, Miss Katerina, when you make friends with someone, do you only look at their position? When I said that, her face turned red and she began to tremble, there were wrinkles between her brows. She was very angry, I could feel the heat of her anger, it feels like her ringlets are sharpening into drills. She must be the type who gets angry easily, Miss Katerina. It's a little like Callan when he was five. While I was studiously observing her, Miss Katerina raised her right hand. Is this the slap? But isn't she out of reach to slap me? There's a little distance between us, you know? I was scared of a slap attack, but apparently it wasn't a slap after all. And one of her followers put an egg in her hand. The other followers are also holding eggs from their baskets. Oh, those baskets were full of eggs. I was wondering why everyone had baskets. The ladies grabbed eggs and held them up. Only looking at position. Aren't you guys only seeing me as a magician? With a shriek from Miss Katerina, raw eggs were simultaneously launched at me. What kind of line is that? I don't understand what you're talking about. I mean, what a waste. Eggs are expensive. I caught some of the eggs about to hit me. Juggled some more that fell close to me with my toes while putting the other eggs in my pockets. Then kicked them up and caught them with my hands. I got eight eggs. Eight eggs. I'm so happy. Eggs are expensive. Are these fresh? I got a little anxious and asked the question uppermost in my mind, but the ladies had gone into a huddle. No, what am I going along with? Although freshness is certainly important. That's not important right now. They tossed eggs at me. This is unforgivable. Throwing eggs. Incredible boiled eggs. How can you throw a delicious omelette at someone? Ah, it's no use. My thoughts go straight to cooking eggs. Because I got eight eggs. I'll find out whether it's fresh when I break the shell, so I need to get home right away and try breaking the eggs. T that's what I mean by impudent. I just noticed. Miss Katerina's face is getting redder and redder. Ah, sorry. I'm just crazy about eggs. Sorry. B besides, I'm not ignoring it. It's true. I'm aware it's not the time to be throwing out egg recipes. You shouldn't throw eggs at people. Charlotte also had a taste. A terrible experience where she cried because someone threw an egg and dirtied her skirt. With the stress piling up from sleazy, my signature activity not going well, and on top of everything Miss Katerina attacking me, I was on the verge of an anger explosion. Okay, Miss Katerina. When I called her name imperiously, Miss Katerina's shoulders jumped and she gave me a cautious look. I managed to puff up my chest and speak with a loud voice to intimidate the ladies. At the next school break, please gather your friends and come to the vacant lot. I'm going to teach you what real ball throwing is. Miss Katerina and her friends looked at me with stunned faces, realizing I'd caught all the eggs. 79. Student Activities 7. Preparation for real ball throwing. I'd be a little embarrassed if we were found talking here. Would you let me in? I guess so. She spoke while fiddling with a scarf covering her. So for some reason, I brought her into my room and had her sit down for the time being. I wonder what's going on. The other day I told them about real ball throwing, so I wonder if Miss Katerina's faction sent one person over as a lone spy. Your room is very messy, did something happen? Miss Salome frowned, looking down at the things scattered all over the floor. Cotton beast leather, and a sewing set are strewn around, no, it's not always this messy, today I'm preparing, I'm preparing, today is special, if I'd known in advance that you were coming, Miss Salome, I would have tidied up, today I was preparing for, the thing with Miss Katerina, when I mentioned Miss Katerina's name, 
Salem instantly turned from gazing at the dirty room to look at me. Yes, I needed to ask you about that. What in the world happened? What in the world, didn't you hear? Miss Salom, aren't you one of Miss Katerina's followers? Furthermore, she gives the impression of being in the inner circle of followers, always together with them. No, I only heard a summary. Something about throwing balls on the day off? Did you promise to do that? Miss Katerina was talking about it to some girls we know. Yes, that's right. They seem to like throwing things, so I thought I should teach them how to throw a ball for real. I don't understand what you mean. With wide eyes, Miss Salome broke in vigorously. Oh, yeah, I thought, thinking rationally, what I said doesn't make sense, does it? Because, you know, I'd gotten some eggs, so I was a little excited. Yeah, but if this strategy goes well, it should be able to open all kinds of doors. Setting that aside, approximately how many girls was Miss Katerina talking to? I asked a question thinking since I'd send information her way. She'd send a little information my way. Miss Salome put her finger to her chin and thought a bit. Somehow everything Miss Salome does is adult, I mean mature. Yeah, let me think. How many? Um, as I recall. About fifteen people. Miss Katerina is always surrounded by girls so it's only natural she'd invite them, right? Fifteen people. That's not too many. Just in case. I think I'll call on Alan and Ritz and have them invite some people. Ritz is so good-natured that he has a lot of friends. Hey, wait. Setting that aside, would you tell me how things turned out like this? Since Miss Salon was so frantic, I figured I'd better explain the situation right away. After all, Miss Salome wasn't in the basket holding group back then. Apparently some of the girls, including Miss Salome, had been doing something like stalling Alan's group so they were late meeting me. When I finished explaining, Miss Salome had a strange expression. Hey, did Miss Katerina really say that? Only looking at position. Aren't you guys only seeing me as a magician? Yes. I'm sure that's what she said. I have confidence in my memory. So that's how it is. Miss Katerina. Miss Salome put her hand to her mouth with a troubled look. I don't get it. This girl should be about the same age as me. So why is she so weirdly erotic? Isn't she only 11 or so? This sexy pouting is dangerous. That curly hair is natural, right? How nice. If they ever hold a beauty pageant at this school. She could be a powerful rival for me. I'll have to see if I can make some kind of sexy one piece for myself. No, rather I should see if I can borrow a little of her sexy mannerisms. Well then, I've heard all I wanted to hear. I'll see myself out in the end. I didn't understand that it wasn't you doing it. Before I knew it, while I was thinking about how to become more beautiful, Miss Salome started getting ready to leave. She put the scarf over her head. I think it was meant to be a disguise. R. Yes. Be careful not to let anyone see you. Of course. She said, winked, and left the room. But I mean, a scarf. I wonder if that disguise will actually work. It seems like it would just stand out more. Hey. I just heard. You. You're finally going up against the Katerina sect? When I got to school, Alan was sitting in his usual seat with a wide smile. Yes. You're well informed. Ritz told me. You, you're so reserved. If you're going to do this, take the time to tell me, too. Next to Alan, who was going a little wild, Ritz raised his hand in greeting. R. Ritz has a lot of acquaintances, so I suppose he heard it through them. Oh, I'm sorry. It was only recently decided. Also, it seemed to be some kind of important contentious battle to Alan. Really, Ritz? You are quick to hear. Did you hear it from someone? Yes, I did. I think most of the second years have heard about it by now. There's a big rumor that the mysterious countess is moving at last. There's actually a rumor? I mean, the mysterious countess. Is that supposed to be me? But there's nothing mysterious about me. Well, whatever. If they already know, it'll make this conversation quick. So, I need a little favor from you, Ritz. Why are you asking Ritz? I'm right here. As I was talking to Ritz, Alan snorted and broke in, perhaps because he misunderstood it as a battle breaking out. Alan got excited and stood up to run somewhere. Well, Alan, if you're up to it, I'd like to gather a few more people. 
hopefully around 10, after school. 10 people, I got it, Ritz, don't you know quite a few, why don't you choose some people? Alan gave Ritz his instructions with an awkward face. You just tasked Ritz after all, and after giving Ritz his instructions, Alan sat there with an attitude of having somehow finished his work. Sorry, Ritz, this boy really, I'm sorry. I apologize, so please continue being a good friend. Ten people? That's fine. But won't this be dangerous? Ritz gave me a worried look. It's okay. It's not dangerous. I think. Probably. I don't think it'll be dangerous. It will be a little tiring, but fun. I miss you. Me too. I'll come, too. Charlotte spoke timidly but raised her hand with a declaration. Maybe she still thinks the thing with Miss Katerina is her fault. That's actually not the case. But I appreciate that she'd join us. Thank you. Miss Charlotte. Then come to the vacant lot near the library. After school. As I spoke. Alan listened eagerly, Charlotte looked scared, Ritz seemed curious, and they all nodded. 80. Students Activities 8. Finally, the day of the climactics battle. The magician children's class seemed to have gone long, and all the kids gathering now are those who couldn't use magic. Miss Salem had also come. At the moment Miss Katerina and her friends hadn't come, but I thought I'd give a quick overview of the rules to those who are here now. Of dodgeball. I called everyone onto the court I traced with my foot in the dirt and explained the rules. Divide into two teams. If the ball hits you, you're out and become an outfielder. If a ball touches the dirt, you won't be out even if it hits you. People in the outfield can hit the enemy team to get back in. Faces are safe. The balls were soft balls I made on my day off by stuffing cotton and sewing leather. They don't bounce, but they're light and don't hurt much so they're good balls for beginners. Apparently the children in this world don't play ball games much, and it took some time to explain, but eventually they understood. The boys looked especially interested. They seemed eager to get started quickly. Dodgeball is good because it is simple rules for a ball game. While I was doing that, the magician's class seemed to let out, and the rest of the players trickled over. Come on, I'm here. What the heck did you want to say to me? Miss Katerina stood in front of me, her arms folded. This is dodgeball, I've already explained the rules to those who came early, but I'll explain again. And giving that introduction, I explained the rules again to the magician kids. During my explanation, the kids who had already heard the rules started throwing the balls and practicing. They're enthusiastic. I see, so the goal is to grab the balls and annihilate the enemy. Alan had a dangerous expression, but I think he understood it, and he went to join a group who was already practicing their ball throwing. No, Alan, we're about to start the match. Don't practice. Get on the court. As for choosing teams, if you look at the number of people who've gathered, there are a lot of girls. Let's divide into a team of magicians and boys, and a team of girls who can't use magic. That's just about half and half. Now then. Everyone divide up into teams and and get on the court. The boys enthusiastically took their places, and although the other children were swept up in their momentum and began to move, Miss Katerina stared at me with a dissatisfied expression. I feel like her ringlets are sharper than usual. I was working myself up over what you were planning. I can't go along with such a dumb thing. Katerina turned red with indignation. I think it's a much dumber thing to throw eggs. Well, it's fine. They were delicious. Why am I on Katerina's side? I prefer you's team. I heard my henchman complaining, but I'll let it pass, because I could hear a girl on my own side complaining. I agree with Miss Katerina, but Miss Katerina is on the other team. On the other hand, the eager boys said, This team is almost all men, so you can have the balls first, and giving the girls team a head start with the balls. About half the kids are enthusiastic and half aren't. Ahem. I'd better do something to keep the momentum going. I could make a sort of anyway. Let's have fun. Appeal. Miss Katerina, you love throwing balls. We've gone to all this trouble. Why not enjoy it? I suggested with a smile. Why? Why should I do this with someone like you? Kaya. Miss Katerina's confident speech was interrupted part way through, as a ball was thrown at Miss Katerina. The ball that was thrown hit her in the side. Including me, 
We all looked in shock at the person who'd hit Miss Katerina with the ball. It seemed like such an unexpected person to throw the ball. It was the knight-like girl who always served Miss Katerina. In Miss Katerina's faction, she was the one always by her side. Miss Katerina also froze with an astonished face, and called the girl's name with shaking lips. Sar Salome. Why? Because that's the rule. Miss Katerina, what happened to you? You've always liked to make mischief like this, haven't you? Salome. Miss Katerina said, and after her frozen shock, her expression grew conflicted, as if she wasn't sure whether to be angry, or happy, or cry. I it didn't hurt, actually, it did hurt. A hey, and don't go telling childhood stories about how I liked to make mischief. Although Miss Katerina sounded angry, she looked happy, and picked up the ball which had fallen at her feet. Hey, the ball is light, it shouldn't hurt. But is it fine to consider the game as begun? It was a little forceful, but Miss Katerina looks motivated. All right, let's just call that the start of the match. Miss Katerina hefted the ball and looked straight at Miss Salome. Yeah, she's motivated. Salome, let's play together again. Sorry, Miss Katerina, but you got hit in the stomach just now, so you're out. Would you please go to the outfield? That was close. I'm happy Miss Katerina's motivated but she doesn't seem to understand the rules well. She's already out. She can't just pick up the ball and throw it. The game has already started. Hey, don't interrupt me. You're still so impudent. Man. Miss Katerina threw out a parting line in a huff, handed the ball to the boy behind her, and stomped off to the outfield. Oh good. She was a little angry so I wondered what she would do but I guess she's okay with the game having fully started. After seeing Miss Katerina participating, the girls around me got involved without any further problems. Alan looks dissatisfied with the team division, but he's the kind who'll stay if I say, stay. No problem. In the end, I led the women's team to an overwhelming victory. After all, nobody's used to the balls. Some people were throwing them like soccer toss-ins with both hands and others threw with way too much force, driving the ball into the ground a meter away. There's no way they could catch anything. I could just mow them down. I had a superpower. Charlotte, who was supposed to be on the enemy side, praised me, saying, Amazing. Miss you. Amazing. So I got a little carried away. After that, we were very excited and played a second and third game in a row, but my team won. I wonder if I should go pro. Right now. I could take on the world, after a few matches, everyone seemed to be getting tired and breathing raggedly. Alright, let's get down to the main business, how about it, everyone, was that fun? I actually have an announcement, I'm currently petitioning the principal to change our lesson subjects. I asked him to reduce the number of magic history classes and incorporate physical education classes to train our bodies. Think of physical education as a class where you can get some moderate exercise, as we did today. There are some other subjects on the principal's petition, but if you'd like to get some more basic exercise with a ball like this, please sign here. At first, everyone looked at me with poker faces, but then one of the boys said, Today was fun, I'll sign, and eventually almost everyone who had participated today signed my petition. Hooray, thank you. It was worth making balls all night. However, although I thought Miss Katerina would be happy to sign it, she didn't budge. She was still looking at me with a grudge. After all, what's going on? Weren't we just sweating and playing dodgeball together? You were pretty good at running away. Wasn't it fun, right? However, from Miss Katerina's unmoving side the slender and mature Miss Salome jumped out. Miss Ryu, I'll write my name as well. I had fun. Thank you. Miss Salome, come to think of it. We were able to get started thanks to her ball hitting Miss Katerina. Really, thanks for everything. But I wonder if her relationship with her boss, Katerina, will be alright. It seems like she's writing her signature on her own, so I'm a bit nervous. Sa, Salome. Sure enough. Miss Katerina tried to grab Miss Salome's arm and prevent her from signing. Didn't you have a lot of fun, too, Miss Katerina? This is more fun than a magic history class, don't you think so, Miss Katerina? Salome. Saying that, Miss Katerina looked down and began to tremble. Eh? Hey, what's wrong, is she crying at Miss Salome's betrayal? 
Miss Katerina? Miss Salome, confused, called out involuntarily. Then Miss Katerina said in a thin voice, Hey, call me like you used to. Oh no, I can't read her expression since her head's down. But with that shaking voice isn't she crying after all? Wh why is she crying? I don't know why she's crying. What should I do? I don't know how to handle a crying child. As I hesitated, Miss Salome put her hand on Miss Katerina's shoulder. Then Miss Katerina slowly raised her head to look at Miss Salome. Ah, Miss Katerina is crying after all. D don't cry. Somehow it feels like I lured Miss Katerina out and made her cry. I'm sorry it's been so long, Kate. M.M. Miss Katerina. Why are you crying? Your face is all wet. Please use this handkerchief to wipe off. When I hurried to thrust my handkerchief in front of the crying Miss Katerina, both she and Miss Salome, who was talking, looked at me dumbfounded. Oh, that's better. Miss Katerina's tears stopped. As I felt relieved, Miss Katerina's face turned redder and redder, and she surely scowled at me. No way. How scary. Wow. What are you doing breaking into our conversation? Really? Finally, finally Salome. Katerina yelled at me, crying, angry, Miss Katerina, will you calm down, huh, calm down, be but, your face is wet, I get it, I'll wipe it, sheesh, Miss Katerina snatched my proffered handkerchief and started wiping her face, saying, fine, fine, she's angry at something, I wonder if she's at a sensitive age, Miss Salome, who was standing next to her watching her happily suddenly turned to face me. I'll write my name. She held out her hand for the signature form. Eh? Is that okay? With Miss Katerina angry? Won't she start crying again? Although I was a little worried, I wanted those books, so I handed Miss Salem the signature form. She signed it easily. But I don't like how this looks after all, as Miss Katerina finished wiping her face and glared at me. I know. I get it. I have to sign, too. Now. Give me the paper. I'll make an exception and sign. I it's not for your sake. Eh, no way. Really? I don't understand what's going on, but I'm happy. I gave the paper to the sudden it's dear Miss Katerina, and then all the girls in the Katerina faction wrote their names as well. All right. I don't really get what happened with Miss Katerina, but I got a better harvest than I expected. I'm taking this signature form to the principal tomorrow. Author's note, I wrote a blog post just now. Actually, I got an illustration of you. I was so happy that I put it in my blog post. If you're interested, please come and see it. 81. Student Activities 9. The first and second year students these days. I'm glad I went all out, for the time being, since I had submitted the product of the signature event to the principal, I could only wait for the result. And while I was waiting, an unprecedented dodgeball boom gripped the young ladies and gentlemen of the school. First and second year students played dodgeball in the fields after school, during lunch, and eventually during the breaks between classes. But isn't the break between classes so short there's barely time to dodge? Can't we just rest? Can't we just do it after school, huh? These aristocrat kids, once addicted, were completely obsessed and spent all their precious free time every day playing dodgeball. Until a little while ago, they were proper aristocratic children. I wonder if it was really okay to spread dodgeball. I'm worried their parents will get mad at me and say, What kind of savage game did you teach my child? Re -e. And perhaps due to the popularity of dodgeball, there was a boom among the first and second year students of giving each other nicknames. Miss Salome, who was so helpful at the first dodgeball match, casually referred to Miss Katerina as Katerina, and I took advantage of the situation to call Charlotte Charlie or Char. Mwahaha. My, I wish I could have such a cute name. Lady Rue of the Certain Victory. Take a stick. When we gathered in the vacant lot after class to play dodgeball, a boy with a crew cut held a tube full of wooden sticks out to me. He's one of the second year boys. I pulled one of the sticks out of the tube and it had a red ribbon on it. If you pull a stick with a red ribbon, you're on the red team. It's a lottery to divide teams for dodgeball. Yes, the goddess of victory is on the red team. We won. A boy who also seems to be on the red team said, delighted and the white team looked a little disappointed. That's right, 
the you are the certain victory from earlier was my nickname. When we play dodgeball, my team usually wins, so they gave me that cringy nickname. I don't know who, but one of the people who loves dodgeball must be one of those 8th grade syndrome types. So whenever I play dodgeball they always use my complete nickname. I'd rather they used my normal name. It's even longer and harder to say than my original name. At first I was disappointed and said, I'd rather not. But apparently most of the first and second year students had 8th grade syndrome, and hyped it up, saying, it's super cool. Everyone else has nicknames, it's cool. So I let it go as is. I'm just embarrassed because I haven't caught the cringe myself yet. Everyone, aren't you too young to have 8th grade syndrome? Am I the only one embarrassed? For example, Miss Katerina is called Essential Court Supervisor for her ability to prevent balls from rolling away with her favored wind magic, but for some reason, she just accepts it with a face that doesn't seem displeased. Also, Charlie is called Miss Starting Bell, but that's for the shameful reason that she's always the first one to be hit with a ball. Still, she seems to be a little happy. She looks satisfied, as if to say, when the game starts I'm happy to step forward. And when I get hit, my job is done. Or is that my imagination? In addition, Alan, who's surprisingly athletic and a very good dodgeball player, is called Challenger Alan in praise of his bold spirit in catching any ball. Originally Alan, who loves nicknames, seemed happy, but later he whispered, I want a cooler name with more difficult words. A anyway, I'm on the red team for today's dodgeball game, as always. I'll do my best. Because I'm certain victory you. Ah, I can't. It's embarrassing after all. With the dodgeball boom and the nickname boom, I feel like the bonds between first and second years were getting deeper these days. There weren't many third year participants or above because their classes ran longer, but the upperclassmen who participated a little in the evenings were also welcome. Even if they're upper class students, they're still not too old to want to play. However, the problem is, Originally, I spread dodgeball because of the signature event, and I held the signature event for the petition to read library books. But the all-important petition affair was not moving forward at all. It seems like it's unexpectedly difficult to get a response, and when I checked on the progress with the principal who wasn't responding, he said, a little longer, wait a little longer, I'll do my best. And I feel like he started sweating hard. Somehow it seems like it's not working out. Why? You received it with such a happy feeling. Principal. The principal was so apologetic I couldn't blame him. But, he told me something like, we may need help from Sir Henry after all. But, I will absolutely never do that. Never. As I thought, I have to succeed as a merchant and gain name recognition by the time I graduate but there's no guarantee the petition will be accepted. No, don't think about it too much. I'll just do what I can right now. First of all, I'll open a market stall. I've saved enough money to be able to open a market stall, but I haven't been able to get started because I'm having a hard time deciding what to sell. At first, I thought it would be good to do lotions, but the alcohol and herbs used as ingredients are expensive as you'd expect. When the cost is high, the profit is low. On the other hand, if you set the price to match, the kind of customers you get in the market wouldn't buy beauty products like that. Mew, what's wrong? You look like you're not feeling well. It was Kane speaking, as he looked at my face anxiously. It's lunch break, but Sir Kane often has lunch with me these days. To tell the truth, Sir Kane is graduating this year, so we won't be able to see each other at school anymore. So over the past year, he's been trying to spend more time with his brother and his friends. That's Sir Kane for you. Such a gentleman. Well, that's not the only reason. The main reason is Sleazy. Sleazy kept bothering me and wouldn't take no, and Alan kept fighting back, so sometimes it caused a dreadful atmosphere. However, when Sir Kane and his followers join us, incredibly, the atmosphere relaxes. Um, I was thinking about the petition I submitted to the school, which doesn't seem to be working out. When I answered Sir Kane's concern, Sleazy, who was sitting next to him, butted in with his usual smile. That's why I told you to let me help out. Chicky, what's the point of acting so tough? Just think it over and take my hand. This guy. While I was thinking that and watching Sleazy, 
My henchman Alan slapped his hand away. That's right. Well done, minion. You doesn't need a hand from Uncle Henry. Don't, Alan. You might hurt me. Sleazy sighed at Alan sullenly. Sleazy shows faces to magicians that aren't that nasty smile. That disgusting smile of his is reserved for livestock, since he loves domesticated animals. As I watched the two interact, Charlotte, who was sitting next to me, brought her face furtively to my ear. Mew, you seem to hate Sir Henry for some reason, but why? I think he's really cool. Charlotte, no, don't tell me you're fooled by his appearance. After all, it's what's inside that counts. Sir Henry doesn't have a very good personality. Or should I say, I physically can't stand him. Oh, is that so? But Sir Henry is very popular. He's kind, he's cool, he's got strong magical power. Not to mention he's a candidate for the next king. Yeah, I know, I know, the current king has no magical children. So if something happens to him, his younger brother, Sleazy, may become king. There were four magicians born to the previous king. The first magician is the current king. The second born magician is a necromancer, so he can't take the throne. The third is dead, and the fourth is Sleazy. Furthermore, Sleazy appears to have great magical ability, and since he's an adult, wouldn't it be best to let him become king? That's the gossip. No way. I don't want to be a citizen of a farm kingdom ruled by Sleazy. Sir Henry is popular. My soft, troubled response faltered. What will happen if he becomes king? Yes, he's very popular. The king's wife is chosen from sorcerers with solid bloodlines. But women who can't use magic are often chosen as concubines. Many girls at school are aiming to be Henry's concubine. Wow, is that how it is? Sleazy's harem, Sleazy's farm. I mean, are schoolgirls really thinking about becoming concubines at this age? They're so precocious, but maybe it has something to do with how they're forced to become adults at 15. Speaking of which, when I visited Rainforest last vacation, I noticed that Alan received a huge number of much-making letters. Yeah, aristocrats are something else. Thinking about that, I looked at Alan, who was still bickering with Sleazy. The way things are, it seems like Alan isn't thinking about a fiancé yet. Sir Kane is next to Sleazy and Alan trying to calm them down. Sir Kane must be 14 already. He'll be an adult next year. I wonder if he's thinking about getting married. He he, knew. Do you like Sir Kane after all? Charlotte threw out while I was watching the Rainforest Brothers. Eh? What's this all about? Charlotte asking if I like Sir Kane. Well, if I have to say yes or no, then I like him. But, but Charlotte had a faint blush on her cheeks like she's getting all romantic. But Kane is still 14 years old. Certainly. Height wise, he's grown quite a bit. But, you know, his shoulders are still thin. He's just not my type yet. He has to be at least as old as I was in my previous life. I mean, I'm only 11. Isn't it too early to talk about our love lives? Didn't I say they were precocious? I like Sir Kane and respect him, but I don't feel the way you think I do, Miss Charlotte. When I replied, Charlotte looked very surprised and opened her mouth again. No way. Then are you actually into Sir Alan? No, not him either. I thought so. Of course it's not like that, I was a little surprised. Charlotte, you're laughing a lot. Weren't you a little too surprised? I, I don't think that badly of Alan, but, well, he's not a romantic target. He's a minion. Is Alan one of those boys who aren't that popular? I don't think his looks are bad, but, well, he's Alan. I feel a little sorry for my henchman. However, Alan is still a child, and probably hasn't fallen in love yet so he shouldn't care, when he hits puberty. I'm sure he'll quit being my henchman, become stylish, and be popular with girls. When that happens I'll quietly grant him independence. Come to think of it, it's about time for the mana drain, isn't it? Are you going shopping at the market again? All four of us are in the same group this year, so I'm looking forward to it. While Charlotte and I were talking romance, Ritz butted into the conversation. Oh, now that you mention it, the mana drain trip is coming up. Last year's mana drain trip was pretty rough. A demon attacked us. That time Henry. No, wait, Sir Kane was pretty cool. 
He was really amazing to be able to cut off a demon's arm. Ooh, everyone going to the market, that sounds like fun, I want to go. Charlotte agreed to Ritz's proposal. Yeah, I think that's good, too. This year the four of us will be grouping up for the mana drain, so I might be looking forward to it. Above all, this year Sleazy is in a different group. Last year I hadn't realized that Henry was Sleazy, but if I think about it, I might have had a bit of an inkling. Well, but this year my group members are good friends, so I'm sure it will be more fun than last year. 82. Student Activities 10. Uproar at the Mana Drain, Part 1. Therefore we needed to procure some overnight goods from the market. Charlotte and I weren't sure what we needed, but I'm a camper. I've gotten used to preparing for travel. At the market, the four of us had fun together and bought our overnight goods and some sweets, and finally the Mana Drain event came. I was really excited, but when I confirmed our members at the meeting spot, my excitement level suddenly dropped. The teacher leading us was that vice principal with the neatly parted hair. As I recall, his name was Vice Principal Thomas. As usual, he was partial to fire magicians, so as soon as he found Ritz he started regaling him with the splendor of fire magic. Alan, who had partnered with Ritz, got a little sulky. Although he was supposed to be the teacher guiding us, he seemed to have no intention of leading, instead droning on endlessly about the magnificence of fire magic. In his place, a fifth-year senior in the Knights College led us to our carriages, parted hair, do your job. Even though parted hair added stress, we reached our destination after ascending mountains for two days, in front of us stood a large lake. I'd heard that some of our rivers flowed from this lake, the lake is apparently at the bottom of a cliff so I'm a little scared to peer over at it, but it also feels like the great outdoors. Maybe negative ions really do give off a good feeling. Apparently, we're going to do the mana drain here. We'll apply magic to the lake, using the river flowing out of it as a kind of barrier. Last year it was a rope around a mountain, but this year it's a lake. I wasn't sure what to do and whether we'd be scattering salt again, but we really did scatter salt. Alan and the other sorcerers scattered salt around and then put some kind of alcohol into the lake, it was kind of like people cleaning up after a barbecue, then, Charlotte, Ritz, and the other spiritualists started casting spells while throwing stones, it's just like they're playing a game, but I can't say anything because their faces are so serious, I guess this sequence of meaningless actions is necessary for the mana draining, the mysterious ritual seemed to come to an end and the teacher leaned over to peer over the precipice, he was apparently checking the state of the mana drain, but I have no idea what he was looking for. Suddenly, Charlotte cried, gah, it hurts, and collapsed onto the parted hair teacher, and the teacher fell into the lake from the momentum. Ah, although Charlotte collapsed, she didn't fall into the lake, but the teacher fell off the cliff with a loud splash. Ah, teacher, I wasn't too worried. But I looked down anxiously and the neat-haired Professor Thomas was energetically treading water, so he seemed to be okay for now. T teacher. The students around me were also worried, looking at the fallen teacher. One of the magical students picked up some vines and dead grass from the ground and cast a spell to make a kind of rope. Ah, he must be making a rope to pull him up. Magic is so convenient. Well then, since I can't do anything there. I forgot about the teacher and turned to Charlotte, whose face had turned blue. Charlie, are you okay? I mean, I wonder why she bumped into the teacher. When I called to her, Charlotte looked at me with teary eyes, rubbing her legs. Review. It was an AC accident because something high hit me. Hey, don't cry, Charlie. I know you're really confused, but the teacher who fell is an adult, so he'll be fine. As I was rubbing her back and saying things like that. Charlotte kept rubbing her legs, near which lay a bloody hair. Is it unconscious? I wonder. Maybe Charlotte bumped the teacher because that rabbit hit her foot and surprised her. Certainly she's defending herself with teary eyes, crying. That thing, hit me, surprised me. I think we can safely say the rabbit hit her. But why is the rabbit covered in blood? I could see it getting knocked out when it ran into a girl's leg, but it's bleeding. And there's a wound as if something caught it. Wah-wah. I heard students screaming behind me. I looked through the bushes in the direction of the voices, 
and in the trees on the far side of the lake there was an enormous beast. We encountered a demon last year. Could it be a demon? That was my first thought, but looking closely, it was just an ordinary bear. No, wait, even bears are dangerous. During my time as a bandit, the boss even had fierce battles with bears sometimes. Maybe this bloody rabbit was the bear's prey. It must be that the rabbit ran away from the bear and hit the girl's leg at full force, while the bear frantically chased it. The bear seems to be watching the noisy students with bloodshot eyes. It might be agitated from playing with that rabbit just now. It's dangerous. I threw my standard chili bomb from my bag at the bear's nose. Bears are surprisingly timid. Most bears run away when something hits their nose. I was thinking that as I watched the bear, but although it howled and scraped at its nose, trying to remove the chili powder where the bomb exploded, it showed no sign of running. It must be hungry. If it won't run away, we have no choice but to kill it. As I was thinking that, Alan grabbed my arm and forced me down behind him, trying to advance to face the bear. Then he cast a spell, instantly equipping his right hand with a mighty sword. You, don't step in front of the bear. Why are you being so reckless right away? I'm here, rely on me. For some reason Alan was angry at me. Be but, I've lived in the mountains, and I was with the boss when he fought bears, so I it's not like I can't take care of myself. There's a chance I could win, really. I remembered that when I was working as a maid. They also scolded me to take better care of myself. As I was distracted with those thoughts, it seems the bear drew back on its own, and after looking around restlessly, it sprinted into the depths of the woods. Perhaps when it saw Alan drawing his sword and some of the older student knights, it got scared. It got riled up chasing the rabbit but it might have felt disadvantaged once it calmed down. Since the bear was gone, the student's tension seemed to break, and I heard sighs of relief all around. I also took a little breath and checked on Alan. Was he still angry? 83. Student Activities 11. Uproar at the Mana Drain, Part 2. I also took a little breath and waited to see what Alan would do. Is he still angry? Alan cast another spell, banishing his sword. Then he glanced sideways at me. He's still angry. You um, Alan, thank you so much. But, I'm actually an experienced hunter, and this isn't the first time I've gone up against a bear, so you don't need to worry. But, you, you're a girl. What would I do if you got hurt? My argument was blocked by Alan's chivalry. You, you're a girl. What? No way. When did my henchman become so chivalrous? Where was the bratty kid Alan who doused me in muddy water when we first met and calling me a girl? Certainly. I am a girl, but... Alan, you can't beat me at dodgeball, right? Are you honestly saying your physical ability is higher than mine? No. Well, I'm not sure whether dodgeball can really determine who's better. Since the dodgeball hustle, there are also boys who give me the lady treatment as the reigning strongest dodgeball player at school. What thorough chivalry. This may be the result of his father Cardine's upbringing, but it's a little awkward. Alan's always going to be worried about something or other. Yeah, sorry to trouble you, Alan. Add my words, Alan said, as long as you understand, and turned away. Relieved that I had somehow escaped Alan's eruption, I heard frustrated voices from the students gathered at the cliff to rescue the teacher. Huh? Haven't they been able to rescue the teacher yet? Well, the cliff is pretty high, but, these are magician students, and in fact there are adult magicians and teachers. However, given the urgency of the scene, I went over to the lake and saw the teacher treading water just like when I first saw him. The rope made by the magician student had been tied to a tree and the end of it thrown into the lake, where it was magically conveyed to the teacher, but the teacher was too concerned with desperately treading water to reach for it. He's completely lost his composure, he might not have even noticed that they threw in a rope. Moreover, the rope was pushed away by the ripples with his every stroke. One of the senior magicians was saying, it's no use, I can't control the water if I can't touch it. Something like that. T teacher, you're a magician, so why don't you do something with your mysterious powers yourself? Or maybe, that teacher can't swim. No, in fact, it's not just the teacher. Very few people in this country can swim. They don't have physical education, 
After all, I called out to the senior who was magically manipulating the rope. Can you magically separate the water of the lake? You know, in my past life, there was a legend that Moses walked across a sea. That's impossible. There aren't any students who could do something that big. The lake is deep and we don't have any spiritualists who are good at water magic. Even if we could, it would be difficult without touching the lake directly. Seriously, our group went to a lake. Shouldn't we have brought students who are good at water magic? Come on, then, is it possible to make a stream of water? Then you can maneuver the stream up the cliff. I'm trying to make a stream of water, but the teacher is making waves and it's not working, replied the oldest of the senior magicians. While we were doing that, the teacher, who had been treading for a long time, finally ran out of power and slowly sank into the lake. Oh, great. I took off my accessories and uniform and dressed only in my thin underwear, I jumped off the cliff, I can swim, so with this happening, I have no choice but to pull him up, as I jumped in with that firm determination, I heard Alan's voice yell, you didn't understand after all, but with the teacher sinking, since I can swim, I have to do something, for now, I just apologized in my heart, I'm sorry, henchman, for making you worry and dived straight into the lake to find the teacher, I found the slowly sinking teacher, got an elbow hold on his neck, and swam upward, the teacher had fainted, so he didn't struggle, which was good, but he was heavy, even so, I managed to get to the surface by following the rope I'd grabbed when I dived in, it would have been bad if I didn't have a rope, excuse me, please control the flow of the water as best you can so we can get to the cliff easily, also, please make some scaffolding so we can climb the cliff easily, when I called to the students after catching my breath at the surface, they immediately activated their magic, and it was easier to swim with the flowing water to the bottom of the cliff while dragging the teacher, below the cliffs was a kind of square rock formation, perhaps it was the magical scaffolding I had asked for, once I crawl up there, I guess they'll make it rise. I wanted them to make something like a staircase. You, don't move, I'm going to move it now. I heard Alan's voice from above. Then, like the library elevator, the rock formation rose and quickly reached the top of the cliff. Ooh, that's magic for you. When we reached the top of the cliff, seniors from the school of medicine hoisted the teacher off to a bed, thinking about it carefully. Even if they'd made a staircase I couldn't carry the teacher out, so I have to thank Alan for his elevator. When I tried to thank Alan for magically lifting us up the cliff, he gave me a very tired look. W wow, it's amazing you can make such big rocks at such a distance. And even water flows. I heard the voices of the senior magicians. Apparently what Alan did was pretty amazing. Alan is out of breath, too. I'm sorry I made you do all that work. Tired from his work, Mr. Allen caught his breath and came stomping over to me. Ah, this is bad. He's really angry. My henchman is furious. Allen stared at me and then quickly took off his robe and draped it over me, saying, New clothes. Ah, come to think of it. I was only wearing a single layer of underwear. Th thank you. But if I put this on right now, your clothes will get wet. It's fine, put it on. Now. My henchman is scary. This must be his rebellious phase. Still, my figure hasn't matured enough for him to be so nervous. While I was thanking Alan and putting on his robe so as not to provoke his anger, I heard strange voices from the medical school seniors nursing the teacher. T teacher, he's not breathing, said a medical school senior with a pale face, putting an ear to his chest and a hand to his mouth. The teacher isn't breathing. Seriously, is it time for what's called artificial respiration? However, the medical school seniors only wrinkled their brows and looked sad, giving no sign of doing heart compressions. Is there no concept of artificial respiration in this world? I rushed up to the teacher, pushed back his jaw, and secured his airway. First, heart compressions. I put my hands on his chest and pressed it several times with all my might. He still wasn't breathing. When this happens, you have to give artificial respiration. Yeah, that artificial respiration. This is for medical purposes. It's not a kiss or anything. It's artificial respiration. Damn it. I can't believe parted hair will be my first kiss. No, it's not my first, 
because it's not actually a kiss. Thinking like that, I pinch parted hair's nose, open his mouth, and put my mouth on it to breathe. No, wait, you. What are you doing? Alan put his hand on my shoulder and stopped me. It's artificial respiration. I'm breathing for him to get him to start breathing. Are you really going to put your mouth on his? Well, you're right, but... It's artificial respiration. It's true. But this isn't my first kiss, it's artificial respiration. As I tried to reassure myself that it was artificial respiration, Alan panicked and grabbed my shoulders even more firmly. It hurts. Th then I'll do it. Saying that, Alan flew at parted hair's face and without a pause, whoosh, came the sound of breathing. Hey Alan, could it be you can't stand to watch your boss do something she hates? What a captain of the suicide squad. Best wishes to your lips. While I marveled at Alan's brave figure, I kept doing heart compressions while keeping time, and the parted hair professor suddenly coughed and expelled all the water he'd swallowed. Ooh, great. His breathing returned. I turned from the gasping teacher, relieved, to see Alan scrubbing his mouth with his arm and looking with amazement at the now breathing teacher. Alan, I'm sorry about your lips, but it doesn't count so don't worry too much, okay, if Alan ever gets a girlfriend and gets big-headed about his first kiss, I might tease him, saying, wasn't your first kiss Mr. Parted Hair? But please forgive me, it's just teasing. The medical department students helping the revived teacher up also have surprised expressions. I, was rescued. By her? The teacher looked at me incredulously with tears still in his eyes. He had an arrogant expression. Or should I say one as if he'd smelled something bad? A typical aristocratic look. Somehow I don't like this teacher much, and I'm sad I had to sacrifice my poor henchman. Teacher, can't you swim? Not only that, can't you take care of yourself with magic? I gave in to my annoyance and spoke in a slightly strong tone, and parted hair opened his mouth after a little hesitation. I'm not a fisherman. Why would I be able to swim? Besides, I have to be able to cast spells to use magic. There's no way I could cast a spell in the water. I got even more frustrated as parted hair answered me sullenly. If you can't use your magic in water, it's stupid that you can't swim. As soon as you get into water, it's all over. It's absolutely worthwhile to provide swimming lessons instead of magic history classes. Hands down. When I spoke so roughly to him. Parted hair looked away with pursed lips. Even if you make such a face, it's not cute at all. 84. Student Activities 12. Mana Drain Cleanup. Ritz lit a fire and used his specialty fire and wind magic to dry our clothes and hair. The teacher once again set his hair into a beautiful side part courtesy of Ritz's magic. Hey, um, professor. I'm so sorry. I bumped into you. Good little Charlotte came up and apologized to the teacher with teary eyes. You're approaching him to apologize on your own. How admirable, Charlotte. You're so cute. So it was you, as I thought. A rotten necromancer can't do anything right. Parted hair is saying such a seriously provoking thing. How can he say that to Miss Charlotte when she apologized so forthrightly? Well, I felt sorry for the teacher when he was about to die. But what kind of attitude is this? as I was naturally glaring at him. The teacher noticed and coughed, drawing his shoulders in a little. Professor Thomas Cha didn't hit you intentionally. She was hit by a rabbit that was being chased by a bear. It was actually Ritz who came forward to defend Charlotte. Yeah, you go, Ritz. By the way, isn't it friendly of Ritz to call her Cha? Hey, are they that friendly? As I was getting a little suspicious, the vice principal gave Ritz a short grunt. Alan also said, that rabbit, there, and pointed at the rabbit lying near the cliff, parted hair, looking between Ritz and the rabbit, muttered, well, whatever, just be careful from now on, although the blame had passed off Charlie because of Ritz's intervention, when I looked at parted hair, he seemed to be scowling at me, so I gave an uncomfortable cough and said, by the way, is that rabbit dead, to change the subject. A senior in the medical school standing nearby looked over at the rabbit, furrowed his brow, and shook his head. Looks like it's not breathing anymore. It's too bad, even though it was able to escape the bear. In order not to waste its precious life, I was about to take care of the rabbit's meat. 
But the professor said, if there's an animal carcass near the barrier, it could become a demon. We'll need to dispose of the body. Our corpse is the origin of demons. Come to think of it, the demons I've seen so far have been a bit like beasts, though deformed. Oh, then I'll burn the whole thing. Ritz said, and pointed at the bonfire he'd made with flint to dry our clothes. As long as you have a fire, fire magic is very convenient. It's the strongest magic, but only if you're free to light a fire. What a waste. As soon as he began casting a spell at the bonfire, Charlotte ran up in a panic. Sir Ritz, please, let me do it. Since I'm the one who might have killed it, I've caused everyone trouble. I want to do something at least. Charlotte said, in tears. Charlie, what a good girl. Even if the teacher fell off the cliff, isn't a teacher who gets pushed by a child and falls off a cliff a bit unsteady? Isn't he clumsy? I thought, with an impure heart. In the end, Charlie buried the rabbit personally, as she'd asked. How, though, would she bury it? I'd heard that Charlotte was a master of decay magic. To begin with, Charlotte knelt by the rabbit and touched its back. Hanasa Safarashi Nonawana Yukinarad Fury Yukumana Wagamanaraikri, not the snow of flowers that the hurrying wild wind whirls round the garden court, what withers and falls away in this place is I myself. Charlotte slowly chanted the usual tanka and then said, let the rabbit return to the soil, and the state of the rabbit visibly transformed. At first, I thought it had moved, but it hadn't. The fur crumbled away progressively as though melting so that the bones could be seen, then the bones also melted, and finally only a stain of dirt and water was left. W wow! So it just rotted away and returned to the earth? I only ever knew the cheerful side of Charlotte, but when she's using magic she's got a real aura. I thought I'd go praise her, but when I started running, a student behind me said, disgusting as always, the power to rot something already dead is of no use whatsoever. I looked back when I heard the voice, but I couldn't tell who had said such a rude thing. How rude. Charlotte's power is amazing. It's placed quite high in the amazing magic ranking of what I've seen so far. I think it's a real waste to dislike this power just because it's gross. After the trouble at the mana drain, daily life went back to normal. However, now I'm in even more of a pinch than when we were at the mana drain. Mamaku is very angry. You? Did I hear that right? You tried to challenge a bear and then jumped off a cliff, is that right? Mimaku sat in front of me, staring down and interrogating me. I shot a glare to the side at the henchman who was responsible for this situation and gave his trembling hand a yank. What did you say, Alan? Certainly. I didn't say you couldn't tell her. But thanks to that, Mamaku is angry at me. Quite often these days, my henchman comes to Mamaku's place for meals with me. So all the three of us were eating dinner with my annoying hungry henchman, Alan. Alan suddenly said such a hateful thing. Kuki, you is always putting herself in danger. The other day, she tried to confront a bear, and she jumped into a lake from a cliff to help a drowning man. And so it started with Alan's words, and Mamaku heard the situation and started digging for the roots. And now she's angry. Why you know, Mar? Um, Ku. I could have won. I was confident I would be okay. But when you came back after the mana drain, and I asked you if anything dangerous had happened, you said it hadn't. My, wasn't that a lie? R. Mamaku's tone is slowly changing to a woman's. It wasn't a lie. You asked if it was dangerous, and it wasn't. So it wasn't a lie, I think, kinda. When I glanced at Alan for help, thinking, you told Cookie so much. He had the nerve to give me a helpless expression. Damn it. Alan, you're expelled as my henchman. I'm sorry. I didn't want you to worry about it, so I didn't tell you. From now on, I won't do anything dangerous. When I sadly bowed my head, Mimaku said, kindly, good grief. It's no use, is it? And gave off a forgiving vibe. Oh, oh, thank you, Mimaku one way or another. I'm glad there are people who worry about me. Just as I thought that, Alan, sitting beside me, said, but Kuki, even after I got angry and stopped you from confronting that bear, she said she was sorry for worrying me, but then immediately jumped off the cliff. And I got scolded by Mamaku for a while more after that traitorous henchman. I rescinded his title. I'm going to replace it soon with another title. 
Nice to meet you. 85. Student activities 13. Chicky shops with Alan. I can't carry any more. Shut up, henchman. Your terrible betrayal made Mamaku angry at me. Today I'm shopping at the market with Alan to buy some things at Ku's request. Mamaku told me that she had a lot of things to buy, so I could do it a little at a time, but I came shopping for a lot of heavy items to discipline Alan. So the henchman has my bags. He comes to our home to eat rice most of the time. So he has to at least do that much work. Oh dear, Alan, what are you saying to this little girl? To me who has never held anything heavier than a spoon. Do you want me to carry the bags? When I said that, my traitorous henchman shut up. Chivalrous Alan. Since he has once become chivalrous, it's his fate to live as chivalrous forever. It's against the spirit of chivalry to complain. Satisfied with Alan's silence, I look for a lumber shop. I recently learned that there are medicinal herbs you can buy more cheaply at lumber shops than at drug stores. For example, a store that sells persimmon timber. Medicinal persimmon leaves can be bought in bulk for a cheap price. Excuse me, sir. Please give me two bags of persimmon leaves. Oh, miss, it's been a while. Persimmon leaves, coming right up. With a dashing voice, the manager, whom I'd gotten to know before, quickly handed me a bag of persimmon leaves. While I was paying for it, my bag carrier came puffing up. My bag handler looked at the extra bag wearily, looked at the lumber merchant's surprised face, then dropped the bags he was carrying on the ground. Oh, has he finally hit his limit? Just as I thought there was no way for him to help his kind boss, Alan spoke to the lumber shop owner. Mr. Please give me this wood, and this, and this. Alan paid the price, put the purchased wood on the ground, and scrutinized it. Amatsukes Kumona Kale Haji Fukato Geo Ottomana Sugata Shabashito Dome. Winds of heaven, below close the path of clouds, detain here a while these maidenly apparitions. Then he cast some kind of spell. WH what are you trying to do? Is this a henchman's rebellion? As I watched a little nervously, once the spell was cast, the timbers that Alan touched twisted and changed shape. He seemed to be building something with his magic, as his face showed the strain and his eyes scanned back and forth. After watching Alan's efforts for a while, I found that he had completed a basket with wooden wheels. I see. He thought of putting my bags in this basket and rolling it. Not bad, henchman. For the first time I've done that, it went pretty well. Alan said, and put the bags in the basket with satisfaction. The manager, who had watched the fantastic magician before him with a look of surprise, said, Today's surprise companion is a magician. Well, please accept this if you'd like. He handed him a huge bag full of persimmons. I think seeing the fantastic use of magic got him all fired up. No, well, I'm happy to have it. But the persimmons sold here are bitter, aren't they? The persimmons lumber merchants sell are bitter persimmons. To put it simply, they're a byproduct of persimmon trees grown magically for lumber. It's said that if you apply them to a wooden product, it will last a long time, and they're sometimes used as a medicine which is why they're sold at the store, but we don't need this much. Although that's a lot of bitter persimmons, I'd prefer some dried persimmons. If you want to eat dried persimmon, you have to dry it yourself, young lady. But sir, aren't there always too many bitter persimmons left over? I bet it would sell if you made dried persimmon. I don't like drying work, if you want to eat it. You'll have to dry it yourself. There are plenty of magicians in the capital. While the persimmons are being dried, a whole new persimmon tree can grow. What? Isn't it better to dry it? I think a businessman ought to have the attitude of sparing no effort. But, well, should I just dry this bitter persimmon myself? Honestly, this country refuses to do anything that takes a long time to do, or that can't be done immediately with magic. Come on, take some extra time. I wonder if there's anything commonly distributed in this country that's made over time without using magic. R. Speaking of which, manager, please fill that basket with persimmons. I pointed to Alan's deluxe shopping cart. The manager gave me a look as if to say, why persimmons? But he sold me a lot of persimmons at a bargain price. After school, at what has become our daily routine, the heart-thumping aristocratic dodgeball tournament, 
I was taking a break to wipe off my sweat when I felt a nasty gaze on me. Following the gaze back, I saw Sir Sleazy, the king's brother, as I expected. He beckoned me with his usual smile, but I pretended not to see him and took a drink of water. As I thought, water after exercising is refreshing. While I was quenching my throat with water, a blushing first year student came over to me and said, Lady you of the certain victory, Sir Henry is asking for you, over there. The schoolgirl seemed happy that Sleazy had talked to her, unreasonably happy, with her making such a face, I couldn't just say, no, it's none of my business, I'm not going, so I reluctantly went over to Henry and asked, what, do you have some business with me? When I asked, Sleazy smiled wider and said, no, nothing in particular. I'm gonna hit him. Then I'm going back. Ha ha, don't be so impatient, it's not business, but I did have something I wanted to ask you. What do you want to ask? I won't acknowledge any vulgar questions. This, recently, livestock and magicians have been playing together, haven't they? When I first heard the story, I thought it would be cute to watch the livestock fawning on the magicians. Oh, he thinks the scene of us playing dodgeball looks like we're in a petting zoo on a farm, he would think that, but this is the second time Sleazy has come to watch, he came to see it once but disappeared before I noticed, then didn't come at all, and now he's come back for what seems to be the first time in a while, to begin with, there are elective classes for the third year students and above, so it's hard for them to play dodgeball after school like the first and second years, though there are a few upperclassmen that secretly skip their electives to come watch or play. I thought Henry might become a regular visitor to see his cute livestock, but he unexpectedly hadn't, so I was a little surprised to see him here. Is that so? You seem to be the one looking forward to it the most. When I expressed my surprise in a monotone, Henry narrowed his eyes. Chicky, how do you tell the difference between livestock and magicians? What's this all of a sudden, bastard? Huh? To tell the difference, I just... I heard that person was a magician, and I already knew this person was a magician. Also, for the boys, many of them wear robes, so I assume they're magicians. Maybe? At my reply, Sleazy laughed out loud with a look like, Well, no use asking the livestock. I'm going to hit that face, I can tell by their faces. Eh? Their faces? Is there any difference between the face of a magician and that of a non-magician? Um, if I have to say. The magicians are more beautiful, right? No, that can't be it. There's an enviable factor where they don't age as much when they're adults. But as children they grow normally. He's not going to tell me that the livestock have livestock printed on their foreheads, right? I just frowned and waited for Sleazy to speak again, so he gave a little laugh and said, Livestock have a face that looks like they understand they are livestock. Obedient, timid, apathetic, you can tell they're livestock. Eh? Does he mean me, too? I don't think I have that kind of face, I thought I had a cute face. As I surreptitiously touched my face, Sleazy continued. But, lately, while they're playing that dodgeball you started, many of the livestock have expressions that are unusual for livestock. As he said that, Sleazy met my eyes with a powerful feeling. His face is smiling, but for some reason I don't understand, he looked a little angry. Isn't that a good thing, that they look like they're enjoying themselves? No, livestock are livestock because they look like livestock. If there's an animal that's not livestock in the livestock's cage, that animal is just a pest, don't you think? Sleazy said, smiling even wider. He started laughing. He's putting on a laughing face. Well, I've never looked at a person and thought of them as livestock, so I wouldn't know. Ah, that's right. Sorry, Chicky. I asked you a strange question for livestock. He said, and with a little laugh, began walking toward the school building. What? What? Did he come all this way just to talk to me about livestock? This is why I can't stand Sleazy. Besides, isn't it rude to say, you're livestock, to a lady? Well, I won't respond. Because I'm afraid that if I do respond, I'm sure he'd say something like, Hey, hey, Chicky is making such cute peeps. For now, although I was riled up, 
I was a little relieved that the livestock lecture was over, but when I started to head back to the rest of the group, Sleazy stopped and looked back. I like you quite a lot. I still don't know what kind of livestock you'll be when you're grown up, but I don't want to dispose of you as a pest, Chicky. Sleazy. Having said such a disgusting thing, turned and walked away jauntily just like that. I looked back, wondering what to say. I'm afraid of that dispose. I don't want to be a pest. Not that I intend to be livestock either. Don't look back, just stay silent and go home. That's how chicks eventually turn into chickens, laying eggs and becoming delicious meat. Until now, I thought he called me chicky because my hair is blonde. For him, all the school children who aren't magicians are chicks, piglets, calves, and lambs. He really seems to only see people as livestock. And although I felt disgusted right now, I also thought he seemed a little pitiful. 86. Student Activities 14. Dirty Magicians. That reminds me, what about that petition we signed before? Whatever happened to that? One lunch break. Miss Katerina and Salome turned up at my spot. Since both of them had gotten lunch trays and sat down at the table, it seemed they were willing to eat with me. Alan, who is a little sensitive to thugs from other factions, had a grim face. But since they're also friends who like to play dodgeball and such with us, he didn't object and waited for Lady Katerina. Really though, you don't have to be on guard like that. The petition, huh. You all took such pains to sign, but things aren't working out. When I answered her, Lady Katerina's face twisted. Then, what was the point of signing? I know. Lady Katerina is angry for some reason, but facts are facts. Yeah. Your signature was useless. Mine too. Though I thought it would work. Katerina was shouting a bit, which seemed to have attracted some attention from the students in the dining hall, and there were murmurs like, Hey, look at that table over there. You have certain victory. Indispensable court supervisor, challenger Allen, Miss Starting Bell, Salome of Temptation, and Bannum and Ritz are all there. Cool. Awesome. Salome and Ritz had finally achieved named dodgeball player status. Come to think of it, everyone at the table was a named player. The passionate eyes of our classmates were embarrassing. It's really gringy. Well, you, such an apathetic attitude with a petition with my name on it. I can't forgive such a thing. Lady Salome, next to her, restrained the furious Katerina. Katerina, calm down. Since it's you, I'm sure she's got some idea. After all, this is you of the certain victory. Like that, Lady Salome spat out my cringe name and gave a little laugh. Salome doesn't have 8th grade syndrome. So when she hears those gringy names she tends to laugh a little. Damn it, you're kidding, they're both teasing me. But Salome, you're also a named player. Did you think the people on this side forgot? The principal responded favorably, but apparently he can't proceed any further. Perhaps someone in a higher position than the principal isn't very pleased with our activity. If there is such a person, that's where Salome of Temptation can show her power. So I'd like you to lure out the man behind the scenes. When I said Lady Salome's gringy name, she stopped laughing and looked at me with a raised eyebrow. Her eyes said, don't call me by that name. But you were the one who started the name calling. Didn't you? Salome of Temptation. When playing dodgeball, Lady Salome gives an appearance of listlessness, seeming to have a lot of openings, but if someone tries to hit her with a ball, she swiftly steals the ball and returns fire. The rumor goes it's like she's luring you in. Thus Salome of Temptation. Hey, N no, Salome, don't tempt men. That's no good. For some reason Lady Katerina got flustered, but it was a joke. Calm down. I'm kidding. Miss Katerina. And I haven't given up on the petition. So may I ask, Miss Katerina, how many necromancer magicians are in the Genesis territory? A. Eh, necro? You really are abrupt, you know. Well, it's fine. I'm not in my territory anymore. There aren't many people who can do it in our province, because not many magicians specialize in necromancy. After the spinning wheel became popular, we sent them to the royal castle. Oh, but Charlotte is a necromancer. So maybe her? Lady Katerina turned her eyes to Lady Salem next to her. I agree. Well, maybe Charlotte will be sent to the royal castle as soon as she graduates here. Over the last few years, making thread, which was the job of necromancers, 
has ceased due to widespread use of spinning wheels, so they've been sent back to the king in order to lower the territorial tax rate. Lady Salem gave a small sympathetic look to Charlotte. Charlotte also expected to be sent to the royal castle, so although she looked sad, she didn't look shocked. I see, being a necromancer is even worse than I thought. Is it because of the adoption of spinning wheels? It's true that necromancers used to magically make thread from wool and weave cloth before the advent of spinning wheels and looms. Charlie, sorry about that. By the way, what happens to the necromancers who return to the castle? Lady Katrina answered, um, I guess they live a normal life. It's said that necromancers are dirty, but a magician is a magician. Sometimes a territory wants to hire them, so they get called over. Well, if that happens the tax rate rises, so there's very few of those. Charlotte, sitting next to me, muttered, dirty magicians, and got even more depressed. H hey, are you okay, huh? Lady Katarina, you're also close to her, so please sugarcoat it a little more. Really? Well, thanks to that I now know what I wanted to know. This country doesn't yet have any concept of fermentation. True. There are some fermented foods like black tea in circulation, like my previous life, but in fact those were created through accidental fermentation. In short, no concept of good methods of decay has arisen. They only think, this is the way we've always done it, so do it. Thanks to that, there are a lot of necromancers in the castle who may be able to use the cheat magic. Fermentation. As I was thinking about things I wanted to try. Alan spoke to Lady Katerina. Hey, Katerina. Charlotte is kind of depressed that you called her a dirty magician. Watch what you say. Don't call someone right here a dirty magician. Although Alan is defending people's feelings unusually he ought to know that he's hurt Charlotte's feelings by calling her a dirty magician twice in a row. You be careful, Alan. Ritz, as expected of a champion kid who can read the room, gently came to Charlotte's aid, saying, Char can use a little ice magic, so she'll be fine. Everyone should learn from Professor Ritz. As I followed Ritz's example, Alan and Lady Katerina's mood worsened. What's the problem? I didn't really mean to say it in a bad way. Hey, anyway, would you please not talk to me so casually? In the first place, weren't you the one who hit Charlotte with an egg last year? Did you apologize for that? When Alan said that, Lady Katerina's mouth fell open and she looked a little embarrassed. I am not apologizing for that. It's fine. I didn't do anything wrong. I was just giving her a little guidance. Right, Salome? And she turned to Lady Salome for help. Lady Salome took her time chewing and swallowing her salad, then looked at Lady Katerina with a composed face. Katerina, I've already apologized to Charlotte for throwing eggs at her and saying harsh things to her. Eh? She turned with a surprised face unbefitting a young lady to Charlotte as if to say, is that true? At her appealing eyes, Charlotte opened her mouth apologetically. Ah, yes. Salome came to apologize and brought me sweets as well. With Charlotte supporting the fact, Lady Katerina turned to Lady Salome. Agape. Th then why didn't you talk to me about it if you'd invited me? I apologize for the fact that I already apologized. Miss Katerina looked back and forth at Salem and Charlotte and finally back at Salem with a bitter face. What? What? Already? Salome, you're so mean. She narrowed her eyes and looked at Charlotte. Oh no, with Lady Katerina glaring at her, Charlotte is starting to freak out. As she stared at her with quivering lips, Lady Katerina opened her mouth. Charlotte, um, I was wrong. She said in a very small voice. A whisper you could barely hear. I expected someone to say, huh? What did you say? Miss Katerina, we can't hear you. Then, with a red face, she said, so, I'm saying I was wrong. That's it. It's fine. Enough. Then she fastened her eyes on her lunch and started eating. A lady really shouldn't eat so greedily like that. Charlotte stared, bewildered, at the irate Lady Katerina. Well. Don't worry about it, Charlotte. I think she's just shy, so she's being a little dear. Um, no. I should say that thanks to Miss Katerina I got to know Miss Ryu, so I'm grateful. Charlie, the Pew Maiden, gave a smile full of charity. Charlotte, are you really not an angel? Isn't that too angelic? While my heart was quivering with the angelic Charlotte's smile, Lady Katerina, 
saved by angelic Charlotte's mercy, said, oh, well, that's that, although I don't quite get it. What kind of attitude is that, Lady Katerina? Worship her more, can't you see the halo behind her? Ah, I'd better not get too struck by Charlotte's holiness, or I'll end up like Tigasaku. Fascinated by Lady Katerina's situation, Lady Salome spoke to Charlotte. By the way, Charlotte, are you returning to Genesis for vacation this year? Vacation, is it that time already? No. I plan to stay in the royal capital this time. My family lives in the capital. I do want to see everyone in my village, but after graduating from school I probably won't be able to stay in the territory, so I think it would only cause pain if I got too close," Charlotte said a little sorrowfully. They did say just now that necromancers have basically been recalled to the capital in order to lower taxes. I see. It would be painful if they were close to people in the provinces. Is that so? I thought we might share a carriage going home, but that won't work. You, what about you? Oh, me? Um, I'm going back to Ruby Fallen. At my reply, Alan, who until then had been immersed in his hamburger, snapped his gaze to me. Huh? Aren't you coming to our house this year? Ah, it's true I had a good time at Train Forest last vacation. I also wanted to see Alan's sister. Chira, but this year, um, I'm sorry, that would be difficult this year. But why? My henchman appealed to me with a shocked face, I'm happy that he was looking forward to his boss's visit, but this year I have a lot of things to do at Ruby Fallen, and rather than him, I wanted Charlotte to ask for me. After sufficiently calming my henchman, I put my hand on Charlotte's shoulder, who seemed to be depressed at having been driven from her territory for being a necromancer. This is sudden, but Charlie, are you free now? There's something I need help with, something only you can do. Charlotte looked at me, surprised, then nodded. Something only I can do? It would be my pleasure. 87. Student Activities 15. Fermentation Magicians and the Teachings of You Oi. Honestly, I would have been fine with just Charlie but Alan came and brought Ritz as usual. Well, it's fine, I'm used to it. I took a barrel of the bitter persimmons that I'd bought previously, into which they'd been skinned and pulped, and put in front of Charlotte. Charlie, this barrel is full of bitter persimmons that I want you to use magic to decay. Eh? Bitter persimmons? You want them to rot? Aha, uh -huh. is it too hard? I'm not saying it's difficult, but why bother? There's something I want you to make with your magic. Charlotte said, with my magic? Then gathered her confidence, said, I understand, and cast the spell. I tried just a little magic, how's that? I smelled the contents of the barrel when she was finished. Well, it doesn't smell like alcohol. I put in my index finger and licked it. Bitter. It must still need more fermentation, Charlie. I want you to apply even more magic. You know, like that time you returned the rabbit to the soil if you please? Charlotte nodded and cast another spell. Charlotte's spending more time casting this spell than the previous one, isn't she? Thinking that. I looked into the barrel. What? The barrel is full of water? There's no smell. When I cautiously tasted it, it was definitely water, tasteless and odorless. It seems it fermented too much and completely returned to nature. Everything returns to water or soil. After thinking about the depth of the natural cycle, I asked Charlotte again, can you stop the magic a little earlier? Then I put out for Charlie another of several barrels of crushed persimmons I'd prepared just in case, and asked her to cast her spell. How about it, Charlotte? So I gave it to check. It smelled sour, very sour. This is it. Absolutely. When I tasted it, it was vinegar, as I thought, persimmon vinegar. It's good for beauty, so this is also a product. Yeah, but it's not what I want. Thanks, Charlie. This is usable, but I'd like you to stop the magic even earlier, this time. At my plea, Charlotte nodded without any reluctance, and cast the spell again. At last, we've got something that looks like alcohol. In this country, there's no age limit law restricting alcohol. Since it's medicinal, it's not banned. But the basic rule is simply that children shouldn't drink too much. I also take it as medicine, sometimes. Of course, I'd never drank in my previous life, so after I decided it smelled and tasted like alcohol, I asked Mamaku to sample it. Mamaku took a sip and looked up in astonishment. 
This is liquor. Mew. How did? Apparently even Ramaku think it's liquor after drinking it. All right. It's definitely alcohol if even adults recognize it as alcohol. Furthermore, we discovered it was quite delicious. Great. Magic can be used for fermentation. Alcohol in this world is expensive. It takes a long time to make. Although most things in this world are made via magical power, magic isn't used when making alcohol, so it's expensive. In the past, they made drinks they called liquor by chance, imitating an accidental situation. Even in rural areas moonshine is common enough, but in this world where basic production relies on magic, there's no large-scale alcohol production. Therefore, the supply can't fulfill the demand, and alcohol is expensive. This will sell. It can be marketed cheaper than the going rate, because the materials are essentially just bitter persimmons, and there's an excess of precious necromancy labor. This way, it can be mass produced without taking up time. This is it. I have to tell Bash and Ruby Fallen. There are too many necromancers in the royal capital. So many. Even if the tax rate goes up after requesting them from the capital, as long as we can make alcohol, it's a drop in the bucket. Furthermore, it's not just alcohol that necromancers can make. Liquor is probably most efficient if you're looking for profit, but with fermentation you can make persimmon vinegar like we did a minute ago, or maybe even soy sauce and miso using the beans we grow in Ruby Fallen. Even fertilizer can be improved. And so on. Charlie, thank you. This was a huge success. This is amazing. Charlie, you're amazing. I was so excited I hugged Charlie. Next to us. Alan yelled desperately, hey, isn't my magic amazing, too? After confirming that alcohol could be made with the power of necromancers, I wanted to return quickly to Ruby Fallen. I'm going back to Ruby Fallen for a long vacation soon, and there's so much to do. By the way, I decided to enter the School of Commerce after the vacation, when I advanced to third year. One of the teachers who took care of us during our first year mana drain event, an economics professor named Baron, had occasionally asked me to join. With Charlotte's help, I can sell liquor during my third year, and I think I can earn a merchant title. For now, I'm making various preparations for selling liquor. I've also sent a letter to Bash requesting him, to hire an necromancer from the capital. As for third year electives, most of my close friends like Alan and Charlotte are in the school of magic. Also, Salome seems to be going to night school. I'm on my own, but it's fine, because we have dodgeball. All the aristocratic young girls and boys love dodgeball. Our friendship will continue through dodgeball, the dodge. Also, all the students take magic history together for first period. So we'll all be together then. Currently, I'd finished my lunch and was waiting in front of the auditorium where a big event is taking place. The graduation ceremony was being held right now, just before vacation. That's right. Today was Sir Kane's graduation ceremony. I was waiting outside with a flower bouquet I'd prepared for Kane. Cardine and Claude have come to the capital from Rainforest to attend the graduation ceremony. So they were in there now, but current students couldn't attend because they still had classes. I was still on my lunch break. Damn it. I also wanted to see Sir Kane's brave figure. Or so I wanted to say, but even his family member, Alan, couldn't attend. Probably Alan next to me, was grieving more than anyone, so I won't cry over it, Alan was also holding a bouquet with me, my heart was kind of throbbing, you see, Sir Kane is graduating, Alan also looked excited, waiting with his bouquet, Alan looked at the entrance with a slight blush, swallowing, like a maiden, then the graduates all came out the exit at once, and they and the students waiting for them, like us, all started searching for each other, so it got noisy, I found Sir Kane immediately. No matter how you look at it, pretty boys have a different horror about them. As soon as Alan and I started running, Sir Kane noticed us. He waved and came over with his usual smile. How wonderful. Brother Kane, congratulations on your graduation. He gladly received the large bouquet of red roses Alan presented, and patted him on the head. I mean, a bouquet of bright red roses. No, it's fine. Thank you. Alan, I won't be here, but please get along with everyone. Alan nodded over and over at his gentle older brother's lines. Sir Kane looked at me, 
so I also held out my bouquet of flowers, so as not to break the afterglow of Alan's feelings. It might be a little plainer than Alan's bouquet, but I chose a bouquet of white Casablanca lilies. Sir Kane, congratulations. Thank you, you. Alan might be a bother, but please take care of him. Yeah, Alan will be fine. I've gotten used to him recently, and he's more mature than he used to be, so it's fine. I nodded. I will, and he patted my head like he did Alan's. How kind. Sir Kane is a really good older brother. I wonder if my older brothers back in Garigari village were also like this. It felt like they were kind. Brother Mayu and Brother Jiro. But at the time, I so desperately wanted to be loved by my parents and take care of myself that I couldn't see my surroundings well. When Tagasaku told me that Jiro might have left the village coming after me, I was very surprised because I didn't think he thought that much of me. Alan, Mew, isn't it? Long time no see. I heard a voice from behind Sir Kane. The owner of the voice waved. Oh, isn't that Claude? Next to him is Alan's father, Cardine. Those two had attended Sir Kane's graduation ceremony. It had been a while, and as we were giving our greetings and chatting about Sir Kane's graduation, Claude looked at me and asked, By the way, will you be stopping by Rainforest during your vacation? No. I have some things I need to do this vacation, so I'm just going straight to Ruby Fallen. Alan repeatedly invited me to spend our vacation together this year, but I politely declined. However, he seemed unconvinced and even now looked dissatisfied as we talked. Oh, that's a shame. But, things you need to do. What do you need? Oh, I see, I see. What could you need to do? Claude only heard about the things I need to do and turned his friendly merchant smile on me. This story smells like gold. He must have realized. All right, don't rush. I'll teach you later. Yeah, I'll tell you all about it later, Claude. I have some requests for you. Indeed, I'll be waiting. Claude nodded happily, then gave a look as if he suddenly remembered something. That's right, I have something to ask you too, Ryu. Do you know about the teachings of you or A? Eh? Teachings of you or no, I've never heard of it. Is there something going on? No, it seems to have spread recently among some of Rainforest's farmers. Most of its teachings are about life wisdom and farming, useful stuff. But they worship the heavenly messenger, so I'm afraid there are some dangerous elements. It seems like Ruby Fallen is where it originated, so I thought you might know something. Well, since you've been in school the whole time, there's no way you'd know. Claude nodded a few times, convinced. You are, you are, a heavenly messenger. I'm getting crazy deja vu. I managed to speak with Claude a little while longer, trying to ignore the flashes of Baldy. It's the first time I've heard about it, so I haven't thought it through. But is it really that dangerous? Dangerous, you say? No, the teachings themselves are useful. As I said, I just think it's a bit too much knowledge for farmers. In addition, Although it's called, you Oi's teachings, apparently the primary teacher is not you Oi, about whom there are many mysteries, the head teacher calls them, a heavenly angel and someone too awesome and sacred to speak their name, but they're apparently not a magician, it could be a problem if the royal family found out that the peasants were beginning to worship non-magicians, is that so, th that does sound scary, when I get back to Ruby Fallen, I'll be sure to ask. I somehow put on a smiling face, and Claude nodded, satisfied. You oi, that has a sort of ominous echo to it, I muttered. Yeah, that's right. It is a little creepy. 88. Student activities. 16. Kane graduates. I didn't want to recall Tagasaku's bald head flickering through my mind. But, you're amazing, Kane. Joining the Royal Guards after you graduate, if things go well. I'm sure you'll get a knighthood soon. It will be lonely not to be able to meet as often, but it's a great job. Cardine laughed and gave Sir Kane's shoulder a proud clap. Sir Kane had decided to stay in the capital and become a royal guard in the castle. The Imperial Guard, primarily escorts for royalty, are elites among the knights. An elite course that can be achieved only through several years of training and performing your duties properly. Brother Kane, will you stay in the castle all the time? Alan was a little nervous to ask whether he'd return to their territory but Kane, the social butterfly, 
put his hand on Alan's head as if to calm him. Once I achieve knighthood, I'll return to the province, and protect my Lord Alan. That's been my dream since I was little, and gave a handsome smile. What a wonderful brother. If there were a wonderful older brother championship, he'd come out on top by a wide margin and win the prize. I'd even approve a parade with a flag saying, everyone's wonderful brother. I thought Alan would be impressed by his wonderful brother's remark, but instead he gave a little moan and said, uck, then ran off, saying, I, I need to wash my face. He must have been incredibly impressed, whenever Alan was about to cry in the past. He would always say he was going to wash his face and flee. He hasn't changed, and his brother complex hasn't changed, either. Perhaps Sir Kane thought the same thing, as he watched Alan leave with a kind smile. How sweet. But there's something I need to discuss with Kane now. It's a very unpleasant discussion that might break the wonderful brotherly mood. I've been putting it off for a long time. I've been deciding whether or not I should say it. I finally made up my mind to talk to Kane. Um, Sir Kane, so you're going to join the Royal Guards. I heard that Henry recommended you and that eventually you'd become Henry's exclusive guard. So, um, there's something I want to tell you. My voice shook a bit. I'm still a little lost. I don't know if it's okay to say it. Dad, Uncle Claude, could you excuse us for a bit? Will you? Let's talk, just the two of us. Sir Kane, who with his social sense knew something was up, gave his bouquets to Cardine and led me a distance away. Um, thank you very much, Sir Kane. Sure. Is this about Sir Henry? Yes, um, Sir Kane, that Sir Henry is. Well, he's kind of. As I groped for something to say, still a bit undecided, Kane gave a hearty laugh. It's okay, you. I think I might know what you want to say. Sir Henry isn't the kind of person everyone thinks he is, right? What? He knew? Sir Kane, you knew? You were able to push that guy's perversion to the surface. True. He wasn't the kind of guy who hid it well. Sir Kane, you knew Sir Henry was a dangerous sleazebag who actually thinks of us as livestock. Huh? Livestock sleaze.bag? Sir Kane blinked and stared at me in surprise. Oh. I don't like where this is going. I misunderstood and slipped up. N no. But I was going to say it anyway, right? It should be fine. Uh, well, that sleaze I mean Sir Henry, told me that people who can't use magic are like livestock, and, um, a lot of other stuff like that. Ah. Uh, my mouth has gone dry and my tongue isn't working well. I feel like I probably shouldn't be saying this after all, because for Kane, he's a good friend and I'll come across as a nasty kid who badmouths her friends. I should have listened a little more and chosen my words carefully. I really should have. No, it's fine, you. Please calm down. I was a little surprised about the livestock thing, but I believe you. Sir Kane's gentle voice wafted into my head, which had gone blank. He gave me a noble smile as I peered up at him with clasped hands. You, did you hear that directly from Sir Henry? R. Yes, I happened to see him at the personal introduction office, and that's when I heard him say he thought we were livestock. He also called you superior. Prime. That kind of thing, Sir Kane. Really? Okay. I'm convinced. Sometimes when I talk to Sir Henry, I do get a feeling like something's out of place. When we're talking together, he doesn't like to meet my eyes. Even though we're looking at the same thing, I felt like he was seeing something different as expected of a social butterfly. Even though he hasn't heard Sir Sleazy's lectures directly, he could sense his abnormality. I'm sorry. I should have talked to you sooner. It's fine. I'm sure you were thinking and worrying about me, right? Thank you, Mew. I'll be all right. Wonderful. Sir Kane is just too wonderful. Sir Kane, as soon as you attain your adult sex appeal, you'll have completely carried me away. While I trembled at his handsome aura, Sir Kane kept talking with a smile. No matter how Sir Henry thinks of me, I want to keep being friends with him. It's harder than I thought. But it looks like I can't leave such an awkward person alone. Sir Kane. I don't think Sleazy is on the level of awkwardness, but Sir Kane, who's always taken care of that brat Alan, might not be able to leave that kind of guy alone. Sir Kane, you're such a great person. Sir Kane. You haven't changed a bit. You're still thinking of others. I've always looked up to you. 
Ha ha, that's a great honor, but I've always thought of you as more amazing. With that Sir Kane gave a wink, but I'm seriously worried about his ominous future. He's going to be a real stud. I'm worried that the ladies and their daughters will fight over him and things will turn into a soap opera. I've only ever thought about myself. That's not true. It might be a bit of a coincidence that Sir Henry showed his real face to you, Mew, but I think it was because it's you. No, I really doubt it, because Sleazy isn't exactly hiding the fact that he thinks of non-magicians as livestock. I think he's more like the kind of pervert who waits somewhere with a coat and then exposes himself to girls passing by. No, it's just a coincidence. Just as I was about to say something meaningless, I saw Alan, who had been washing his face, running up. Apparently his emotional heart had calmed down. He ran up to us, and when he had caught his breath, he said, Brother Kane, what are you talking to you about in a place like this? Then, as Sir Kane was thinking about how to answer with an embarrassed smile, I remembered that something similar had happened in the past. It was back when I was a maid. At the time, I was talking with Sir Kane about Alan. What was it I said to Alan? Right. I had answered in Sir Kane's place, Alan, it's an adult conversation you're too young for. Instead, please get ready to go to the market, and gave my henchman an order. When he complained, I said, it's only natural for a henchman to obey his boss, and silenced him with a sharp parting shot, how nostalgic. Remembering those days fondly, I decided to answer Alan in Kane's place. Alan, you're still too young for such an adult conversation. Anyway. It's time to go home. I'm very thirsty. I'd like to drink something. A drink. And I gave a look like, henchman, fetch me a drink. Alan opened his mouth, dissatisfied. Wah. What? What adult conversation? Mew, we're the same age. Also, you just casually asked for a drink. Seriously, what kind of drink you do want? Alan looked ready to go get me whatever drink I wanted. If it were the old Alan he would have done something like shouted back at my order. Alan, you've really mellowed out, huh? Sir Kane also gave a funny laugh at Alan's reaction, maybe because he, too, remembered what Alan used to be like compared to how he was now. 89. Student Activities 17. The Teachings of Yuoi. This year, Mamaku also came home with me. Last year I was alone in Rainforest for a while because it would have been bad to leave the store for a long time, but it seems to be okay this year. Her regular customers have been given medicine for while she's away, and she also left some medicine with an acquaintance in case something happens. It might have been fine last year as well, but I think Mamaku took care of it so that I could spend my time freely at Rainforest. Upon our arrival at Ruby Fallen, the staff of the mansion greeted me with full prostrations, just like last year or rather, more extravagantly than last year. Please stop greeting me with your foreheads in the dirt. After our arrival, I first greeted Bash and then introduced him to the necromancer ride brought from the capital. I'd asked him in a letter for Ruby Fallen to hire a necromancer and received his permission, so I brought her with me when I returned from the capital. She's a slightly older lady named Delia. Due to the spinning wheels, she'd been expelled from the Sierra Bolt province northeast of Ruby Fallen and had spent the last three years in the capital, employed and waiting at a necromancer's service booth. I'm an aristocrat, so I can survive on a stipend from the state, but it felt like other magicians were giving me the cold shoulder for doing nothing, so I felt hurt and ashamed, Dahlia told Mamaku while we were in the carriage, Dahlia was wondering what she would be doing, since it had been so long since she'd worked in a territory, so I had her make persimmon liquor in the carriage, which she was able to do without any trouble. To my great satisfaction. Dahlia also had an expression like, so I had this kind of power. She seemed to really like alcohol because afterward, she drank all the liquor on her own. She's quite a cheerful auntie. This time I'd had her come alone, but I asked her if she wanted to bring her family and she told me that her husband was dead and her children were already independent. Oh, I was surprised to hear about her age, since I thought she looked young and I had wondered if her husband had died early. She was older than I'd imagined. It really is true that magicians don't show their age. I'm envious. Back to the present. After I introduced Dahlia to Ruby Fallen, its owner, Bash, said uneasily, 
Mew, since you asked, I gave you permission to hire her, but is this really fine? The tax rate will go up, is that okay? So I asked Dahlia to show him how she could make alcohol out of persimmons. When he saw, Bash gave a look like, this is crazy, and immediately got preoccupied filling his days with the preparation of fruits and grains for liquor ingredients. Yes, yes, this is going well. However, although I thought it was important to get started introducing fermentation magicians, alcohol brewing, and other fermented foods, what I really wanted to do was have a discussion with Tigasaku and his crew. I'd heard from Claude about the Uoi religion, and I couldn't stop thinking about it anymore. Claude only mentioned keeping an eye on Uoi's teachings just in case, so it didn't spread to rainforest. But if it continues to spread, we won't be able to put out the flames. I asked Bash, who was excitedly giving instructions to a servant. Excuse me, I don't see Tukasaku. If he's not here, where is he? Ah, I think teacher Tukasaku is visiting a nearby village right now. I see, he's out visiting. What should I do? Chase after him or wait here? Well, he'll be back soon. He always goes to speak at the villages nearby as part of his daily routine. Originally I thought you'd arrive in the afternoon, so that's when I told him to be back. I heard something I couldn't allow to pass unmentioned. He's giving speeches in nearby villages? Somehow I've got a terrible feeling. Excuse me, Mr. Bash, would you lend me a horse? Also, a knight who knows where Tagasaku is, as a guide. After getting Bash's permission, I decided to immediately go down to the village to see what was going on with Tagasaku. I followed the guide knight to a common farming village. The knight said he could call for teacher Tigasaku, but I put a stop to that. Because first I need to find out what Tigasaku is doing. I secretly observed Tigasaku by hiding in the shadow of a building where he couldn't see me so that I could see what was going on. He stood outside in an open area. A crowd of villagers, young and old, were sitting around him. He seemed to be talking about something. The heavenly angel, born from the bud of a dandelion, brings good luck. The dandelion is a flower that she has made to bloom for everyone. All of your hunger and sorrow. Eat of my flowers. Eat the roots, the stems, the leaves. All of my dandelions are made for everyone who suffers from hunger. Eat of me. At that point, Tigasaku broke into tears, but continued speaking. And even after that, the heavenly angel produced the edible grass before us. That is, the parsley and the shepherd's purse. Now, everything that grows on the hills, on the roads, in the fields, and in the ground has been prepared by her for our nourishment. She has given of herself to create it. Saying that, that idiot Tigasaku couldn't bear it. He started crying with a meaningful expression. The anxious villagers began crying, too, when they saw Tigasaku like that. Oh no. This is scary. Ah, the heavenly angel. I'm pretty sure that's what Tigasaku calls me. Does that mean he was preaching about me? No, but I'm not a dandelion. I didn't create the edible grass. It originally grew on the side of the road. As I stood dazed, a small boy stood up among the villagers. I've already learned all the grasses that the heavenly angel has made. So I know which grass I can eat and which I can't. At the boy's declaration, the adults around him praised him, telling him how splendid he was. I need to stop this meeting right now, but what do I do? If I just called out to Tigasaku and told him to stop, he'd do the opposite, prostrating himself and saying, Goddess you, and telling the villagers to prostrate themselves before the angel of heaven. And then ultimately if I was treated strangely in this village, it would eventually spread to other provinces, and everyone at school would tease me, saying, are you a heavenly angel, you? Were you born from a dandelion bud? That's so funny. I don't want that. I bit my lips and waited for Tigasaku to finish his lecture. Then I sneaked after his carriage, waiting until he'd arrived at the mansion, and called him into the room. Tigasaku was moved to tears at my homecoming, but I'm afraid of his tears. Tigasaku, you're in trouble. Stop indoctrinating the villagers with weird lies. I'm not a dandelion and I didn't give part of my body to make edible grass. Oh, you, what have you been up to? Just now I was listening to the sermon you gave the villagers. I'm at a loss. Heavenly angel, that's me, right? I'm not a heavenly angel, and I don't know what to do here. Oh, 
I'm ashamed you had to hear my poor message. I glared at Mr. Tagasaka who looked embarrassed, but I really can't stand what he's done. Lady Ryu, please rest assured. Only those in this estate know that you're an awesome heavenly angel. Your name is too sacred, so I've kept it a secret and haven't revealed it to those in the villages. I've replaced the name Yu's teachings with Yuoi's teachings. I'm very aware that you wish to keep your presence on this world a secret. Saying that, Tagasaku gave his usual Tagasaku smile. Eh? What is he talking about? Honestly, I can't understand what he's saying, since we rarely talk with each other like this, but I'm so exhausted. Time after time I've repeated that I'm not an angel from heaven, but the problem is that it's not getting through to him. Uck, what do I do about him now? Currently, trying to parse what he said, he doesn't seem to be spreading the name of you. In other words, it can be safely assumed that the teachings of you or said to be the teachings of a heavenly angel, have no connection with me. To Tagasaku and his direct followers, I may be a heavenly angel, but to the villagers outside I'm just the adopted daughter of Ruby Fallen and have nothing to do with the teachings of you or In that case, I don't have to worry about it, right? After all, the propagation of the heavenly angel and I are unrelated. Basically, Tagasaku's myth of the heavenly angel is well crafted. Since common sense is mixed into the story well, it seems like even the young kids in the village are interested and are learning a lot. Ah, no, it won't work. When I asked Claude about Yuoi's teachings, he said they were dangerous. But, Tagasaku, your teachings about Yuoi appear to be spreading into the rainforest territory. If the royal family somehow notices, it could be serious. Oh, have the teachings spread as far as other provinces? After all, Valuable teachings will spread everywhere. Tagasaku said with an earnest look, This isn't the time to be earnest. It's going to be trouble if the royal family notices. Especially the member of the royal family called Sleazy. If they find out that you believe in a strange person who isn't a magician, you may be targeted by the royal family. You might get caught up in some kind of persecution or something. HMPH, what even is a magician? Certainly. The magicians who make crops grow are great, but they aren't nearly as great as you, who has the power of heaven. Let alone the royal family who abandoned us. S. Somehow Tigasaku, who always smiles in front of me, has an unusually angry expression. Well, the Garagari village. Was terrible, wasn't it? Moreover, after coming to Ruby Fallen, which doesn't have any favor with magicians, he may have come to distrust the royal supremacy of magicians even more, but that's why I'm advising him not to spread you or his teachings, since they might be dangerous. Tagasaku, please, it's true that your teachings are very useful for farmers, however, if it puts them in danger, you're putting the cart before the horse. The royal family will not allow the practice of worshipping a strange person who isn't a magician. Even if it contains good agricultural knowledge, I think it's better to stop talking about it as the teachings of a heavenly angel. But Lady Yu, for those of us who can't use magic, you are the heavenly angel, your existence gives us hope. Are you asking us to give up hope? Tagasaku sincerely appealed. Can Tagasaku really make such a serious face? Hope. The magicians they've depended on until now are disappearing. I get that they need something else in their place, but even so, I think it would be better than attracting dangerous attention. I think it will be hard for the people of this country who've clearly placed their hopes in magicians until now, but I believe things will work out somehow. Tagasaku dropped his gaze and slumped, then said, I will obey your command. From now on, I will refrain from talking about the heavenly angel when speaking to the villagers. And with that he left the room. He was really dejected. He's bearing a load of sorrow. D don't get depressed. I'm sorry, Mr. Tagasaku. 90. Student life 18. An agreement with Tagasaku. I made liquor, vinegar, miso, and soy sauce. I also made black tea and enhanced fertilizer. For now, I've done everything I wanted to do. Miso and soy sauce were unpopular, because people said they smelled bad. They would be delicious if they got used to it. Though, my only miscalculation was that using magic seemed to be tiring, so that my necromancer Dahlia could only use it so many times a day, before vacation, when I had Charlotte help me with the brewing experiment several times, she didn't appear tired so I didn't notice it. 
but apparently when you use magic, it makes you tired. For example, when you use a spirit, the spirit gives a feeling of sucking out your magical power. Charlie, you used your magic so many times, you must have been tired. I'm sorry if I whipped your body to its breaking point making use of your magic. With that in mind, I asked daily about it and apparently there are individual differences in how easy it is to get tired, so it's possible Charlie might be among those who are said to have strong magical power. As a result, including things like exhaustion in my efficiency considerations, I found that it's more productive to put the ingredients in a big barrel or tub and make a large amount of alcohol with a single spell, rather than putting the crushed fruit in small barrels and having two or three people casting spells over and over. It's easier to do it on a large scale because spiritualists tend to be less precise with magic than sorcerers. I'm not sure how that feels since I'm not a magician, but in fact I think it will work out for us because this way we are able to make a lot of alcohol with a single big spell. Right now, the ingredients for the alcohol are the astringent persimmons, which I've loaded onto carriages in large quantities. Cheap is best. I asked Bash to write letters to gather persimmons, so there was a lot of material. Topographically, Ruby Fallen is surrounded by mountains. There are many fruits in the mountains that, like the bitter persimmons, can be made into alcohol, just like I did before. We put the persimmons in a large barrel, crushed, and mixed them. And the alcohol is complete after a few minutes of spell work. It's too easy, as expected of magic, fantastic. Then we strain out the first batch of liquor and put it in a barrel, and make more alcohol with the remaining dregs. Alcohol is amazing. How far can you go, drinking the dregs of the dregs? Or so I thought but apparently there's a limit and it quickly becomes undrinkable. Since the taste seems to fall off, liquor made with the dregs will be sold at a low price as a second-class product. The liquor we make is going to be distributed through Ruby Fallen's largest trading company, with some of it apportioned for Claude's company in the neighboring territory of Rainforest. That's because Ruby Fallen can't handle it well. We decided that it wouldn't sell well if it's shipped from Ruby Fallen, because people would see the box and it has a bad reputation. Or rather it's considered a cursed land. We can get by making barrels for alcohol by hand, so we can sell it in barrels, but the wealthy people who are likely to be our main buyers of liquor often buy it in glass bottles. However, it's quite difficult to make glass bottles in Ruby Fallen which is almost no sorcerers. The only sorcerer in Ruby Fallen is that Ryuki guy I kicked in the face when I was living with the bandits. As of now, Ruby Fallen has Ryuki the sorcerer and his further Seki, Mimaku's younger brother, who is only a spiritualist and not a fighting magician. These two magicians are almost never in the mansion, but rather running around Ruby Fallen. I can't ask those two to mix bottles when they're so busy, so I decided to ask Claude an actual merchant, to sell it to other territories, since he's our neighbor. The Rainforest Territory has a fairly good reputation for manufacturing. Iron, who represents the mass production factories, and a few other magicians who weren't there when I was a maid are returning to the territory with Cardine. In that territory we can get a stable source of bottles and should be able to sell enough alcohol. Claude has a good track record of spreading the spinning wheel all over the country in the blink of an eye, plus he'll cause trouble if I don't include him. Still, just brewing the alcohol should make plenty of profit for Ruby Fallen as the producer. This will be fun. As for brewing the alcohol, I decided to have them quietly make a brewery not far from the Ruby Fallen Manor. We're keeping it quiet because I want to keep the manufacturing method a secret for as long as possible. If by chance it becomes known that fermented foods can be easily made with the handiwork of necromancers, a scramble for necromancers will ensue between the provinces. It's even a secret from Claude. My scheme is to hire a lot of necromancers from the capital before anyone notices. It's going well. We haven't started selling yet, but everything is going perfectly. I'm certain the liquor will spread. Until now, its image as a very expensive medicine or drink for rich people has become so widespread that people usually only drink it on special occasions. Wow, this is perfect. It's going so well. He <laughs> he, Alex will be happy to know he can drink all this delicious liquor. Mamaku's cheeks were flushed as she steeped herbs in some fresh liquor to make medicinal alcohol. 
It was only midday, but that big sis had been drinking and was a bit tipsy. Boss liked alcohol. He made his own, just like farmers secretly making moonshine in the hollow of a tree. That reminds me of the bandits, who like drinking, trying to stretch their liquor by thinning it out. Whenever I come to Ruby Fallen, I'm always reminded of Boss and the gang. Is Boss not coming back? Minmaku gave a slightly troubled look at my murmur. Maybe not. She gave a sad little laugh at that. Her face told me she thought it'd be difficult for the boss to come back. Boss Alex is a really bad guy for making Minmaku look like this. But, if it goes on like this, maybe boss will. As I was pondering about the future, I heard a familiar voice coming from out the window. When I opened the window a little and looked down from my second floor room, Mr. Tigasaku was surrounded by some of the servants. I had a very bad feeling. So I listened surreptitiously. So now the heavenly angel has transformed the bitter fruit that could not be eaten into the sweet nectar of liquor. This alcohol is the tears I have shed for you. Such precious words comfort us. Yes, the bitterness of that fruit is our suffering and sin. And she mercifully carried it all on her back, and wept persimmon wine. Mr. Tigasaku said, sobbing. Wow, what? This is hilarious. Since Tigasaku is still talking about heavenly angels, he'd better be prepared to get stabbed with nails. I opened the window, put my elbows on the frame, and gave Mr. Tigasaku a frigid glare. One of the servants noticed me and the people surrounding Tigasaku all prostrated themselves at once. And when Tigasaku noticed me watching, he gave me a furtive look. Jenna flected like the others said something to the servants, and left. Soon, there was a knock at my door. Yeah, come in, Mr. Tukasaku. Let's hear the story. I have Minmaku next to me, and she's also angry at your eccentricity. Lady Yu, please allow me to apologize. The people of the mansion insisted on talking to me. As soon as he entered the room, Mr. Tukasaku started speaking and pressed his forehead against the floor. However, please rest assured, as my lady commanded, I am not speaking to the neighboring villages, only those who live in this mansion. I'm making sure it's only them. Just this much, just this much, Mr. Tigasaku begged. Are you sure that's all there is to it? Hey, are you really sure? I met Tigasaku's ashamed eyes with my own. Please, mercy, it's only the people of this mansion. I won't spread it to the other villages, please. He kept begging trying to build up a momentum until I forgave him. Mr. Tigasaku, who was so dispirited after I admonished him about the heavenly angel thing, maybe because that was the first time he'd given a lecture in a while, but he seemed quite energetic now, even though he was apologizing. Tigasaku, didn't I tell you not to talk about it anymore? Yes. Ah, you did. But, if I don't speak about my lady's magnificence, who will? Nobody has to speak. I tried to persuade him as gently as I could, but Tigasaku couldn't hide his nauseated shock. He looked very depressed, extremely. But I won't be fooled anymore. After all, in a few days he'll be right back to normal, won't he? I have realized the reason I was born. W what do you mean? Teacher Tigasaku began to wax philosophical. I was born to convey the sacredness of Lady Yu to the people. My life is for that, and yet. If I can't do that, there's no point in me living anymore. Tigasaku ran toward the window and put his foot on the sill. No way. Is he going to jump? I panicked, grabbed his waist, and pulled him away from the window sill. Wait, Tigasaku, what are you doing? Don't stop me, Lady Yu. Don't stop me. Even if you jump, it's the second floor. Won't you just get badly injured, rather than dying? I mean, as a child, if I'm pulling him and he stops, does he really feel like jumping in the first place? He said, don't stop me. But is it my imagination that he seems a little happy I stopped him? Hey, just calm down. Mimaku took Tigasaku's arm, lifted him onto her back, and then slammed him into the floor of the room. Whoa, Mimaku is so cool. Tigasaku, whose hip had hit the floor, rubbed it and muttered, ouch. You're so cruel, Madam Kuki he said with a bitter face, but if he had done it, wouldn't he have been in pretty much the same condition? Really? To bother Minmaku like that? Uck, what do I do now? What should I do with this Tigasaku guy? At this rate, giving him a prohibition like, 
You absolutely cannot tell any more lies. Seems unlikely to make him stop, and if it did eventually his stress would explode, and he might even become an extremist. If that's the case, should I let him off to some extent? But Tigasaku is really scaring me, I don't know what to do. Maybe I can somehow manage the content of his message. Management. That's it. Tigasaku, you say you are the evangelist of the angel of God. I understand. I will allow you to spread the message of the angel of God and so on. Do you really mean it? Mr. Tigasaku looked up in joy. And beside me, Mamaku gave an astonished A. Eh? It's okay? As I nodded my assent. However, however, Tigasaku, I don't like the oral teachings. Oral tradition can have mistakes in transmission. I am not God's messenger. I hate being called God's messenger. W what? How can that be? But, if so, how? How can I tell everyone the great story? Please put it into writing. You've been sending us your weird stories in all your letters up until now, right? Like that. Please write them with the premise that they will be spread among the people. And please send them in your letters to me as before. I'll review them. And if they look okay, I'll allow you to publish the texts. That way you can be a great evangelist, Tukasaku. I am not God's messenger, but I suppose I can take the place of God's messenger. I probably won't give my permission, I thought in my heart, but Tigasaku nodded vigorously in his excitement, and Mimaku seemed to understand my plan. Somehow I feel like I'm tricking Tigasaku a little, and it hurts my heart, but I can't help partnering with him. I hope that by writing something like, The Tale of the Amazing Angel of God, he'll be able to suppress his desire to preach. Tigasaku, you must not speak from now on, no matter who asks you to do so. The angel of God hates oral teachings. This is absolute. If he can't keep this promise, I'll make him swallow a thousand needles. Tigasaku nodded again and again, giving his Tigasaku smile at my severe expression. I think it's okay. But even if I stopped him speaking, even if Tigasaku got fed up and showed his writings to the villagers, ordinary villagers can't read, so it shouldn't spread. Okay, I'm sure it's okay. 91. Student Activities 19. A thief is at work. Just like last year, I came back to school in a hurry. This term, I finally became a third year and joined the School of Commerce. My friends at school, who I met after being apart for so long, were the same as always. Charlie, who didn't return to her territory, was happy to see everyone come back to the capital, and Alan told us all about the pain of his long vacation which Kane didn't get. Kane remained in the capital after graduating from school, since he worked in the castle. He seemed to have weathered the long holiday, but I think he was pretty lonely, separated from his little sister Chira and the others. And he said he was planning out his schedule next year so that he could come to Rainforest by any means possible. I think everyone's excitement after the break varied by person, but Miss Katerina was very excited. At the beginning of last year, all she did was stare at me, so I don't remember it well, but she seemed like she was in a bad mood, but this year she was really excited. For first period all the students take the same class, so we all sat close together, but this time Miss Katerina did nothing but talk about her vacation. So, you know, Salome came to my room in the middle of the night, the two of us went up to the roof and stargazed. Don't you think it's a pain to climb onto the roof? Of course, we kept it a secret from my mother. It's Salome's and my secret. That's why we did it at midnight. Hey, Mew. Do you know astrology? It's so romantic. So then. Miss Katerina's story never ends. In her horoscope, her compatibility with Salome was apparently very good. She hinted, touching a seashell brooch on her chest and looking my way with a twinkle in her eye. Oh. Do I need to say those words again? I said the same thing yesterday and the day before, but if I don't say it, Miss Katerina's twinkle attacks won't stop. Ah, that brooch is really nice. Oh, is it? Didn't I tell you about it yesterday? My province faces the ocean, and in the evening the orange sun shines on the sea. It's so wonderful. As Salom and I were watching the sunset together, she picked up this shell and gave it to me, saying it was beautiful. Yeah, I heard you, not just yesterday but every day recently. You made a brooch out of the shell Salome gave you and it's your favorite. Yeah, 
Yeah, I've heard it many times. I turn my eyes to Ms. Salome, sitting next to Miss Katerina, who's still happily chattering away about her memories of her wonderful vacation. She bobbed her head as if to say, I'm sorry about my Katerina. You owe me one. The end of Miss Katerina's apparently eternal memories always comes when the magic history professor enters the auditorium. The teacher finally stood at the podium, so I guess Lady Katerina's story is over, but it was a different teacher than that of our usual magic history class. He was a muscly male teacher. Surely that's a teacher from the school of knighthood? Why is he here, all of a sudden? Maybe the other students know who it is? I guess I'll just wait and see. The auditorium began to fill with murmuring. Then, the muscly teacher told us about a surprise change in the curriculum. A part of my petition had been abruptly accepted, and the magic history class in first period would now alternate with physical education every other day. And the main content of that physical education was swimming. This teacher seemed to be the teacher of the new physical education class. Civil engineering magicians had been constructing a brand new pool on school grounds during the vacation, and it had already been completed. Swimming class. When I heard that, the face of that nasty teacher flashed in my mind. Yeah, I bet that's it. I thought that the boss around here would be the principal, since after all, he had the title of principal. No. Perhaps I was just avoiding facts by thinking that way. The principal, who wasn't a magician, was easier to talk to, and I subconsciously avoided something I'm not good at. But it's true, the principal isn't a magician. The vice principal must be the number one boss around here. That parted hair guy. Isn't it obvious? It's because the vice principal is a magician. But with this it's been made clear, and I was able and ready. I can't run to the principal anymore just because I'm no good at dealing with it. My target is the fire magician loving, hair parting vice principal Thomas. I am glad that the magic history class was turned into a class every other day, but the petition I really wanted to pass was that ordinary students be able to examine the magical books in the library. This time I'm going to bring my petition directly to the vice principal, and to get the petition to pass which had gotten bogged down before. I decided to devote myself to the development of a certain tool. While proceeding with the research toward defeating parted hair, I also needed to continue preparations to obtain my merchant title. The content of the classes in the School of Commerce was still basic knowledge like math, etiquette, and learning the names of important families. It seems that practical training on money making will begin in our next year. To be honest, it's a little unsatisfactory but I'm glad the lessons are easy because I'm pretty busy outside of school. I decided to open a shop as my extracurricular activity. I finally opened a stall in the market. It mainly sold alcoholic beverages. Charlie made the liquor. Of course, I also gave Charlie a salary. Since I can get drinks cheaper than the market price, when I opened my market stall, they sold quickly. Then, after making a lot of money selling alcohol, I bought an inn and a place to eat near the school. I'm going to make a pub. If Ruby Fallon's liquor sells well, alcohol will get more popular. And then the demand for bar-like restaurants will surely increase. I thought I'd ride the wave and run a bar, so I bought it. I had original thought it would be fun to run a bar, but I didn't think anyone would entrust a child with their business so easily, and decided it would be financially impossible. But I bought it. It's because, when I was selling liquor in the market, a married couple who were about to lose their in came along. Not only that, but they were people I knew, Melis and Joshua. It was them, Melis, the beautiful lady I'd met while working part-time with Mamaku at the personal information office. Apparently she was able to safely marry Joshua, and the two were working together managing Joshua's in. Well, when I think back to that time, I don't really remember much because Sleazy's face keeps appearing, but I was a little worried for Millie's. But it seems Joshua worked hard, bought Millie's, and married her. What a good story, I thought. But after talking to them a while, I heard that Joshua was in trouble, as he had gone into debt to buy Millie's. So I succeeded in buying the inn by taking over the debt. Of course, they were a bit reluctant at first. But I asked Joshua and Millers to continue in their jobs and promised to pay their salaries. I confess, as the adopted daughter of Count Truby Fallen, I made an appeal to my power, and succeeded in closing the deal. Since it's a bar, the main item is alcohol. 
We sold alcohol made from the lees, or diluted from the liquor Charlotte made, at a fairly low price to make it easy for anyone to get their hands on it. I got them to increase the number of dishes on their menu, and standardized the practice of shouting, yes, a pleasure, when they received an order. After all, people will come simply because they can drink alcohol cheaply. The restaurant, which reopened as a pub, was crowded with people as a town social center after a while. It felt good. From now on, I want to keep going and steadily increase the number of locations. Right now I'm making alcohol with Charlotte's help, so it wouldn't do to increase the number of locations too much, but apparently next year Claude will be able to make cheap liquor, so it won't be a problem to open more locations. You, somehow, you look really tired. Are you okay? Charlotte called out to me with a worried look while we were sitting in our first period class. Today's first period is magic history. I'm glad it wasn't that day. I couldn't sleep much yesterday, as I had gone to the pub to consult with Joshua and meet the new hires. I'm fine. I'm a little busy right now because we're just starting out, but it should settle down in a bit. Anyway, I hope you aren't tired of helping me make alcohol, Charlie. I'm okay. It seems like even though I'm using magic, I'm not getting very tired. Besides, I'm really happy. I can be useful. This way, my power has always been hated, and I didn't think anyone could ever need me. So it's fun to be told that you need me now. Sparkling. Charlie's smile was radiant. It's too dazzling after an all-nighter. I can't look at it. Thank you, Charlie. That makes it easier for me. As I was being healed by Charlotte's kindness, I heard Alan growling behind me. You, you haven't come to dodgeball since we've become third years. You're working too hard. Alan sulked. Somehow I've been so busy that a few months have passed since I entered my third year. I'm sorry, henchman. I haven't been looking after you. I've hired new employees, and I'm going to leave it to Joshua from now on. So I'm sure it'll settle down a little. And I want to do my best right now. Because if I do my best, Ruby Fallen will be enriched, and the whole country will be enriched, and then I'm only busy right now. Soon, I'll have some free time. I hope so. Kuki was also worried. She thinks you're working too hard. You always come home late. Also, are you eating with Kuki today? She's got your favorite eggs, so she was going to make some egg dishes. Wow, egg dishes. I'm glad. Then let's go home early today instead of eating out. Wait a minute, henchman. Don't you know too much about Mamaku? Come to think of it, I wasn't paying attention because I've been so busy lately. But when I eat at Mamaku's, Alan's already sitting there before me. Hey, what kind of relationship do Alan and Mamaku have? Huh? No way. Is she making a move? No, that can't be it. Alan isn't Mamaku's type. No. But aren't they getting along well these days? How did he find out about the meal before me? Alan, aren't you too close to Ku? Whenever I go to Ku's house these days, you're already there, aren't you? Well, you always run off as soon as class ends, so I can't help it. No, I'm the one who can't help it. Then why are you going to Mamaku's? Eat dinner at school with your friends. Besides, it must be lonely for Kuki to have dinner alone. Since Kane graduated, I'm by myself in the evenings, so I thought I'd take care of her. How self-important, I'm taking care of her. Since Sir Kane graduated, aren't you just lonely? Isn't Mamaka the one taking care of the lonely Alan? T taking care of her doesn't have a deeper meaning to it, does it? I believe in you. Mother, Mamaku. Hey, quit it. Mamaku is my mum. No, well. It's definitely true that while I've been working on the pub's menu I ended up eating there, but really, while I was away you've become a thief. F from now on, I'm going to eat at Coos, too. I won't let you steal. I snorted, but Alan replied blankly. No, I wasn't planning to steal anything. I'd better be careful. 92. Student Activities 20. Negotiations with Parted Hair. The thing I've been researching since I found out that the vice principal, Professor Thomas, was the one in control of the school. Matches. I made matches using magic stones. The ice magic stone is saltpeter. After a lot of experimentation, I discovered that the fire magic stone is phosphorus, so I made a basic match out of them. 
I bought custom armor, sewed protective gloves and masks out of hard leather, and reinforced my dorm room, turning it into my workshop, all to prevent injuries while making matches. It took more time than I thought, but I managed to complete the job, as I loaded my matches into a wooden box. I suddenly started wondering whether I should threaten Vice Principal Parted Hair, or try to persuade him. No, I may not need any particular strategy. That simple man will likely just do what I ask if I say, this is a match. If you want it, please give me the approval I wanted. Because it's a match. With these, fire magicians practice will change completely. They'll be able to quickly prepare the fire they need to use their magic. I waited in the vice principal's office for his magic class to end, and he finally arrived. As usual, his hair is neatly parted to the side. Why you? What do you want? Parted hair said with an uneasy look, as soon as he saw me. He seemed to have a weak conscience regarding me ever since last year's mana drain event. I saved his life. Can't he be a little more respectful? It's about the petition. You still haven't given up? It's already plenty that we switched some of the magical studies classes over to physical education. Your other demands are impossible. And why are you talking to me, anyway? Go tell the principal like usual. Saying that, it seems like his scheme is to foist me off on the principal, but I won't back down. Because I can already tell that parted hair is the culprit. But you know, I thought it would be faster to talk to the vice principal. Besides, I have something here that I made for you, Vice Principal. It's a product to help out fire magicians. The Vice Principal, who had been frowning at me through the entire conversation, raised an eyebrow when I mentioned fire magicians. He took the bait, to set the hook, I said, here it is, and produced the wooden box from my skirt pocket. What's in the box? You said it's something useful to fire magicians? Yes, I think fire magicians are the most wonderful magicians. Fire magic is powerful, after all. I hear it's extremely important when fighting demons and beasts. As I praised fire magicians, parted hair gave me a proud look like, of course. At that point I wanted to smack him right in his boastful face, but I managed to suppress the urge and keep going. However, fire magic is inconvenient. After all, it can't be used without a fire source. It takes time to make a fire with flint. When you're defending against attacks, even if you wanted to use fire magic you can't use it right away without a source of flame. To put it bluntly, it's useless. WH what are you saying? Did you just barge in here to tell me that you think fire magic is useless? There are surprisingly few situations where fire magic can play an active role. Basically, Fire magic is used as a countermeasure against demons. Many demons are vulnerable to fire. Fire magicians are the major players in exterminating demons that spill over the barrier, and they often do the work of re-establishing the mana drain barriers since they're likely to encounter demons there. In those situations, they always bring lamps, torches, and so on. But there are sometimes accidents where the fire goes out at the wrong time or isn't managed properly. So although fire magic has been the standard practice when exterminating demons, it's become more and more common recently to use wind, water, and earth magic to get rid of them. Wind, water, and soil are abundant outdoors. And if you use earth or water you can carry them easily as rocks or in a bottle. Compared to those, fire magic is really inconvenient to carry around. But it's true, and all the other magicians think so, too. Isn't that why? Mr. Vice Principal, you're so desperate to improve the status of fire magicians? You don't want to end up being treated like the necromancers. The reason fire magicians aren't being treated like necromancers is partly because they're not associated with unpleasant images of death. But more importantly it's because they can often use other elemental magic as well. Like grits. He's good at both fire and wind and he does okay learning other types of magic as well. However, people who can only use fire magic well may end up being treated as poorly as necromancers. Indeed, that's the vice principal's plight. Since he couldn't find anywhere to play an active role in his home territory, it seems he was returned to the capital to teach magic at our school, and he doesn't even like children. After making sure I had shut the vice principal up, I spoke in my most cheerful voice. But don't worry. With these, 
the value of fire magicians will skyrocket. This looks like a normal wooden box at first glance, but it contains wooden sticks that have been reinforced with some red chemicals at their tips. As soon as you use this tool, fire will pop out. Why you can't do that with just a wooden box and a stick? What's with your attitude just now? You've been making fun of fire magic but you can't even use magic. Vice Principal parted hair, angry at my disrespect of fire magic, kept yelling, but I gracefully rubbed a match along the side of the matchbox where I'd applied the chemicals, and with a sudden sound, the little wooden stick caught fire. All you have to do is always carry a lamp or other source of fire with you. Of course it's inconvenient to occupy one of your hands, but you can just let the servants. Ah, uh, is that fire? Parted hair's rapid fire monologue ground to a halt when I lit the match on fire. That, no way. You did that just now? You made fire. From that wooden box? Parted hair said, haltingly, absorbed in the lit match. That's right, Professor. Although this wooden box, they're called matches, they're something I made privately at my company with the thought of selling them. However, they're troublesome and dangerous to make, so I think I'll stop. No, you'd stop. Why, if we had these? They're quite difficult to make. So I don't think they'll pay off but, if you insist, Vice Principal, perhaps I can think better of it. Yes, as a concession in our deal. I'd like my petition to pass, please. Then I'll make and sell matches, or I could even treat it as special magical gear given primarily to fire magicians. I laughed with a gentle smile to soothe his heart as much as possible. Parted hair stayed ramrod straight, eyes glued to the lit match. I said with a big smile, this tool will dramatically change the fire magician's value to society. Ha! Huh. And vice principal parted hair swallowed with a big gulp. Led astray by the temptation of matches, the vice principal began to show quite a positive attitude toward the passage of the petition. He he, that was easy. He said it might take some time, so I just have to wait a little while. But judging by the vice principal's reaction, I think I can do it. While I was waiting, the school's big mana drain event was held. We always encounter some kind of incident at the mana drain, but this year's mana drain ended normally, without incident. There were incidents last year and two years ago, so I had prepared a bit, but nothing happened. Or rather, it's normal for nothing to happen so I guess my luck up until now was just really bad. Everyone's always excited about things immediately after the mana drain event, but this year was different. I'd never seen such an ostentatious commotion in the women's dorm lounge. Well, no, it's always been a place for some of the popular girls to meet and gossip, but today was special. This year there would be an aristocratic exchange party, and dressmakers and clothing stores have come to the lounge and girls were busy putting together their costumes. Wow, every dress is cute. Lady Yu, what do you think? I'm curious about this pale pink dress, it's so fluffy, but it's too cute. It wouldn't look good on me, right? Charlie, you're cute. So I think a dress in that color would suit you fine. I'm thinking of wearing a pale yellow dress. Charlie and I were both happy and excited to look at all the delicate lace and gorgeously colored fabrics. In the festive space of the women's dorm lounge, you could try on dresses or pick out cloth. They were also selling brilliant makeup and balms. For most of the girls here, it was probably their first time choosing dresses for a party. It's hard not to get excited. You make your debut at social events in this country after you come of age. Until then, there weren't many venues where you could show off your dancing skills, perhaps at a relative's party. At best, everyone is having fun preparing for their first party, and I'm looking forward to it, but suddenly holding this aristocratic exchange party this year only hides the country's problems. The party will primarily be attended by third years and above, but if you're a magician, even first years can attend, and other single ladies and gentlemen from outside the academy will come as well. On the face of it. It's being called a study session to help students quickly integrate into aristocratic society, but this is probably a matchmaking party. Because the previous king had a lot of concubines, produced many children, and married them off to other influential aristocrats, many of the children in our generation are quite closely blood-related. Marriage with close blood relations doesn't have a very good image, 
and one of the country's problems is that weddings and marriage aren't going well among the young people. So an exchange meeting with the students was held to deal with the problem. It seemed that people from the provinces who were unmarried and of a certain status were gathering in the capital in search of husbands and wives. The school is home to magicians from all over the country, albeit underage. Some people might want to lay claim to them, and the country might want them to get married and have kids as soon as they come of age. I never thought I'd be attending a speed dating party at 12 years old. Sigh. Aren't I really busy right now? Doesn't the petition I entrusted to the vice principal feel like it's reaching its finale? It's not really the right time for a party, and furthermore I'm not interested in men or marriage hunting yet. Oh well, a party is a party, isn't it? The food is delicious. I can dress up and dance. I can see everyone in formal wear and maybe some handsome guy will fall in love with me at first sight and pursue me, but I'm so modest and shy that I'd run away. So, Charlie, I want to wear glass slippers, do you think they have any? Gee glass slippers? Sir Alan might be able to make them, but it seems like they'd be uncomfortable to wear. Oh, that's true, I had gotten hyped up in my own delusion about to leave behind a glass slipper and set up a honey trap on some handsome guy I hadn't even seen yet. I'd better calm down. I'm in better spirits than I'd expected. B because it's my first time to go to a party or something with aristocrats. There are dresses, dancing. Oh no. I'm already getting nervous even though it's so far off. Author's note, next time, we'll see the girls in their cute dresses. At the same time, I received an illustration of Miss Charlotte and Sir Alan, so I'll update the blog. Thanks to the illustration, your gleaming delusions over those two can advance. If you don't mind, please take a look. 93. Student Activities 21, Dance Party, Part 1 Charlie ended up wearing a light green and pink dress with sheer ruffles on the skirt. I chose a light orange and yellow dress of the same design. The two of us had conspired to wear similar dresses. He he he. We didn't hire a stylist to do our hair. The two of us just did each other's up. It was so much fun. It's a blast to do up your hair with your friends. Although I guess Charlotte wasn't very good at doing up hair, and Salome adjusted my apparently miserable hairstyle when she saw it. Salome also did up Miss Katerina's hair, and her feminine power was so high that she even did her own hazel hair herself. Incredible. Miss Salome wore a form-fitting beige dress. The twelve-year-old seemed to have grown a bit in her chest area. It's beige-colored, so it's inconspicuous, but it's got sparkling jewels and a mature design. I'm gonna do that from now on. As usual, Miss Katerina stood next to Salome in a bright red dress with a rose motif. Her skirt was packed with big cloth roses. It's quite flashy, but it looks good on a stern beauty like Miss Katerina. As the four of us entered the venue, Miss Salome and I were handed black chokers. Apparently people who couldn't use magic would be wearing chokers around their necks to aid recognition at this marriage party. It's pretty offensive, but when I considered the purpose of an aristocratic marriage party, I decided it was unavoidable, and quietly fastened it around my neck. When we entered through a rather dignified set of doors, there were already a lot of people in the hall and the atmosphere seemed bright. It was far from the castle, but this was still a large venue. It went up five stories, and the center was an atrium. Although it was still time for light conversation with food and drinks, with this size you could usually also dance. When I arrived I was hoping to look for Alan and Ritz, but with this size and this many people, it would be nearly impossible to find them. My henchman had seemed to be looking forward to the triumphal entry of his boss, so I'd thought to go show off, but I gave it up. As I was looking for a waiter to get us drinks, the gentleman next to Ms. Katerina and I, who had two drinks, leaned over and said, Excuse me, I have a drink, please take mine. I started to reach for it, but was rebuffed. All of the gentlemen were frighteningly desperate to attract Miss Katerina's attention. The men who turned up didn't seem to be students. Since they're all wearing chokers, they aren't magicians, which means they must all be former aristocrats. If you get in well with the Countess of the Genesis family, you'll be able to return to the aristocracy as Count Genesis. Although their calculation was plain, Miss Katerina seemed to be accustomed to it and dealt with them without rudeness. 
Miss Salem also appeared to be sticking closer to Miss Katerina than necessary, which helped keep the gentlemen away. They're used to it. Even as twelve-year-old girls, Miss Salem silently mouthed, go have fun together. So I decided to take the offer and take a turn around the hall with Charlie. However, when we got a little distance from Katerina Tower, the gentlemen flocking around Miss Katerina, Charlie got called over by another group of men. Come to think of it, Charlie is also a magician. Men were pouncing like hyenas on any girl without a choker. Charlie faltered, surrounded by older men. What should I do? Should I help her here? But it's good to be pursued, and it's better to have a partner lined up when the dancing starts. As I watched Charlotte, she turned to me with teary eyes that seemed to say she wanted my help. If you want help, there's nothing to do but go help you. After all, I'm lonely. But even if I go help, how can I cut in? As a lady, I thought it would be fine for me to elbow my way in forcefully, but one of the men broke away from the camp flocking to Charlotte. He said to the man behind him, that girl's no good. She's a necromancer. She's a magician, but as you'd expect, she's filthy. All ears involuntarily perked up at the rude conversation. A death spiritualist, but an aristocrat is an aristocrat. Well, you can consider her in the worst case where you can't find another magician, but as a necromancer she's got no future. So saying, the rude bastard brushed at his hair. What's with him? Charlie doesn't need to bother with rude guys anyway. You're all brushing your hair thinking. I'm so cool. I could get a magician in a better condition, but you're not as cool as you think. Narcissist. Later, when Charlotte was released from the curse of the man camp, I firmly determined to furtively spill a drink on his crotch. I'm sorry, you. Let's go find Sir Ritz. Charlie, did you get away by yourself? I'm sorry. I was thinking of coming to help, but I wasn't sure what to do. No, it's fine. Besides, when you say, get away by yourself, I just told them I was a necromancer and they left. Charlie said, looking so sad I could hear the sound effect. Cheer up, Charlotte. H. Hey, look, nobody said anything to me, yet. Besides, I'm gonna pour drinks on the crotches of all those rude guys who crowded around you. Also, it hasn't been made public yet, so it can't be helped, but in a few years there will be a great demand for necromancers as excellent magicians, so you'll be fine. As I spoke to Charlie, she smiled her usual cute smile, so it seems like she managed to cast off her gloom. After that, Charlie was occasionally called out, but when she said something like, I'm a necromancer, she was released immediately, so we made it through. Nevertheless, this was a marriage party. There were too many non-magicians for the number of magicians. Looking around the venue, you could see several people of the opposite sex gathered around every magician. It's like ants swarming around candy. Oh, no. If I think like that, I'm in danger of becoming someone who thinks of non-magic users as domestic animals. I bet that dangerous sleazy would be overjoyed to see this scene. He'd probably say something like, see? It's such a delight to see the livestock flocking like livestock. Oh, it's Chicky. You're here. S. Seriously. Speak of there. Looking back at the terrifying voice, I saw the dangerous sleazy himself wearing some kind of mask on the upper half of his face. I've done it now. I was just thinking about sleazy. As I lost all energy, Charlotte, next to me, greeted Sir Henry tensely. I also murmured something like, Good morning, Sir Henry. I'm such a good person. Ha ha, Chicky always has a weird expression when she sees me. I wonder why. Well, I guess it's interesting. I don't remember making a weird face. But Sir Henry, why are you wearing a mask today, and a black choker on your neck? That's right, for some reason that bastard Henry is wearing the black choker that only non-magicians are supposed to wear. Isn't that against the rules? Also, wearing a mask is too suspicious. His fishy smell has doubled. This is just a regular choker I prepared myself. I guess it does look a little like the choker non-magicians are wearing at this event. Huh? Is he trying to say he just happened to be wearing a similar choker? Oh, is that so? Then what about the mask? Ah, this mask is to hide my face. Since people know what I look like. If my identity were revealed, they'd all flock to me, right? That can be fun. 
but it's tiresome to be surrounded by a crowd all the time, and it would be no fun to miss the livestock flocking around the other magicians. Hey now, stop calling us livestock. Well, it's true that when I went on a school trip to Nara in my previous life, the deer who saw my rice crackers and crowded around me were scary. But how can he call them livestock in a place filled with so many people? Charlotte next to me was looking like, I heard something about livestock just now. Did I hear it wrong? Well, I don't care what Sleazy thinks. Sir Henry, I brought you a drink. Oh, thank you, Kane. Just as I was getting sick of Sleazy's livestock remarks, Sir Kane the healer came up with a drink. It's been a while since I've seen Sir Kane. I did hear rumors that he was primarily guarding Sleazy, so I wonder if he's also working as a guard today. Sir Kane, who looks even more beautiful seen in contrast to Sleazy, noticed me with a little surprise. You, and is that Miss Charlotte with you? I never thought we'd find each other in such a large place. I'm glad you're looking well. I brought Kane with me because he's my favorite. Doesn't he look good in formal wear? I was irritated by Henry's proud smile at his pet, but I had to agree, Sir Kane looked dashing in his formal wear, whatever the motive, sometimes Sleazy does something good. Certainly, Sir Kane is wonderful, he always looks good, but even more so today. Mew, you look so cute that I was wondering if a flower fairy had lost her way. As usual, Sir Kane is a little too complimentary, but today I'm all excited. Dressed up at a ball, so it's just right. Then Sir Kane said, There's a flower fairy here, too. You'd better be careful or you'll be brought back to the fairy king. And as we finished, our greetings music came up from somewhere. It's about time for a dance. Oh, it's finally time to dance. Sir Kane and Sleazy stood before us. We're probably going to go with the flow and dance with one of these two. I feel like Sleazy is really staring at me. I don't want to dance with Sleazy. How do I turn him down? As I was thinking about how to turn him down, Sleazy spoke. Would you like to have this dance? And rather than me, Sleazy reached for Charlie. A, hey, it's not me. Because he was watching me so intensely. I thought it would be me, and was thinking something like, how should I refuse? No, that's fine. In fact it's good. But I'm really embarrassed that I misunderstood. Ha ha. What's wrong, Chicky? You look disappointed. After all, we have to dance with the same kind of people, right? I am not disappointed. Also, I don't want to hear about you not being able to dance with livestock. Then, Sir Henry, I'll take the privilege of partnering with this flower fairy. So Sir Kane told Sleazy, and extended his hand to me. You, would you do me the honor of being my first dance partner? As expected, it was a bit florid for an invitation, but thanks to the magic of the ball such ostentation was natural, and I felt excited. No, Sir Kane, you're so cool. His smile was so handsome that suddenly I didn't care about Sleazy's remark about not dancing with livestock. Charlotte seemed a little surprised to be able to dance with her longed after Sir Henry, but she looked happy. Right, Sleazy is a wonderful nobleman to those who don't know his true nature. He he. Then I'm going to take advantage of Sir Kane's kind offer to dance. Because today is a party. 94. Student activities. 22. Dance party. Part 2. Since Sir Kane was, of course, still exercising. He was strong. He's already 15. Okay. He's grown taller, and he's already a fine young man as far as this country goes. He was also quite good at dancing and led well despite our height difference. Sir Kane, who was graceful enough with his steps to be able to converse, listened happily as I told him various stories about my school life. By the way, Uncle Claude is here today, too. Ah, Sir Claude as well? Now that I think of it, he was a single pseudo-aristocrat. I suppose he had such a drive to be married that he came all this way for this marriage party. I'm surprised. By the way, you. Have you promised Helen a dance today? No, we didn't make any promises. We did talk a lot about dancing together if we met at the party, but, I gave it up since it seems unlikely we'll meet in such a large place. Is that so? If I were the only one to dance with you, Alan might get angry at me. Oh? Does Alan actually get angry at you, Sir Kane? Not angry, per se. He sulks. 
What is he, a maiden? Although if the brother loving Alan heard that I danced with Cain, I'm sure he would sulk. Besides, as my henchman, Alan probably wanted to escort me as head of my special ops unit. I was going to give up looking for Alan, but I think I'll try a little longer. Charlotte was talking about dancing with Ritz. I wonder if they're in that kind of relationship. Because it's not like her to want to do couples dances and stuff, I suspect. After the lovely dance music faded, Sir Kane said something like, I had a wonderful time, it was like a dream, and Charlie and Sleazy came back. That looked like a lot of fun. Sleazy said, with a rather tired sounding voice, for him. I, I couldn't dance very well and I stumbled a lot. Charlie whispered to me. Her face red and wretched. You go, Charlie. I was scared so I could only hide pig manure in his cuffs, but I respected her for kicking him right in front of his eyes. It's a good thing, Charlie. Don't look so apologetic. Sleazy's feet are there to be stepped on, it's fine. As I was praising Charlie in my heart, Sir Kane asked something unnecessary. Sir Henry, would you like to dance with you next? Sir Kane, settle down. Sleazy has a no dancing with livestock rule, he said so earlier. Also, don't you know that I'm not good with Sleazy? When I looked at Sir Kane skeptically, he put a hand to my ear and whispered, if you dance with him, it might get through that magicians and non-magicians are both people, the same as one another. Ugh, no, you're too nice, Sir Kane. Even if that guy said something like, treating people as livestock is nonsense, everyone's the same, we're all in this together, he'd probably just be pulling some trick, if we could change his mind with a dance, he wouldn't be sleazy. Sir Kane, that was a bad move, I nodded, pretending to just be a little cautious, thinking that sleazy, who doesn't dance with animals, who quickly refuse me anyway. That's right. Would you like to dance? Are you serious? You changed your mind so quickly. You were just talking about being too proud to dance with livestock. Then the next song started playing and I ended up dancing with Sleazy. And Sir Kane with Miss Charlotte. As you'd expect from royalty, Sir Henry seemed to like dancing. And he was very good at it. However, since I felt his gaze heavy on my face. I concentrated on staring down at an angle so as not to make eye contact. Hey, dancing with livestock is surprisingly fun. See, Sir Kane, this is just how Sleazy is, calling me livestock right away. It's a bother as usual reacting to Sleazy's words, so I decided to ignore it. But Sleazy continued talking. Could it be because you're not much like the other livestock? Until now? I thought the king was insane for consorting with livestock and even having a concubine, but unexpectedly it might not be too bad. Somehow the topic suddenly tamped down my excitement at the joyful ball, and I didn't want to listen. Also, I used to hate it when livestock didn't act like livestock, but now I don't. Perhaps it's thanks to you. I enjoy dancing with you. <laughs> oh? D does this mean he's becoming aware that people who can't use magic are just like him? Don't tell me, Sir Kane's strategy is working? I looked gingerly up at Sleazy's face, and he laughed and spoke again. I realized that it's really amusing to watch someone so stupidly try to pretend to be like a magician even though they're livestock. It wouldn't be a bad idea to get a livestock concubine so I could see it up close. It'd also be fun to discipline it. What do you think? What I think is that you're disgusting, Grap. Oh, I muttered a dirty word in my heart, Grap. That word isn't appropriate for a countess. This poop, I have to keep it at that level. Stay calm, self. However, if I just kept silent like this, I felt like Sleazy would just happily continue. So I decided to interrupt. I mean, I couldn't stand it after all. Don't tell me, Kane's strategy is working? Return my innocent hope. A domestic animal, you say. Sir Henry, you were born to a concubine. Surely your mother couldn't use magic then, right? Are you saying that your mother is also livestock? Oh, of course, mom was indeed livestock. Having said that, he showed me the usual sleazy smile, and I forgot what I was going to say next. Or rather, I couldn't bring myself to say anything. Hey, Sir Kane. It's impossible. I don't think I can deal with Sir Henry anymore. After that, we danced silently. As soon as the music ended, I wanted to be free of Sleazy, so I went over to Charlotte and Sir Kane to escape. 
Just like before, Charlie seemed to have grandly trampled all over Kane's feet, and she gave a red-faced apology. He responded, it was a lot of fun. When I got so excited I felt like I was in a dream. Your exciting steps brought me back to reality, so thank you. I was thinking that it was good they were having fun while I was so uncomfortable when Sleazy spoke in my ear. Hey, Chicky. I'm going around the hall with Kane to watch livestock. Would you like to come? If we feel like it, we can dance together. Yeah, that'd be fun. Sleazy seemed to like dancing with livestock and nodded at me with a big smile. No way. I firmly reject a proposal from such a shady smile. Even if half his face was covered by a mask. I made plans, so I can't. I have the task of finding Alan. I've just made up my mind. Livestock made plans? Is it about meals? You'll be fine. I'll make you a proper meal schedule. Wrong. It's not feeding time. I can't deal with this guy anymore. No matter what I say, I can't get through to him. Let's scram. Sir Sleazy, there's something on your neck. And with that I dexterously reached for Sleazy's neck and removed his black choker, and pretending to be jostled I threw off his mask. My, Prince Henry, I'm so sorry, I was jostled. I've knocked your mask off, Sir Henry. Please allow me to apologize, Sir Henry, the great and famous magician and heir apparent. As I shouted, the eyes of the predatory young ladies around me lit up and they excitedly gathered around Sleazy, saying, Oh no, Sir Henry, you're here. These were the carnivorous young ladies who wanted to be concubines. Fundamentally, Sleazy is the kind of guy who loves livestock. Trapped. He gave the young ladies a dubious smile and responded to them. As I was swept away by a wave of young ladies, or rather as I rode the wave successfully away from Sleazy. I rushed over to Sir Kane. I'm sorry, I knocked off his mask and Sir Henry's been swallowed by a whirlpool of young ladies. As I explained the situation to Sir Kane and handed over the mask, he gave a troubled smile. Sorry, Lou. It seems he somehow offended you after all. Thank you for bearing with my selfishness. I'll take care of the rest, so you two can take off. I was a little surprised. Our dance conversation was far away and shouldn't have been overheard. Maybe that's an influencer's trick. He also seemed to have noticed that I deliberately called the young ladies over to to get away from Sleazy. No, um, I should be saying that. I'm afraid I won't be of any help. How should I put it, Sir Henry might already be beyond help. When I tried to say that, Sir Kane put his right hand to my lips as if to stop my from saying any more. Mew, it's fine. Sir Kane said and smiled, then headed into the whirlpool of carnivorous ladies to join Henry. 95. Student Activities 23. Dance Party. Conclusion. Sleazy's sleaze had given me heartburn, but after walking around the hall a while and seeing all the ladies in their gorgeous dresses and sparkling atmosphere, I got excited again. Even so, this is a big place. Since I'd been on the first floor, I went up to the second floor, but with so many people it was extremely difficult to find Alan's group. However, since both Ritz and Alan are magicians, I guessed that they'd be at the center of a lady whirlpool. So when I found a place where people had jammed together, I stood on tiptoe and strained to identify the people in the center of the vortex. After I'd found a dozen whirlpools of non-magical ladies, stood on tiptoe the same way, and identified those at the center. I recognized a face. Surprisingly, it was Thomas, the vice principal with the parted hair. Was the vice principal single? I didn't really care, so I told Charlie, behind me, that it wasn't Ritz. But when I tried to leave I heard, hey you, that student over there. You. Yeah, you. Reluctantly looking back at the voice, I saw vice principal parted hair approaching, squeezing through the gang of women. First sleazy, now parted hair. Why am I having encounters with the top-ranked teams I'm bad with in this place of fun? Vice Principal, good evening. For now, I gave the standard student greeting with Charlie and parted hair gave an impatient nod. He was self-important as usual, perhaps due to the marriage party. The division of his parted hair seems about 80-20 today. Mew, I need to talk to you about the wooden boxes. Come here, come here. Wooden box. Oh, the matches? 
I wonder if the petition I submitted a while ago has been approved. I was so excited that I asked Charlie to wait a bit and went to a corner with Vice Principal Thomas. Has the petition already been approved? No, nothing's been handed down yet. The library isn't part of the school, but managed directly by the king. However, I've already applied to the castle to grant the petition, so although it will take some time, it should be approved soon. So why don't you hand over some more of those wooden boxes? I can't. Only after approval has been properly given. After all, hasn't the petition I entrusted to the principal been applied for at the castle this whole time? Oh, right. When I received the application from the principal, I decided it wasn't necessary and threw it away. Parted hair said, dignified and without malice. You may be an honest guy. But how can you keep your dignity when saying that? When I involuntarily lowered my eyebrows at him, Vice Principal Parted Hair flinched a little, so I somehow reined myself in. Seriously. I see, so that's how it went down. And this time you're telling me that it actually went to the castle. For sure? That's right. So about the boxes. Give me those wooden boxes, the boxes that light up my fire. Please stop begging me like an alcoholic. I told you, I can't. Only after the petition has been fully granted. That might not be until after next vacation. That doesn't change anything. I don't have anything to give you yet. Then, then, show me how you light the fire again. That's all I need. Just a little one. A little bit is fine. Addict, matchboxes don't have such dangerous side effects. As I was at a loss as to how to deal with this match addict, a familiar voice said, Oh, it's you. Looking around, I saw Alan calling out to me. He was wearing reddish-brown formal wear and clasping his neck with both hands. What great timing. Ritz was next to him, and Charlie joined us as well. As for Alan, I don't think it's very gentlemanly to yell so loud at such a fine ball. But since his timing was so good I'll overlook it. Henchman, good job. Oh, that's Alan's group over there. I have to go see them right away. Professor Thomas, I'm sorry. I'll have the wooden boxes after the petition is passed. See you. I rushed toward Alan, but I felt parted hair making his way over, so I said in a cute voice, Ah, there's a single magician over here. Awesome, not only a magician but the vice principal of the academy and the predatory young lady's eyes lit up as they surrounded the vice principal. All right, the operation was a great success. Distancing myself from vice principal Thomas while he was surrounded by young ladies, I grabbed Alan's wrist and, saying, let's go to the other side for a while, quickly left. When I thought it had been enough time that we had gotten away from the scene, I looked back and found that only Alan, whose wrist I was holding, was behind me. Ha! Huh. I thought Ritz and Charlie had come along, too. Where are Charlie and Ritz? You were so fast, I think Charlotte couldn't keep up. Oh, yeah. Charlie was wearing shoes with a bit of heel, making it difficult to walk, and she couldn't keep up with my fast legs. I messed up. I'm really sorry. I let go of Alan's wrist and looked around, but I couldn't see them. Sorry, Alan. Let's go look for them. It'll be fine. Ritz is with Charlotte. Anyway, the next dance is about to start. So, as he was speaking, young ladies who'd discovered he was a chokerless magician began to gather around us. Up until now, I've used these lady predators to get me out of tight spots, but now I'm really scared. Alan also seemed to sense the danger and decided to get out before too many gathered and we couldn't get back. He grabbed my wrist and zoomed away, but wherever we went, they would notice he was a magician and start gathering. I realized I had something that would work. Alan, stop. I have a good idea. And with the hand Alan wasn't grabbing, I held out the choker I'd secretly borrowed from Sleazy a while ago. Alan stopped and seriously examined my offering. It's a choker like the one I'm wearing. If you put this on, people won't be able to tell you're a magician so easily. How convenient. Alan gladly started trying to fasten the choker around his neck, but he couldn't seem to get it, so I hooked him up. Well, it's also a parent's job to take care of their children. Thank you, Mew. Alan seemed to be happy with the item his boss had given him, and as he was so touched I smiled as if to say, don't worry about it. As I did, the music swelled and the dance began. Then Alan, with a tense expression, reached out to me and said, dance. 
So I put my hands in his. He he. I'm so generous. Charlie and Ritz are probably dancing now, too. As we started dancing to the music, I was surprised to find that Alan was really quite good at leading. Yeah. Dancing with Alan is fun. Sir Kane was so handsome that I couldn't compose my throbbing heart, and Sleazy was just too much for my poor heart. With Alan, I could relax and enjoy the dance. Ah, that's right, you. Your dress. It looks yellow. Somehow Alan remembered to comment on my dress as we danced. But what in the world? Although the dress is certainly yellow. Ah, and your hairstyle is very organized. Oh boy. And, you. You, ah gathering flowers. What was it? Something about feathers, a creature with flowery feathers. No, it's, I must be in a dream because I see a feathered creature in a bunch of flowers. Suddenly I'm a feathered bug on a flower? I want it to be a dream that I'm suddenly being dissed by my henchman when we were just dancing happily a moment ago. As I stared at my henchman coldly, his eyes wavered in fright and he opened his mouth again. That's not it. Um, I heard. When you dance. You're supposed to talk about your partner's clothes and hair, and something about a dream with wings. So, I I mean, you. Alan looked at me with pleading eyes as he babbled. Your clothes and your hair look good. You, you. Very beautiful. And no way. How could my little Alan suddenly give me such a shock? Is this just my henchman kissing up to the boss that got annoyed at his prattle? Is this some kind of plot to make me overlook you calling me a feathered louse? You're a bad henchman for trying to dupe your boss. Your boss isn't going to be in a good mood just because you praised her a little. But this time I'll have to forgive you. I it's not because I'm in a good mood because you said I was beautiful. I'm not such an easy woman. When I regained my composure, I had forgotten about being called a feather bug and enjoyed dancing until the end. But afterward, Alan asked. Can I have this black choker? And when I replied, Oh, that's Sir Henry's, I should probably return it. He got really sulky. 96. Student Activities 24. Outcome of the student movement. You could call us partners, but we're business partners, not marriage partners. Apparently, Claude, who's about to start selling alcohol, came to the capital to create a ton of sales opportunities by making connections, rather than for the purpose of marriage. I was also planning on opening up new taverns, so I'd been meeting with various companies along with Claude to get wholesale goods at reasonable prices. Claude, who is famous to me for being a suspected lilican, is apparently famous in the mercantile industry as a master merchant. The company heads we met all spoke to us politely and almost all of our business negotiations concluded well. Great, Claude. With this, you've got no flaws as long as the Lilican suspicions are cleared up. Please try to make a good impression on the world and do your best to get married. But even if he didn't bother going to the marriage party, what's this about bringing Lion to the capital? Lion, one of the harem members I met when I went to Rainforest two years ago, accompanied Claude. She's the oldest of the three women Claude bought with an hourglass figure. She did secretarial work for Claude with a calm and cool persona. Claude, marriage parties are nice, but why not take a look at the beautiful woman in front of you? Lion, who accompanied us to the trade meetings, used to stare daggers at me two years ago because she thought I was Claude's fiancé. But this time she didn't glare. She basically just treated me nicely. Apparently breaking the engagement had taken me out of her crosshairs. It was great. Really, Claude, you're free to marry Lion now. Get married soon and wipe out those Lilican allegations. Also, when discussing the wholesale price of the liquor at the bar I run, he sometimes brought up my abandoning our engagement, and his broken heart at the time. Stop trying to push your demands through by complaining about something like that. They won't get through. After preparing his sales channels and mostly concluding his business, Claude returned to Rainforest. It was nice to be able to make connections so easily by going around to businesses along with Claude. Claude, surprisingly good work. Just when my dealings with Claude were finished, I was called in by Vice Principal Thomas, of the parted hair. D don't tell me. I thought the petition was only supposed to get results after the vacation. Wasn't it? Maybe we got an answer earlier than expected. Now I can finally read magic books. As I entered the vice principal's room trembling with excitement, I thought he had a kind of bitter face, 
and asked after the petition's outcome. In the end, my petition didn't pass. Why not? Vice Principal, it didn't pass. But why not? I don't know. I'm just as surprised as you. It was a direct ruling from the king himself. No matter what I do, I can't overturn it. Why can't I get permission? No, to be precise. It's not like the entire petition was rejected. The request to change the library's location so that it could be accessed more easily passed. It seems that the small hill where the library is built will be magically excavated to reduce its height, but that doesn't matter. Certainly one of the requests was to change its location, but that was just an addendum. My real purpose was to see the magic books. Oh one part of it passed, so our agreement about the wooden boxes that make fire is still good, right? The match junkie vice principal looked at me longingly, but that wasn't the point in my head. But. Why? They're just books with magic spells written in them, aren't they? Why can't I get permission? From the start, my request to change the library's location didn't matter. I just made another unreasonable request to make my request to read magic books easier to pass. Even so, the location change went through but I didn't get permission to read. It seems they'll be using magic to excavate the hill where the library is built, but it's quite a lot of construction. They'll need a lot of magicians to do all that work. Compared to that, isn't the request that didn't make it through of allowing ordinary people to read magic books too simple? Magic, or rather spells, can only be read by magicians, so it doesn't matter if ordinary people can check out the books at the library, does it? Or perhaps that's not the case. Are you listening? Yeah. About those wooden boxes, matches? The symptoms of the vice principal's addiction are pushing him to the limit, so after thinking a bit, I decided to give him one box for the time being. For now, I'll give you one box. Please remember that if it gets wet, it won't be usable. Oh, B but one box alone won't improve the position of fire magicians. You said that one day you'd sell these extensively, won't you do that? The vice principal, who had happily received the wooden box, looked at me expectantly. Well, I was certainly planning to sell matches through my company sooner or later. I will do that. But I still don't know how extensively they'll be sold. Because my petition didn't pass. W what? But I'll make them little by little. Please ask when you need some. I'll give you a reasonable price. T that's. A price? Yes. To start out. Let's see. I need to collect my thoughts. Find out why the country doesn't want to let people see magic books, books with spells in them, and parted hair vice principal Thomas could still be useful. Professor, you're a magic teacher, right? According to what I've heard, your students are given a spell book to learn spells from, separate from the grim Eye of salvation that contains all of the spells. Would it be possible for you to quietly lend me one of those books? Absolutely not. There's only one copy of the spell book we use in class. The classroom where magic is taught is also strictly controlled. It can't be taken out. Even that's no good? As I thought, those spells must hold some secret the country is trying to hide. Spells in this world are tanker poems. If so, I should already have most of the spells in my head. All the spells I've heard so far are famous tanker taken from the 100 poets. Are all the famous tanker spells? If so, could it be possible that less famous tanker are also spells? How about I just recite one right now? No, I think it's too dangerous to recite a tanker that might be some kind of spell. I've listened to Alan's spells, figured out what they did, and then recited the tanker. But even when I recited it, the magic didn't appear after all. But it's scary to recite a tanker that might be a spell with an unknown effect. I think it might be dangerous. I don't know what might happen. And if anyone heard me, it'd be bad. Then, let's write out the tanker. But it would also be dangerous if someone found out I'd written it. But there is a way I could do it. For now, let's get help from Vice Principal Thomas. He's a match addict who'll keep everything secret. I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. In that case. Write down all the spells you can remember and give them to me. Oh, and please keep it a secret that I'm collecting spells. That's not a problem. But since you can't use magic, you can't read the spells. Can you? You're right. But I just want to see them for the time being. Also, 
It seems like I'll be able to get hold of the elementalist spells Vice Principal Thomas knows, for now. I heard from Alan and the others that, just like casting spells, you can't write out things you're not proficient at even if you've seen them, you can only write down spells you've understood once, you can't write out spells you're not compatible with, therefore, the collection of spells handwritten by Vice Principal Thomas only contains the ones he knows. It's probably a collection of spells all about fire magic, if possible, I want to learn other spiritualism and sorcery spells. I might be able to ask Alan and the others to gather spells in the same way, but if I want to collect more than a certain amount, I'll need to get help from others whom I don't know, that would increase the risk of being exposed for collecting spells, so it's not a good idea. I'll just quickly see how things go with parted hair. He seems to be clutching his matches and waiting on what I'm going to say next. Vice Principal Thomas, obsessed with the matches charm, agreed more easily than I thought to write down the spells he knows. In that case, I may be able to push him a little further. Also, I want not just the spells that you know, but also the spells that the other students know. I've heard that students will write their spells down on paper to remember them. And the paper they write them on is disposed of in the classroom rather than being taken home. Please give me the memorization papers the students wrote on. Vice Principal, you're a magic instructor. It's easy for you. You just have to collect the leftover papers used in class, right? At my suggestion, the professor gulped, taken aback. However, Looking at the matchbox in his hand, he muttered, OK, 97. Extra Chapter 2, The Story of Thomas Mikasa, Please be careful. Oh, and I guess there are people wondering who Thomas Mikasa is, so let me inform you that he's the vice principal with the neatly parted hair. Sorry, the Sagranga continent is split in half by a demonic forest running north to south created by the invasion of the previous dark magic king. Caster the magical superpower we live in, is a vast country that fills the eastern half of Sagranga, a magnificent country where wonderful wizards rule, we have almost no interaction with the western side of the continent, aside from a certain amount of trade goods being exchanged at the port in Genesis province, located at the southernmost tip of Castor, that's because all the land routes are blocked by the demonic forest so that we can't reach any neighboring countries and the northern part of the continent is bounded by steep mountains where the northern races live. Only Genesis province can trade with the neighboring countries across the calm South Sea. Thanks to that, the Genesis province is quite rich. I've regretted this since I was a child. I was born into a family of magicians called Vermilia in the northernmost part of Castor, in a territory called Paramia. Paramia isn't wealthy like Genesis. Without the steep mountains to the north, the vast oceans would have belonged to Paramia. Furthermore, I've been told that there is a race of northerners who can't use magic in the depths of the mountains. They've never attacked Paramia directly. But if anyone climbs the mountains in search of resources or the sea, they're attacked by the people of the north and never return. Despite them being a race who can't use magic, it's disgusting. Although that said, old stories about the people of the north frightened me as a child. Every time I see the student view, I remember a time when I was small and trembled at the stories of the northerners. Originally, it's true, I had a terrible premonition when I heard that the adopted daughter of the cursed Truby Fallen had enrolled. And on that day that I made a mistake at the mana drain and she probably saved my life, the student called view really was terrifying. Like the people of the north, she can't use magic, but I can't help feeling she's got something more and above all, Mew is from that ruby fallen. And in fact Mew did have something I didn't have, the box that kindles fires, which Mew called a match. When I saw the fire kindled by the box, all my fears and bad feelings about Mew were burned away, and my little sister's face comes to mind. Gloria. My sister is an elementalist who, like me, can only use fire magic. My father was initially pleased to have two children in a row with magical proclivity. But when he realized that both of us could only use fire magic, he was visibly disappointed. It was very uncomfortable. Why can't I just use fire magic? Fire magic is better than any other type of magic. Sure, what's usually required of elementalists is to grow crops with magic. In the cold Paramir region, 
It has always been difficult to grow crops without the power of magic. One is only called a spiritualist if they can use plant magic. Isn't plant magic stupid? Why should we magicians, the chosen ones, have to grow crops for our non-magical servants? And if we can't do that, the lower classes sneer at us, saying we're useless. However, it seems that my sister, who was born with the precious power of fire magic like me, doesn't think that way. My kind and foolish sister, Gloria, willingly poured her mercy on the lower classes. My sister smiles for her people. If plant magic was needed to grow crops, she would stare at the spells that grew plants night and day until she learned them. Spells that are incompatible with you make you uncomfortable just looking at them. Seeing a spell you can't read somehow destabilizes your mind and body and can cause nausea. Although I had long ago given up memorizing spells other than those of fire magic, my sister never gave up. At last, my diligent Gloria was able to cast plant magic. My sister and the people of our territory were pleased, but that joy didn't last. It's said that using incompatible magic incurs a heavy toll on the body. My younger sister, who was now able to use plant magic, began acting like any other spiritualist and ruined her body. Still, trying to use plant magic, she became more and more weak and ill until at length she couldn't leave her bed. Gloria, you don't have to overdo it. Stop using plant magic. Already, fire magic is excellent, too. It's because I'm needed for that that I'm here now. After all, it's the cornerstone of defense. It's also handy when monsters attack. Oh, and it's useful in erecting barriers. So you don't need to force yourself to use plant magic. Fire magic by itself is wonderful enough to raise you above the masses. Add my emphasis. My sister smiled wanly from her bed. She might have seen through the lie I told. As a fire magician, I wasn't needed at all. After graduating, I received a magical knighthood and changed my name to Mikasa, but I idled away my days in our territory. Fire magic is a wonderful power, but although I don't want to admit it, fire magic is inconvenient. When you use fire magic, you need a source for your fire. It was the most inconvenient thing ever. Should the fire be extinguished somehow, you're useless. Furthermore, my sister and I can barely use any magic other than fire, but others aren't so limited. They can use both water magic and fire magic. It's considered unusual to specialize in a single type of magic like her siblings. But, while magicians specializing in plant magic are rather welcomed, why are fire magic specialists with such wonderful power treated so badly? I can't figure it out. It's the same with those necromancers. They can only use basic rotting spiritualism. However, unlike the beautiful fire magic, necromancers manipulate dead things, dirty rotten magic. So I thought, so I thought, but, I guess that's someone else's problem. Someday, fire magic may be called a useless magic that leaves nothing behind, simply reducing it to ashes, and might be treated the same way. Even though it's such a wonderful power, with the power of fire magic, you needn't be afraid of any monster. Even if the northerners attack, we'll be able to respond. In fact, this way we can prepare our own attack. All I have to do is eliminate those eerie magic less people of the north with my power. All the trees on the mountains will be burnt down and it'll become our territory. Well, it would be difficult to do that without dozens of fire magicians like me. But then we'd have a vast ocean, just like Genesis province. Why can't other people think of such a simple thing? It's such a wonderful power. But I have to live in fear of being treated unfairly, like the necromancers. Why doesn't anyone need me? Is fire magic useless? Without fire, am I just a nobody? What a stupid thing to say. Fire magic is amazing. What's the surest way to get rid of demons? Fire. That's right. Fire magic is wonderful. It's the cornerstone of defense. It's not useless. Fire magic is what we rely on in case of emergencies. Carrying such indignation, I spent my time with my sister in her convalescence, who had become so weak she had stopped using plant magic. When I at last received the pronouncement I had been expecting, along with my invalid sister, I was being returned to the kingdom, to the royal capital. This would lower the tax rate on our territory. It would be fine if such a territory were attacked by the northerners and destroyed. If I were there, I could have protected it. Because they kicked me out, they would surely be helpless and get destroyed by the northern people. Only then will they realize, 
the existence of the great magician that I am. One day, as I sat around the capital immersed in my delusions, my little sister, who had recovered her physical strength a while ago, came to talk to me about marriage, a request to marry and to account family in a certain territory. In other words, it's an order from the kingdom for a political marriage. Since it was arranged by the country, my sister accepted it, the family was, worst of all, that cursed. I tried to protest it, but my sister stopped me. Brother, please stop. It's fine, I want to marry him. Also, I met the man once and he wasn't a horrible person like the rumors say. I'm sure that I'll be okay with him. What are you talking about, Gloria? To be forced like this? It's unjust. Fire magicians are a great race. There's no reason we should be treated so unfairly like this. I can't allow the magicians who run this country to just throw you away. Even though fire magicians have the strongest powers, by marrying you off to that territory. Fire magic may have great power, but it's not needed right now. I want to be needed. That man told me that he needs me. Humphrey. Well, of course he needs magicians. He's a peon who can't use magic. Don't be fooled by his sweet words. It's the same as before, when you were tricked into ruining your health with plant magic. When I said that to my sister, she burst into tears. She used to cry when she was little. But this is the first I've seen her cry since she was ten. Even when she was desperately learning plant magic, and then using that magic to destroy her body. My sister never cried. Brother, I hate that about you. That elitism makes me sick. I'm doing this because I want to. That was our last conversation as siblings. After that, without a word, my sister married into the cursed province of Ruby Fallen. What a foolish little sister. HMPH. I'm sure she'll come whining back. What's so hateful about being special? Great people are given special treatment. Isn't that only natural? Rather, it's still not enough. Surely it's wrong that an excellent magician, like me, was returned, unneeded, to the capital. Yes, it's other people's ideas that are weird. If it's not corrected, fire magicians are superior. I have to make them understand, and so I ended up working as a school teacher. I hate children, but here I can tell all the young magicians how wonderful fire magic is, and someday, if I can show everyone that fire magic is superior, my sister will return. There's no way my gentle, frail sister can continue to live in that cursed territory. I'll spare no effort to bring fire magic the glory it naturally deserves. Now, there was a student standing in front of me named Ryu, smiling like a devil. In my right hand was a wooden box called Matches. I held it tight. If I can only have these. I saw hope for fire magicians. It's strangely ironic that that cursed Ruby Fallen's little girl is the one who revealed that hope. New Ruby Fallen. Gloria's adopted child. Could this be Gloria's guidance? Since then, I decided to accept this girl's request. Thinking of my sister who wouldn't listen to me, or even reply to my letters. All to make them see that as siblings are necessary. I got the wooden box that lights fires, and I lit a fire as soon as we left. It caught fire so easily. There's a world of difference between this and the time it takes to light a fire with flint. It gave me goosebumps. And when I saw the fire, for some reason I remembered something from long ago. When I was little, I wanted to meet our father, who was busy traveling the territory, so my sister and I ran away from our house to look for him. However, as you might expect of thoughtless children, we couldn't find our father and got lost in the mountains. Exhausted. We hid ourselves in the lee of a big tree, but as cold as it was, we needed to strike a flint to keep warm. The sun had already set, the outside air was cold, and my hands were numb. No matter how many times I struck the flint, the dead grass under it wouldn't catch fire. Finally somehow a tiny flame appeared and I set it roaring brightly with my magic. Fire is strange, just by its existence it brightens a dark, cold, lonely space and calms the heart. At that moment, my sister spoke to me, amazing, brother, it's so bright, and warm, and comforting, it's like we went to a different place than the pitch black hole we were just in. Your magic sure is a great magic that comforts everyone, isn't it? My little sister's smile from that moment is still clearly burned into my mind. Looking back, that may have been the beginning of my great desire. That's it. I just want her to tell me how great I am with that smile.
I want someone to tell me I'm necessary. 98. The Mystery of Magic 1, Beware the Cutesy Gal. By the way, the graduation ceremony that was held a while ago was considerably more magnificent than usual, since it was the ceremony for Sleazy, a member of royalty and a promising magician. Though I don't know the details because I couldn't care less, when he grows up, many people think he could become king. Sleazy as king in the future. Super gross. I decided to stop by Rainforest for longer this year, together with Mamaku. In fact, at first I wasn't sure whether I'd even stop by Rainforest or just not go this year, but Alan said, Mamaku, you're coming too, right? You have to come. And with his encouragement Mamaku said, well, let's go. Then, so I decided to go since I wouldn't be alone. Hey, aren't these two getting a little too friendly? Hey, is this okay? Do I need to give a thorough beat down to my thieving henchman? We took advantage of Alan's carriage to travel with him to Rainforest as usual, but Alan seemed a little more excited than usual. Was it because he was with Mamaku? So as to restrain Alan from being on too good of terms with Mamaku, I made sure not to allow them to sit next to each other, and so we continued our carriage journey and arrived safely at Rainforest. Irene and her people welcomed us into the Rainforest mansion just like the year before last, but this time there was a little girl among the welcome committee. Is that Alan's little sister Chira? She was two years old the year before last, so she must be four now. They get bigger when you don't see them for a while. I met Chira two years ago but she seemed to have forgotten about me. And she hid behind Irene, peering at me fearfully. So cute. After Irene gave us a reunion hug in front of the mansion and squished Alan and Chira together, she showed Mamaku and I to our rooms. Mamaku and I would be in separate rooms. I felt guilty about taking up two rooms and said it would be fine for me to room with Mamaku. But Alan said, you can't be in the same room as a man. And insisted we be separated. He called her a man but Mamaku is a mom and older sister to me. So it's nothing. But from Alan's point of view, Mamaku's older sister voice has cemented his view of her as a man. This is Alan's house. So I decided I'd better go along with Alan's rules. At Rainforest, I spent my time discussing promotional channels and future development with Claude, inspecting Iron's bottle manufacturing plant, practicing horseback riding with a certain henchman who looked like he wanted company, and playing with Chira. Chira was nervous at first, but after spending some time together, she would be the one to come play with me, and soon she would always be found toddling along behind Alan and me. I can't believe how cute that she is. Little sisters are so cute, I want one, too. Although, now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure I would have a little sister or brother if I went back to Garigari village. It was growing every day. In the single room Alan gave me, I shook off the suspicion that I might have five little brothers and sisters and turned back to the spell book in front of me. If I wasn't allowed to see the magic books, I thought I'd ask the vice principal to make one himself and a fine bundle of papers that one might call a spell book was gathered in my hands. As for the spells, I had really wanted to see the grimo ire of salvation that the ancient magician had produced, and thought I'd be able to, but I just wasn't able to find a way. This was a secret project. The collection of spells had been completed before the vacation. As I thought, spells were tanker poetry from my previous life and furthermore only the famous tanker chosen for the 100 poems collection. Only the tanker from the 100 poems from 100 poets. There were other tanker, as well, though. Indeed, some of them were probably poems I hadn't memorized in my previous life, and for those I wasn't able to read what was written there. Apparently this state of not being able to read this writing is the ordinary person's reaction to it. When I look at those spells, they writhe around in front of me and make me a bit nauseous. Is that what a spell is? Incredible. Using the first period magic history class, we reviewed the writing of the magician children after the magic class students had copied down spells, to roughly separate them into sorcerer spells and spiritualist spells, and in the spell material gathering stage, I wrote down the tank I remembered from my previous life that weren't in the material showed them to the vice principal, and successfully divided them into those which are spells and those which aren't, with matches, of course, 
as compensation. Theoretically, the ones that are illegible or difficult to read are spells, but in my case I couldn't determine whether or not the tanker I'd already memorized were spells. Therefore, I decided to make the vice principal classify them, by passing a bundle of papers with the tanker I'd memorized to Professor Thomas and saying, Excuse me, vice principal. It looks like these are spells some student made messing around while they were supposed to be writing out the spells they got from you. I'd like you to examine them, foisting the whole mess on the vice principal to sort out. I'm embarrassed to be such a Karen, and I'm sorry for making him think there's a student who has a way to make his own spells, but I gave him plenty of matches, so the vice principal was happy to take care of it. It's the plight of the match addict. Thus the various efforts, mainly those of vice principal matches, have borne fruit, and now I have a magnificent spell book in my hands. So, reciting the spells for which I knew the hidden effect while looking at the writings, I strained to catch a glimpse of the magic's mana. But I couldn't see any such thing, as expected I just can't do magic. Even if an ordinary person is somehow able to read them, these are things won't respond. So why were they trying so hard to hide the spell collections? As I was thinking along those lines, I heard the door bang open. Miss Ryu, it's time for dinner. Are you here? It was the pigtailed Ron, one of Claude's harem members, coming in without knocking. The youngest of his group, she's been serving me exclusively while I've been staying here. But this girl has no restraint. When you enter a lady's room, you're supposed to knock. As I've said many times, Ron, haven't I told you several times to knock before you come in? What would you do if I were changing? Eh? But you couldn't be changing clothes, right? I'm the one who's supposed to change your clothes. Anyway, can you even put that dress on by yourself, Roro? I can put it on. Even though I look like this now, I used to work as a servant before Ron did. I was the one who took care of the hems of Arian's dresses. Ron's attitude toward me, which had been very bad two years ago when she thought I was Claude's fiancé had mellowed considerably since she knew I'd broken off the engagement. When I came to the province, Ron asked me if Claude had hit it off with anyone at the marriage party in the capital. I told her that I didn't know as I hadn't been paying attention, but that I didn't think he'd be bringing anyone home for now. Listening to Ron's concerns regarding Claude, her attitude toward me was much softer, rather, it had been crushed to pieces, although it's rough that she calls me Roro now. Also, for now you should be treating me as a guest. I don't think that casual attitude, or Oro are proper. I was worried for her as a previous servant of her employer so I tried to coach her. But it didn't seem like it got through. Eh? But calling you Roro is really cute, right? You turned down my super darling Sir Claude. I'm super thankful. And I'm super happy I can come to you for advice. Roro is cute. That's hard to accept since my first thought was that it sounds like something you'd name a panda. But Ron, you always call me Miss Ryu and treat me normally in front of Sir Claude and the Madam Irene, don't you? Yeah, Ron looks like a fool, and she is dumb, but she's not as dumb as she seems. She behaves like a proper servant in front of her superiors. She never forgets to drop the cutesy act in front of Sir Claude. Of course I wouldn't act like this in front of my master. It's my special treatment for Oro. So she says, facing me with her most cutesy act, but I don't need any special treatment. Well, after dinner, please give me some more advice on how to marry Sir Claude. What? Again? As I tried to object, she left the room. What a girly girl. 99. The mystery of magic too. Gossip style investment chat. The food is very good. I have to admit the dishes are more luxurious than Ruby Fallen's. For example, they're more tender. Ah, but this year Ruby Fallen has liquor fever. So our level might rise a bit. The beauty products you've been sending me have really helped my skin recently. Cookie, could I bother you for some more before you leave? Certainly. However, since they don't keep very well, do you mind if I only give you just enough to use? Yes, that's fine. While chowing down on an entire roast chicken, I listened with odd feelings to the conversation between Irene and Mamaku. Ku was speaking as a perfect gentleman, without any glimpse of her elder sister persona. Ever since we moved to the capital so I could enter the academy, Mamaku has sealed up the older sister. 
There are heartless sleazebags in the capital who would denounce Mamaku if she chatted away in that persona. So from then on, she'd bent over backward to prevent her womanly side from being exposed. When it's just us two, she's always Mamaku. So in public, she pretends to be a man or rather, she is a man but I think it must really be hard on Mamaku to pretend to be male like that. But this way she won't be called anything offensive again. It's fine, I guess. Come to think of it, Mew. There was something I wanted to ask you, Claude said to me as I was slurping up some pumpkin stew. No way, could it be the Yuoi religion again? However, I'd made Tigasaku promise not to preach any weird stories anymore, and I had rejected every one of his delusions that he sent me from time to time. It should be fine, since I've been demanding rewrites. W what is it? Is this about the teachings of Yuoi? No. Not that. I haven't heard much about the teachings of Yuoi since last year. Ooh. It looks like stopping up Tigasaku's delusions has paid off. Since it was Tigasaku, I was suspicious he'd secretly work on converting people, but I'm glad I believed in him. Well, I was a little suspicious but whatever. What I wanted to ask you about this time was how you make such large quantities of alcohol in such a short time. Even when I ask the ruby fallen people who are taking care of our transactions, they say they don't know. Sir Claude asked, with a glance at my face. Claude threw me a straight ball. But I can't tell him about that yet. It's a trade secret. I'm not really familiar with that stuff, I don't understand it at all. Oh, is that right? Mew, I thought it was your proposal, wasn't it? Ha ha, come on. Ha ha. We've each affixed smiles to our faces and a ha ha war has broken out. But I won't be budged. He'll find out sooner or later, but I don't want it to become known yet. Wait until I've collected more necromancers from the capital. Personally, I want to invite Charlie to Ruby Fallen when she graduates and leaves the Genesis province. Claude gave a small sigh, as though my unbending will had been communicated. Fine. Let's say you don't know anything. Either way, my hands are full taking care of the wholesale alcohol business here, for now. Oh, Claude backed down. Did he? Although he put a lot of stress on the for now part, it seems I've been able to budge him for once. Ah, that was scary. If I become a merchant, I wonder if I'll have to meet with others and probe one another's true intentions like this a lot? I'd go bald. Roro. Hi there. Sorry I'm late. As I was looking at my spell collection in my room after dinner, Ron came in without knocking, looking silly. I told her to knock. Well, it's fine. Ron sat on her usual chair, with tea for each of us. Do servants normally sit down with you? I thought but it was Ron so I gave it up as useless. In terms of cuteness, I'm the best, but as you know Lion is the most often together with Claude of all of us. Ron said darkly, TSK, that old frump, and took a sip of her tea. W well, calm down. Apparently, there was a fierce battle going on for the seat of legal wife between the three women Claude bought. A girl on girl fight. Scary, I say that, but although the news is kind of exciting, it's a totally foreign world to me, so I'm not really interested. After all, I'm a little girl, I'm too young to be gossiping about love. Lion was the full-figured oldest member of Claude's harem, she seemed to be quite quick-witted and had taken a sort of secretarial position for Claude. But, Ron, is Claude really good for you? As a marriage partner? You're young. Don't you feel like Claude has too many years on you? Ron was about sixteen the youngest of the three maids. Claude should be over 30 years old, huh? But isn't Claude the best? He's rich, he's a pseudo-aristocrat, he's got a lot of property, future prospects, and a sense of stability. Oh, I thought this was love gossip, but is she really talking about love? She left me a little confused and kept talking. Well, when Sir Kane gets the title, it might be good to switch saddles, I guess. But it seems like there's more competition for him than for Sir Claude, right? After that Sir Alan is good, but I'm intimidated by magic users, and I don't feel like he'd accept me unless I had the right bloodline. And the Countess isn't really an option. So it's Sir Claude after all. Yeah, she totally wasn't talking about love. This atmosphere felt more like trading stocks. Ron seemed to be fully invested in Claude, the most promising stock right now. So. Do you not yearn for Sir Claude? No, no, Roro, 
Of course I yearn for him, don't I? I super yearn for him. That's a very nice smile. But does she really care for him? No, well, it is Claude, but okay. Yeah, what kind of women does Sir Claude like? What do you think, Roro? Ron asked, pretending to have hearts in her eyes but actually having dollar signs. Claude, huh, I couldn't get rid of my Lilican suspicions when Claude was courting me, if I do say so myself, it seemed like he appreciated intelligence, or should I say the ability to manufacture tools and produce profits. So wouldn't he like people like that? Also maybe the younger you are the more he'll like it. Ah, so you agree with me in terms of youth? I'm in first place. As for academic ability, Lion is best in that, as you'd expect. But I think I'm catching up. I'm actually secretly learning to read letters. Ron turned her attention to the collection of written spells on the corner table. Before I could stop her, Ron snatched up the book of written spells and flipped through it. Here's some good letters right here. I'll read them. What? These are hard to read. I can't read any of these. Ah, I can read this one. Huh? Did she say she could read that one? She said that just now? W which one do you think you can read? When I grabbed Ron's shoulders in unexpected vigor, she said with a jump, Ah, this one, and pointed at one of the spells. It was a tanker that I'd gotten from my memories of my former life and written myself, and Vice Principal Parted Hair had selected it from the poems, saying, I can't read it. It's a spell. None of the students had noted down the spell in class. It was a new spell with unknown effects. 100. The Mystery of Magic 3. I can't lose to my henchmen. I'm the boss. I haven't slept since yesterday. Last night was so shocking. Ron said she could read the tanker I'd written based on memories from my previous life. Furthermore, when I confirmed it with her, Ron pointed out not just one, but three that she could read, and demonstrated that she could read them. All of them ones that. When I'd asked the vice principal, he'd identified as spells, not that the vice principal himself could read them. He pointed them out as spells precisely because he couldn't read them. When I created the spell collection, to understand them, I'd put quick notes down such as that this spell had a spiritualist spell effect. The ones Ron could read were mysterious spells that I wasn't sure whether they were spiritualist spells or sorcerer spells. I'd written these spells down based on memories from my previous life, and had never seen a magician utter them, nor were there any students who'd used them in class. But I thought that it was the kind of thing where they weren't easily recited, even if the reader was compatible, because they were on a more difficult level of magic. But, yesterday, Ron said she could read them but pronounced them one word at a time with lots of ums and things like, isn't this really hard to read? So she gave up part way through and couldn't read it to the end after all, but although it was just the first part, she was able to read the spell properly up to the middle. Ron said, I learned all this weird vocabulary, but with a dissatisfied face, but I recognized her reading difficulty behavior. Charlie had the same difficulty reading when she was trying to learn a new necromancy spell. She couldn't read spells that were incompatible with her at all, but if she was able to read a spell, and kept working hard to read it day after day until she finished it, she seemed to be able to learn it. The bulk of the magic lessons which I can't attend are spent studying these spells just to be sure. I considered the possibility that Ron had learned the words but just couldn't remember them, and wrote down some of the characters used in the tanker, but she could read them normally. In fact, I thought Ron might be a rare case of actually being a magician, so I asked her if she could see anything. If you're a sorcerer, you'll see magical mana in the air, and if you're a spiritualist you'll see spirits. But though I asked her, she just said, of course there's nothing much like that to see. So as I thought, she can't be a magician. Maybe there's something that lets those of us that think we can't use magic use a certain kind of magic. Perhaps. So, if I recite this spell. Hey, Mew. You seem really absent-minded. Are you okay? Okay? I was sitting by the lake immersed in thought when Alan and Chira's faces popped up in front of me. They'd apparently been watching me worriedly as I'd seemed out of it. Today Alan had brought along his little sister Chira on a horseback ride to a small nearby lake. During my stay, we'd practiced horseback riding together, and yesterday I'd promised to go riding together to the lake. 
I'd been looking forward to it when I'd made the promise, but to be honest now wasn't the time. I'm sorry. I was just thinking about something. Worrying? It's not good to think too hard. So, for a change of pace, why not ride with me? Chiro was with me on the way here, but when we go back to the mansion, I've gotten quite good at horsemanship. I'll take the reins, so you can sit in front or behind me, Mew, and we can go around the neighborhood together. What do you think? Seems fun, right? So Alan said, who had just gotten his driver's license and was itching to get someone on board, but today's just not a good day for it. Sorry. Why don't you put Chira in front of you today? Because I absolutely have to confirm it. Not now, Alan. Look at this. Can you read it? I unfolded the paper in my pocket and showed it to Alan. On it was written one of the tanker that Ron said she could read yesterday. When I showed him the paper he might not understand. Alan gave a surprised face like, don't you want to ride my Ferrari? It's too bad, but I'm not interested in your Ferrari right now. Alan wasn't happy about the Ferrari invitation, but he took the paper and looked at the tanker written there. I can't read it. This is a spell right? Since I can't read it, is it a spiritualist spell or something? As I thought, he can't read it. Before coming to the lake with Alan, I'd asked a old spiritualist working in rainforest if he could read it, and he'd replied that he couldn't. The old spiritualist had said, it's a spell I can't seem to read, must be a sorcery spell. Did you get Master Alan to write it? He had concluded that the spell was a sorcerer's spell, but Alan, a sorcerer, couldn't seem to read it either. Magic is distinctly categorized into sorcerer spells and spiritualist spells. A sorcerer can never read spiritualism spells, and a spiritualist can never read sorcery spells. So, to sum up, Ron seems to be able to read this spell that neither sorcerers nor spiritualists can read. So, it might be true after all, that those of us who can't use magic do have magic that we can use. Could this country the royal family be hiding it? Why would they hide it? Are they dangerous spells, or, what is the effect of this spell? What would happen if I used it? If I go ahead and recite this spell, Alan, if you had a spell in front of you that you didn't know, and you were able to cast it, would you cast it? Well, if I could cast it, it's fine to cast it, right? Be but, you don't know what effect it might have. What if it explodes suddenly? Wouldn't you be afraid? No, not really. First off, magic doesn't activate as soon as you cast the spell. The spell is just the trigger. To activate the magic, you have to control your magical power. So there's no such thing as a spell that explodes as soon as you cast it. Is that so? Come to think of it, when Ritz and all the spiritualists were practicing their magic, they talked about something like casting a spell and then commanding the spirit. Casting a spell without any further dialogue is useless, and its effects aren't activated. Something like that? But there's a possibility that the spell Ron said she could read is a different kind of magic. I'm scared. Besides, is it really necessary for me to uncover secrets that the kingdom might be hiding? I was only originally interested in magic and spells because the spells were tanker. I thought if I had a look at the Grimo Eye of Salvation. I might be able to understand its connection with my previous life, and be better able to manage the current magician shortage. It's true that if everyone could use magic, it would make the world more convenient, and there wouldn't be anything like the pioneering villages suffering from hunger. And so boss Alex. But, given the fact that the country has been able to keep it secret, the spell I just found might not be very useful. The kingdom is certainly in trouble because of the lack of magicians, and yet they've kept this possible magic a secret. It might be better if it's not known. It might be safer not to reveal it. That's what I think. But, but after all, I want to know. First of all, it would be good even to know whether it's useful and why the kingdom keeps it a secret. If I don't know, I can't make any decisions. I'm going to cast the spell. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm scared. But I want to know. So after all, Mew, are you feeling okay? Are you hurt? Finally even Chira was starting to worry about my grim expression. No good, no good. I shouldn't be making such a little kid worry. Alan was frowning, too. It's also not good as a boss to make my henchmen uneasy. I'm fine. I'm not hurt anywhere. I'm just hungry. Let's eat the picnic we brought. I said as cheerily as I could, 
and turned to the side of my horse where it was tied by the bridle to a tree. Horsey is carrying our meals on its back. Let's open our lunch boxes and carry on with lunch. No, you, wait here with Chira. It'll be heavy, I'll get it. Oh, my henchman has started saying such caring things to me. What's going on? Henchman Alan the henchman had always followed my orders cheerfully when given, but he'd never before read the atmosphere and acted on his own initiative. I wonder if he's finally learned how to treat a lady. Thank you, Alan. By the time I'd thanked him, Alan had already run over to the horse. He's got some energy. Although the first time I saw a horse my lips had gone blue with fear. I had practiced regularly and could now properly ride a horse. I guess this small consideration for a lady I once thought impossible is also the result of step-by-step -step growth. Well, yeah, that's right. I can't lose to my henchman. First of all, I have to try. It seems like if I just chant it, there won't be much danger. Okay, let's recite a sample tanker. 101. The Mystery of Magic 4 Chira is cute because he never said anything where he didn't know what kind of effect the magic would activate, but because I don't know what's going to happen, I'm somehow scared to cast the spell, I'm being cautious because it had been my understanding that magic was useless if it wasn't cast by a magician. I thought that even if I chanted it, nothing would happen, so there was no reason to say it out loud, however, this is one of the spells that Ron said she could read. In other words, this may be magic that even I can activate if I say the spell. And what effect does that magic have? I can't think of any other way to find out but to cast the spell. No, to be honest. I thought about asking Ron to do her best to recite it. But I felt bad making her cast a spell when I don't know what's going to happen. And also I don't want anyone to know about this spell yet. This time. It was Ron, who had no knowledge of spells, who found it, so I could cover it up, because she doesn't know anything about the spell other than that it's hard to read. But Claude Orme and Marco had been to school, and they might notice that it was a spell if I asked them whether they could read it or it was illegible. Claude, the merchant, might try to take advantage of it, and Marco might get worried I was getting into something dangerous and above all, they try to find out why it's possible for me to write these spells that probably nobody else knows. Because of my previous life, they wouldn't believe me if I told them and I really don't want to. Therefore, as I thought, I really have no choice but to recite it myself. I'm scared. After all, it's possible that the royal family keeps commoners away from the books in the magic library because they want to keep this a secret. So, the spell I've written on the paper in front of me right now is magic that the royal family wants to keep hidden. But I want to know. I want to try it. I want to do it. Furthermore, in my previous life, it was the people who tried something that seemed reckless at first who pushed progress forward. I think the first person who ate Natto was really amazing. For now, the spell I'm going to cast first is the one that seemed to be easiest for Ron to read. Alan said he'd been told that easy to read spells are usually simple ones. If it's easy to read, maybe it's not possible for it to be magic with a dangerous effect. But when it came time to do the chant, I got really wound up. It was late at night when everyone but me was fast asleep. I snuck out of the mansion and went to the little lake where we rode horses with Alan before. In case the magic really was dangerous. I didn't want to cause trouble for anyone around me. Taking deep breaths to control my breathing, I spoke the spell to Manuo Tanobatini Nagarabashinaburyukatana Yawera Mazosaru. If this strand of pearls breaks, let it break, for if it stretches out, our hidden thing will also weaken. When I finish his chanting, I felt an odd sensation. I felt like my body had warmed up. And then, looking at my body, was it glowing? No. It didn't actually glow, but something like an aura seemed to cover my body. No way, is this stuff what they call magical mana? It's warm. Yeah, warm. But I had no idea what to do next. And after about 10 seconds I could no longer see the aura that surrounded my body. Apparently, that seemed to be an end to the spell's effect. Huh, what kind of spell was it? It's not just a spell that gets me a little warm. Is it? After that I got carried away and cast all the spells that Ron could read. They all resulted in that same warm aura that ended after about 10 seconds. By the way, 
there weren't any special changes in my body. I think even if I could recite the spell, it was a delusion to think that I would mysteriously know what to do next and be able to activate the magic. Yeah, in the end, it's nothing that convenient, but it's certainly different from when Alan chanted casting his spells up until now, because I saw the magical power. Right, I saw it. That means, after all, there is some magic that those of us who aren't magicians can use. Is this the magic that the kingdom was trying to hide? I don't know why they'd want to hide it. It might be dangerous magic. Or could it be hidden just to give magicians an advantage? Or something? It wasn't the worst case scenario of suddenly exploding when I cast the spell, but honestly, I was disappointed. I wish I could at least know what kind of magic it was. However, the theory that there is magic even I can use just became very probable. Let's just leave it at that. Now that I know that it's not going to explode all of a sudden, I can just try a bunch of things from now on. R. Roro. Our last girl's talk is today. Ron said, making a sniffle. Sound with her mouth, as she came into my room again with her serving of tea. A maid who often comes to rest in my room with a cup of tea. Is that okay? Is it really? Afterwards she always creates an atmosphere where we're old acquaintances, but we're not, right? Ron, even if you act cutesy in front of me, it won't do anything. That's mean, Roro. We won't see each other for a while. Isn't it lonely? You're gonna cry. Ron took a graceful sip of her tea, showing no sign of crying herself. But, Ron, won't you be back with Sir Claude's company for now? Yes, probably. Recently he's been busy with the liquor business, being taken here and there. Still, I wanted to relax here. No, I think you're too relaxed here aren't you? As I checked over my luggage before departing, I heard a knock knock. You? Are you ready? It was Alan's voice, so I called for him to enter, but Ron, next to me, said something like, Sir Alan? Oh no. And stood up, pretending to be a servant. At the same time, Alan appeared, carrying a large suitcase. Oh, what's this? Alan, what's going on? That suitcase is. Ah, Alan, that big load you've got there? I asked gingerly, and he nodded and burst out. I'm going to Ruby Fallen with you. Have you spoken to Irene? I told mother. She was against it. If she's against it, you can't. Can you? No, I'm going. You can't. Why not? You. Do you not want me to come? That's not the problem. Is it? Brother. Miss you. Me too. Me too. I go. Shira ran into the room sobbing. Her face bright red. Shira. You can't, it's dangerous. No, I'm going. Alan and Chira glared at each other. Looks like a sibling quarrel is beginning. During my stay at Rainforest, I played with Chira quite a lot. With someone to play with, Chira seemed to have fun chattering away every day. There aren't any other children Chira's age around, and I don't think she has any playmates, so she might be lonely. Irene said she'd hire a companion for her soon, but, that aside, Alan said, you can't, Chira, as if he's okay, but Alan can't either. After all, Chira, you'd definitely start crying to go home right away. I wouldn't, I'm good, too, I'm ready to go. Chira lifted a purse over her shoulder, apparently all her necessities were in it. What in the world are you bringing? Alan checked the contents of her bag, opening it to find three acorns and a small pebble. There was also a handkerchief, some candy, and a stuffed animal. What were you going to do with these? Alan held out the acorns and pebbles in his palm. Those were pretty so I picked them up. I'm gonna give them to people at Ruby Fallen. Nobody wants you giving them nuts and stones. It, it's good luck. This stone is really shiny. Chira grabbed the shiny stone from Alan's hand and held it to her chest. So cute. Honestly I have no use for a stone, but it's cute. You can't go to Ruby Fallen with that kind of luggage. You'd be riding in a carriage for days. You'd have to prepare. Alan proudly showed his sister the big full bag he was carrying. It really is stuffed, isn't it? That doesn't he have more luggage than I do? With that much stuff, what on earth is he bringing to Ruby Fallen? Also, Chira. If you come with us to Ruby Fallen you won't be able to see mother and father for days and days. You okay with that? I can't see them for days. Tomorrow and the day after? 
Tears sprang to Chira's eyes as her brother nodded vigorously. I don't want to not see them for days. Then you need to stay here with mother and father. But, I want to play more with Miss Ryu and you. It's alright, Ryu will come again next year, right? Chira nodded and gave a big sniff. She seemed to have given up. But, Alan, deciding on your own that I'm coming to Rainforest next year is a bit. But, it's for the cutie Chira. Somehow, going along with Chira's patience is irresistible. Brother, this is a shiny stone to give to the ruby fallen people. It's a present. I understand. I'll give it to them. Alan said with his habitually gentle face, and patted Chira's head. She tearily handed him the stone from her chest. I'm jealous. What a great relationship. Yeah, that's what I thought. No, Alan, I'm afraid the place I'm going is really bad, and without Irene's permission I can't take you with me. And coming this suddenly would be trouble for me, too. At my merciless pronouncement, Alan moaned, why not? And seeing him, Chira, who must have though it was a new game, copied him, saying, why not? And giggling, yeah, Chira is cute. Author's note. It's the end of the year. Thank you very much for your help this year. And please take care of me next year. Today's update will be the last until the end of the year. The next update is scheduled for three or four days after New Year's. Also, I've recently started a new little story. It's called, Family Move, Otherworld Card Collectors. Because I've stocked up some of it, it'll update every day via scheduled posts until New Year's. I'd love if you could read it at your leisure. In your spare time, have a happy new year, everyone. 102. The Mystery of Magic 5, Storm Warning. I'm used to it, so I just won't respond. Anyway, like Claude said, the mysterious Yu Oil sect seem to be keeping a low profile, so I'm in a generous enough mood to let this much pass. Once a true be fallen, I went to greet Mr. Bash as usual, and Tigasaku and some unusual people were there with him. Oh, Sir Seki and also Sir Ryuki, it's unusual for you to come to the mansion. Those were two of Ruby Fallen's few magicians, it's quite rare to bump into them, since they're always running all over the territory. It's been a while, Mistress Ryu. Elder brother, as well, glad to see you doing well. When Mr. Seki gave that greeting, Mamaka next to me ground out with flashing eyes, didn't I tell you not to call me big brother? Mr. Seki, who had red hair and a strong face with thick eyebrows, is surprising thoughtless. He needs to control his mouth. Ah, my apologies. Let's see. Be big sister, is that better? Miss Ku will be fine. M. Miss Ku. I gave the paling brother Seki a mild stare. Hey, find something more considerate to call her, little brother. M. Mamaku still hasn't come to terms with the fact that she's a big sister. Mamaku. Unable to overlook her brother's congealing blue face, gave a snort and relented, if that's too much, Kook is fine. That's Mama Koo for you. Brimming with charity, Kook is seemed to elicit no resistance, and I greeted Seki, who had regained the little complexion. It really has been a long time, hasn't it? Since I started attending school, I don't come back here except on holidays. Ah, until now. We've been going around the territory settling any problems that arise, but recently the big villages have someone called a knight errant who will come let us know if there's a problem. Because of that, I think we'll be working around the mansion more often, a knight errant? Oh, ah, come to think of it. Two years ago I sent out knights errant as a means of dealing with the beast damage problem. If possible, I was hoping they'd remain in the villages even after the beast damage problem was solved. But did they really just keep going after all? Is that so? Then, Sir Seki, it looks like you'll have a little more freedom, won't you? I was worried it was getting really hard for you. I really do think it's hard for them, really. I gave them a bit of ladylike appreciation as the Count's daughter, and Ryuki, the sorcerer next to Seki, gave a sort of ping. Oh, no. W. We're undeserving of your concern. It would be disrespectful. It's due to the Lady Yu's precious wisdom and grace that the people here live happy, modest lives. Ryuki is sounding a lot like one of the Yu Oir adherents. Come to think of it, despite being a magician, Ryuki was one of Tigasaku's followers. I gave a stealthy glance at Tigasaku, 
who was waiting to the side, and he came up with a startled face. Sir Ryuki, you mustn't speak so carelessly about Lady Yu's tale. It's a precious story that should be spread through one's character alone. Ah, please forgive me. Ryuki started banging his forehead on the floor. I stopped him with all my strength and calmed him down, saying, S Sir Ryuki, it's fine. I'd be embarrassed to let a magician who's been working so desperately for the sake of our people bow to me. Ryuki, you're scaring me. Even though he's a magician, Ryuki is a complete Tigasaku believer. Tigasaku's power is really amazing. Um, let's all sit down for now. We have a lot of things to discuss. Though it's unfortunate since you've just returned. Bash was the one who cut in. The conversation seemed to be heading in a good direction. I was saved. I took his offer and sat down on the sofa with everyone. What did you want to discuss? Is it about the liquor brewing? The brewing is going well. We've invited necromancers to the territory. The number of workers is increasing, and there aren't any production issues. What I'd like to discuss is countermeasures to rain on the fields. Bash began explaining that it had begun to rain a lot recently. Although there wasn't really any damage right now, they wanted to make sure it didn't damage the fields if it continued to rain so hard. Rain countermeasures. Is it? I hadn't thought about it much since I got the impression this region had a mild climate, but has it rained more recently? Yes, it's been raining a lot recently. I may be overthinking it. But when I was a student, I read a book in the library that said there was a year they suffered heavy rains about a thousand years ago, and then, it was said, the fields became useless, however, at that time there were many magicians, so it seems there wasn't much actual harm, but now, if the territory received heavy rainfall, we can't do anything, so I want to develop countermeasures. I read that library book, too. If it's rained that much recently. It might be a sign of a year of heavy rain. Even in the book, I think they wrote that the rain started little by little. I understand. I don't know if it can completely prevent all damage. But there is something I'd like to try, to start out. Sir Seki and Sir Ryuki are here today, so this might be just the thing. It will take the power of both of you to work. I began to explain how we could convert our fields to paddies rather than growing rice on dry land. There may be some areas where it would be difficult because of geological features, but those that were able could switch to growing rice in paddy fields. As for the necessary irrigation, while I was sorry for the timing of Seki and Ryuki just settling their pilgrimage and looking forward to staying in the mansion for a while, it would be quicker to have the two magicians do it. Unlike dry land rice in which the seeds are directly sown in the field, paddy cultivation is done by planting seedlings. Furthermore, since ruby fallen grows more than just rice, obviously the other crops would need fields to grow as well. So as another rain countermeasure, I added that we could raise terraced fields and mix in the rest as suitable. For the rice paddies, I'll make some notes on how to raise them efficiently so please lend me some people to transcribe them. I gave Bash some explanation of how it would work in the future. Since the cultivation method is different from dry land rice, I decided it was best to write it down so the farmers wouldn't be confused. I heard that there seemed to be knights stationed in the villages earlier, so if anything happens the people should be able to respond based on my written instructions. I was in high spirits over my flood control project. But Lord Bash's face was a little doubtful. As for lending you some people who can write, I don't mind. They're also mansion employees, and we can borrow from the company if there's an issue. But I can't imagine growing rice underwater. Are you sure it's okay? Ah, that's right. For someone who only knows dry land cultivation, rice paddies seem unbelievable, don't they? Furthermore, it's too much for a little girl like me to propose it. Though I was anxious since I think it's natural for Bash to be worried, Tigasaka next to him said in a loud voice, Sir Bash, there's nothing to be worried about. Since Lady Yu said it, you can be sure it's true. Lady Yu has been sent by heaven itself. And Ryuki gave a huge nod with an expression of budding excitement. I think it's reckless to listen to what a 12-year-old girl is saying. Sir Bash. It's okay. In fact, rice grown in paddies is less likely to become diseased, and should even bear more fruit. Also, I confirmed that they could be grown in water when I was at Garagari village, 
but since I couldn't do any large-scale irrigation at that time, I hadn't talked about it before now. I looked earnestly at Bash, who folded his arms and began to waver. How's that? Will that explanation somehow convince you? As I watched with bated breath, Bash gave a big nod. I see. Yes, that's right. Mew, you've been nothing but helpful so far. I get it. We'll try it. Bash said, and smiled. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, and Seki and Ryuki, will you be all right doing the irrigation works? Would you like to try it out in a nearby village? I gave Bash my huge thanks and addressed Seki. The most important thing for accomplishing this project will be the power of the two magicians. Certainly, we'd better do that first. Seki said and nodded. It was decided they'd go off to a farming village to begin construction of the waterworks immediately the next day. Mew, I'm sorry. We're asking for advice as soon as you got home. We're always grateful to you, and I'm grateful to Alex for inviting you to Ruby Fallen. Bash said, looking very heartfelt. I was surprised at his sudden mention of Alex. Ah, uh, about that, has boss Alex gotten in touch with you recently? No, I haven't heard from him. It's Alex, so I doubt he's dead, but it's strange that I haven't heard any rumors lately. I'd appreciate it if he didn't rebel, and continued being quiet like this. Bash said, laughing, and Mimaka responded with a little laugh of her own. Since it's Alex, I can't imagine him being so obedient. Ha ha. It's surprising. We've recently gotten to have delicious liquor for cheap. Maybe they're drinking that. Saying that, the three of them got somehow nostalgic. It was a little painful. I hadn't met the boss since I became a student. I only knew him from the two or three years we spent living in the mountains together. I've spent less time with him than Mamaku, and I'm afraid of his face and voice. But I do love boss very much. But it's a little frustrating that I'm not part of Bash's, Seki's and Mamaku's mood circle. After that, it expanded to not just boss Alex but stories about the bandit members Louville, Guama and Guy. All their nostalgic faces are a little painful, after all. 103. The Mystery of Magic 6, The People of House Ruby Fallen. Something like, we really miss the boss. Dahlia entered the guest room just as we'd blossomed into another nostalgic story. She was the first necromancer we'd hired. She's gotten a little sturdier. Mew, Kuki, it's been a long time. If you'd like, will you have a little of the new liquor I made? It's pretty good. She seemed to have already prepared it, as an employee followed her in carrying a tray with glasses and a bottle on it. Hey, now, has she been day drinking? Oh, Lady Dahlia, what good timing. We were just talking about an old friend of ours who likes to drink. Bash answered cheerfully as he poured a shot into the glass he'd been given. Do you want to drink, Mew? Mamaku asked me, proffering a glass. She also enjoys her alcohol. They don't prohibit children from drinking in this country, so it would be normal for me to drink, but I don't like to do it much since I feel it's bad for my growing body. Other children seem to feel the same way, and even the alcohol sold in the royal capital is only bought by adults. And since it's not good for children's growth, I've casually decided to limit sales to 18-year-olds and up at my pub and liquor store. No, I'm fine, thanks. Right, it's still a bit early for you isn't it? Ha ha, it's funny since you're the one who started us making alcohol. Would you like some juice? MMM. Yes please, but I'm fine with the tea that's already been set out for us. Dahlia. Pour some liquor for father. How long are you going to keep you and Cookie? They're tired and just got in. We'll need to show them to their rooms pretty soon. As we were talking, a woman's voice rang out. When I turned to the voice, a beautiful, Neatly groomed lady stood there. Ah, I haven't seen her for quite a while. It must have been when I first came to Ruby Fallen and met them. It was Bash's oldest daughter. I stood involuntarily at the unfamiliar woman and gave a greeting. It has been a while, Miss Gilita. Indeed it has. But, Mew, you can just call me sister, you know? You, that's kinder. If I did that, I'd have to call Mrs. Ruby Fallen mother. But my mother is Mamaku. Well, it's not like I've ever seen Bash's wife face to face. I've heard she's a magician, but she's sickly and bedridden. When I first greeted her, we spoke through the door since she said she was embarrassed at her bedridden appearance. W well, I'd get nervous doing that. Ha ha. 
Though I dodged the issue with a laugh, Galates seemed to be aware I tried to put her off, saying, You're so cold, you. That impotent feeling is just like Bash. Her face doesn't resemble Bash's, though, so she must take after her mother, or, but it's as Galata says. We've had a great time talking, but you're tired, aren't you? Let's get you to your room. And Minmaku quickly set her liquor glass on the table. Oh no. I'm fine. Besides, this is Dahlia's specially prepared alcohol. You just have fun, Mamaku. Or so I said. But Minmaku tried to go back to our rooms with me. I told her I wanted to rest in my room alone, so it was decided I'd go back first. As a result, Bash's daughter Gilita was chosen to guide me to my room. Looking at Gilita's back in front of me, I felt a little strange that this person had become my sister, even if only legally on the family register. While I was at Ruby Fallen, I'd had too much to do and hadn't had much contact with her, but I did feel like she'd also been avoiding me, but as far as I can tell from her reaction earlier, she seemed like a good person. I wonder if Bash's wife is like this, too? As I followed Gilita and thought, she stopped and looked back at me. By the way, Mew, I have a question for you. Yes, what is it? I didn't ask you to call me sister at first because I misunderstood you as Further's illegitimate child, and didn't treat you very kindly. Is that why you're worried? Eh? She thought of me like that? When we first met, I thought she was reserved, but certainly if you bring in an unknown child to be your adopted daughter, you can't help such suspicions. For me, it felt like I was just borrowing the title, so I became his adopted daughter casually, without thinking much about it. But it's true, Gulata and his wife didn't interact with me. I just passed it off as being totally natural, since I thought it was just a part of the noble lifestyle. Looking back now, his wife must have met me with a closed door because she suspected I was his illegitimate child. If so, I feel a little guilty. Oh, no, that's not it at all. I originally just borrowed the title so that I could go to school. I didn't go into the adoption expecting to be part of the family so I just didn't think of calling you sister. There wasn't any deep meaning to it. As I desperately defended myself, Galita gave a chuckle. That's great, then. I'm sorry for the misunderstanding. Someone told me it wasn't like that with you at all. Recently, and I was finally convinced. In fact, looking back on your work so far, Mew, you don't feel like an illegitimate child at all. Rather, I appreciate the stability you've brought to the territory. Thanks to you, Ruby Fallen's gotten a little quieter and my mother's fits have also calmed down. Who would have told her? Tigasaku, I bet. Wait, Galata wasn't a Tigasaku believer. Was she? I'm also curious about her mother's fits. I knew she was sick, but it sounds more serious than I thought, the lady. Is she very ill, then? Ill? Not precisely. My father and I keep an eye on her, but when she's free, she tries to use magic. Even though she's almost bedridden, she's going to wreck her body, using her magic like that. But thanks to you, the territory has quieted down and mother doesn't have as many fits, forcing herself to use magic. Before Seki and Ryuki came to Ruby Fallen, mother's burden took such a toll that her life was in danger at one point, but soon she should be recovered enough to stand and walk around. I see, that's good. If she's recovering, that's a good thing. No, I'm really sorry I caused her the suspicion of an illegitimate daughter being adopted while she was in such poor condition. Um, does the lady think of me as Bash's illegitimate daughter? Because that's not the case at all. I'm not illegitimate. I'm the child of a farmer in Garagari village. And now I'm Ramakus. And if anyone's going to be named as my father, it would be Boss Alex. Don't worry. Mother was surprised at first, but she accepted you even before I did. For me, it was more an issue of pride in mother and further's good relationship. So when you showed up, it hit me hard. So I treated you coldly. It was a misunderstanding. I'm really sorry. No, I'm sorry for doing something so misleading. R. Also, she said she treated me coldly, but the person in question doesn't seem to remember that at all, so there's no problem. No. I'm sorry for causing such confusion. Also, I have a quick question. Gulata, who told you I wasn't illegitimate, was it Tigasaku? Eh? No, it wasn't Tigasaku. That's good, I guess. 
For a moment I was afraid that Gilita might have fallen into Tigasaku's clutches, but fortunately, it doesn't seem like it. It was Sir Seki who told me about you, you. Gilita blushed red as she spoke. H hey, why are you blushing so deeply? I, I was sure Bash had told me a long time ago that Gilita was going to marry Ryuki the sorcerer and eventually take over as Countess. I'm getting visions of a soap opera. Shivering with omens of trouble, I quietly let Gilita guide me to my room. Okay, I didn't see anything. 104. The Mystery of Magic 7. Absolutely. Somehow, this has become a book. It will be released on January 30th by Hero Books. For details, please check my blog. In addition, the title has been updated accordingly. It's been changed from High Spec High School Girl in Another World to Resume of a Reincarnated Girl. Bam! An unknown title appears. If you're surprised, please rest assured, it'll still be High Spec High School Girl in Another World. Anyway, I'll continue to update the web version. So I appreciate your continued support. Guided by Galita, I entered my room and let out the breath I'd been holding. Yeah, I didn't see anything. For now. I looked around the room, thinking I'd drink tea while relaxing on the sofa. It's a very large room with a bed, two sofas, and a table, and there's still plenty of space. I was given this room for just me when I first came to Ruby Fallen, but in my mountain life, I slept in a pile with Boss Alex and everyone, so I would sometimes feel lonely sleeping in such a big bed in such a big room and sneak in to sleep with Mamaku. So I asked, why not just share a room, and now the two of us are in the same room. It's the same room I use every year, but it's a little different this year, isn't it? The size and layout are the same as always, but the decor has changed. Is it the curtains that are new? As soon as I entered the room, I went over to the bed while noticing the new decor and dived in without changing. I must have been surprisingly tired. Glitter, thanks for your concern. Oh, the bed sheets feel different from last year. It feels like they've casually gotten high class. I guess the territory must have gotten wealthy with the sale of liquor. Hey, hey, this feels nice. As I was thinking such things, the sound of the door opening woke me. It was Mamaku at the door. Oh my. Did I wake you? You can go back to sleep. No, it's fine. I was just trying it out a bit. I wasn't sleeping. Mamaku, who was a little flushed and tipsy, sat on a sofa and poured herself a glass of water from the pitcher on the table, then took a deep breath. I'm sorry, you. You were tired, but I was excited about Alex, and I just didn't think. No. I also enjoyed hearing stories about boss. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm happy to hear you say that. Thanks. After all, when I come back here I can't help thinking about Alex, and when Bash is here, it just happens. Mamaku is the same as always, huh? Me too. I only remember Boss's group when I return to Ruby Fallen. Those days of mountain living we spent together, waking up early in the morning, picking at a nutritious breakfast of wild boar stew, going hunting together or tanning leather while listening to the circle of elders telling tall tales about their daggers. Gathering mountain vegetables with Mamaku, becoming muscle man guy's dumbbell for his weight training, making medicine for boss's occasional wounds, singing for no reason, playing pipes, and everyone listening eagerly to my piping. Life at school is fun. I've made friends, and even Mamaku is there. It really is fun. But, as expected, there are times when I want to return to the mountains. If only we could spend time together like we did back then. Because I've realized something. As I assisted Ruby Fallen in running the territory, I might have found a hope. A possibility that Boss could come back. A possibility that he could return to us. Mamaku, I realized something. If the territory management is considered fine as is, and the life of the peasants stabilizes, I think Boss may have no more reason to fight. In that case, wouldn't Boss be able to come back? Mamaku's eyes widened in surprise, that. That would be lovely if it happened, but Alex is stubborn, so I'm not sure. She gave a troubled laugh, it may be that boss Alex is opposing the kingdom because of some personal feelings rather than rebelling to save the lives of the peasants. But, even if boss is stubborn, he can't do anything without the support of the peasants, whose side he's supposed to be on. I'm certainly suspicious about the monarchy. 
their policy of treating magicians as special, and thinking it okay to take a group of commoners who don't know anything and casting them off as a so-called pioneering village, but this country has no fighting. It's peaceful even if the reason for that is that magicians control all the weapons. Indeed, if their livelihoods thrive, even the magicians surely won't doing anything cruel, and even the farmers will lose their dissatisfaction, right? Then boss has to understand. To be honest, I have no basis to say thing will go well. I know that there's royalty like sleazy who call people who can't do magic livestock, but magicians are people, too. At school. I spent time around student magicians, and I know that they're not special just because they're magicians. They're just ordinary people, after all. There's no guarantee it'll work out as I imagine, but I'm sure things will work out. That's my position. I'm going to bring boss Alex to Mamaku's side. Mamaku seemed to get it, and looked at me with twinkling eyes. Really, Mew, you're amazing. I'd almost given up on stopping Alex myself, but I have a feeling you can do it. Ah. Yeah, I'll do my best. I'm the hard-working type. Eager to be praised and petted, I climbed off the bed and sat next to Mamaku on the sofa. She patted me on my cheerful head. I think I'll prepare some delicious liquor to ease boss Alex's return. And everyone can drink happily again. I'll play my pipe, and maybe Louisville will have gotten good enough to play with me. And Kwama and Guy can dance, and boss Alex will laugh with his usual scary face. I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun. When I looked up at Mamaku, for some reason she had tears in her eyes. She hugged me as if to hide her face, saying, Thank you. I'm happy you feel that way, but please don't work yourself too hard. Mamaku, I'm not doing that at all. I'm not. In my previous life, I wanted my parents' approval, so I overworked terribly. In order to get first place in everything, I neglected sleep to study and practiced so much for a music competition award that I injured my fingers. But I wasn't rewarded no matter how hard I tried, wearing out my mind and body, and still kept doing it. But the things I do for Minmaku and Boss Alex aren't impossible at all. Because if I work hard, Minmaku will respond properly. Do you know how happy that makes me? Do you know how relieved and happy I am just that you laugh back when I laugh? When I'm doing my best for you. It's all things I want to do, so nothing's impossible. I will absolutely bring Alex back to you, Mamaku. Absolutely. 105. The Mystery of Magic 8, Training in Paper Making. I also wrote out the Paddy Cultivation Method, and some people who could write were hired to transcribe it. Yeah, this is good. Things are going smoothly. Now, if only this next part would go smoothly. I thought, looking at my homemade spell book. Once I cast that one spell, and found out that no explosions or anything happened, I'd been biding my time until I had a break where Minmaku wasn't with me. The invocation did nothing except for that warmth seeping out. No way. Could it just be magic to emit warmth? Could the government have hidden it because it wasn't very useful magic? No. Couldn't be. I really don't think that's the case. Do I have to steal the closely guarded Grimo Eye of Salvation from the library, after all? If I read the Grimo Eye of Salvation, would I find out the true effect of a spell that leaks warmth? No, from my talks with Alan, only the spells are written in the magic book, no explanations about the effects or anything. But I won't know unless I look. However, since I couldn't see it anyway, I just made my own spell collection. Yeah, it's out of my hands. Well, anyway, my magic investigation isn't under any deadline. That said. I would like to personally try out magic. I do want to be a magical girl. As I was doing this and that, before I knew it my stay at Ruby Fallen was over and I had to go back to school. I asked Bash to send me a letter letting me know immediately if they had any problems with the rice paddy plan. Tigasaku was quiet. The rice paddy plan was progressing, the additional necromancers for sake brewing were doing well, and Gilita seemed to have blossomed so everything looked good for this year's departure. Basically the only issue was the touch of anxiety I always had about Tukasaku. When I went back to school, I'd be very busy dealing with the full-scale expansion of my pub franchise. According to Claude's plan, distribution of liquor to the capital should be beginning about this time. The made-in Ruby Fallen liquor would cause an alcohol boom in the capital. 
By this time next year, my room at Ruby Fallen might be filled with lavish fur rugs. He he. I had been concentrating on my studies at school, but now I'd be starting a business with the savings I'd accumulated from the sale of liquor. New Ruby Fallen Incorporated. I thought about giving it a more stylish name, but I couldn't think of one, and most other businesses were also named after their owners. It's still a small business, but I'm hoping to turn it into a big corporation someday. If the liquor business goes well, I'm sure to get a merchant title. I've become a fourth year, and the School of Commerce classes have gotten more specialized. However, although there are things like money-making practicums and paper-making practicums, apparently only the top five people by grades are allowed to participate. Last year I was busy with the liquor business and wasn't a serious student, but as a fourth year I'll make a renewed effort at my schoolwork. After all, Grandma told me that he'd made the dagger of God killing during his money-making practicums. But were those the practicums that only the top-ranked students could take? Was Kwama really the kind to get good grades? That doesn't seem right. So I have to concentrate more on my studies. But starting a business is also hard work, so that will cut into my after-school work. However, the liquor operation is under the management of my business, and the newly married couple, Joshua and Meliz, are solid. So it won't be a big deal if I take my eyes off it for a bit. Leaving the business to my assistants, I played up my appeal as an excellent student who took my classes seriously, and was permitted to attend the first practicum, which was on paper making. It's my first practical coursework, my beating heart. The instructor was Professor Barron, who taught in the School of Commerce. He was the teacher with the strong features and sideburns who took care of us during the Mana Drain event when I was a first year. I was curious earlier because this country's papermaking technology was quite wonderful. I'd thought it was surely made by a magician's magic, but if it's a school of commerce practicum, could it really be made by hand? With that heart-throbbing feeling of experiencing true craftsmanship, we entered the factory. Surprisingly, Alan's group was there. Alan. Katarina, Ritz, and some students from the after-school crowd, all young magicians. They were examining the paper-making craftsmen with serious faces. What could they be in the paper-making? Professor Barron noticed my quizzical expression and began to explain. The paper-making practicum is a collaboration with students from the School of Magic. Because the paper itself is made by magic, our job is to package up the finished paper. A eh? paper is made by magic after all? We're doing packing work. Is there any real meaning to it being a practicum, then? Thinking such a thing. I stared at the serious magic students in the practicum. They hadn't noticed yet that the School of Commerce students had arrived. I decided to quietly watch how the magicians worked. Also, it seemed like it was my henchman Alan's turn to practice. Alan extended his hand toward the pile of prepared wood and chanted a spell. The wood burst into tiny pieces and then formed into a large, thin sheet of paper. Whoa, magic is awesome. This must be true craftsmanship. Then, Lady Katerina went up to the big sheet of paper. She cast a spell probably wind and cut the paper neatly. Whoa, magic is awesome. True craftsmanship, isn't it? Although it's different than I imagined, it isn't craftsmanship. It's just a plain old fantastic magician. We students from the School of Commerce went and gathered the paper, which was about day four size. So this was the special practicum that I was really looking forward to. Are the other practicums better? Ow. Ah. A cut. I was kind of annoyed, so I was tying the paper roughly, and cut my finger on it a bit. My mistake. I need to calm down. My paper cut throbbed dully. I took a deep breath and calmed myself, then handed the bundle of paper to Professor Barron. Well, maybe it's just because it's our first practicum. Something like this wouldn't require those with the highest grades. But thinking about the paper being made by magic, can this paper be made to disappear by a sorcery spell? In other words, are all the products and books made from this paper under the control of magicians? As I recall from talking with Alan's group, the magic dispelling spell is uniquely different from other spells. I've heard it has a wide area of effect. Basically, magic can only reach where the magician can see. But the dispel spell can be used on something far away that isn't visible. If so, then, if they become aware of a book someone wrote that isn't in the country's best interests, 
it could be instantly destroyed, even if it's far away, how should I put it, aren't magicians way too cautious about people who can't use magic, not just the use of force, but knowledge itself, do they really have to go that far to suppress it, for the time being, I might need to put my spell collection somewhere else, copy it onto paper that I made myself, 106, the mystery of magic 9, Salem's Martial Arts Tournament I don't like that this one of a kind spell book can be dissolved with a single spell. Despite my having carefully assembled it paper, could I weave plant fibers and pack them together? Would it be easier to make parchment? Well, I'll figure it out eventually. First of all, the spell. I still haven't figured out any spell effects yet. I've started chanting the spell as a daily routine. As I chant, I study the page that contains the warmth emitting spell. Every day as I recite the spell, I'll try things like yelling invoke, or go, or standing on my head as I chant. Magic isn't easy to invoke, it just glows around my body and emits warmth. What in the world can I try today? Spell. Yesterday I tried chanting with my eyes shut. My ears stopped up, holding my nose, with my hands and feet bound, and with all five senses blocked. Maybe I should try the opposite, chanting in a relaxed state. While sprawled out like this. Ufus eribacado tanoinaba ottos yutashin imaroyani akikas zofaku. At evening the rice vines at my gate knock gently and falls wandering wind enters my thatched hut. Oh, it's becoming warm, and then, as always, the light surrounding my body disappeared after a few seconds, I couldn't discern any change to my state, ok, next, otanikikuta kashina hamano adanimawa keiji esadino nuramako soja, I hear the vain roar of takashi beaches wave, I will not reach out lest my sleeve be wet, yes, this one also made me warm, and the light surrounding my body disappeared after 10 seconds, no change, Okay, next. Chigari Akishi says Magatsu Iyu Woe no Chenai Da Hair Katoshi no Ekumoi You promised life as the dew of the Seisimo plant. Alas, this autumn, too, is passing. Yes, yes, the same as always. It's emitting warmth. What? What's this? It's different. The glow surrounding my body is the same, and the warmth is the same but there's a strange light gathering at the tip of my right forefinger. I fixed my attention on my finger at the point light was gathering. Oh, that's where I got that paper cut today. Just as I muttered that, ouch, suddenly I felt a hot pain, like a burn, in my fingertip. WHWH what's going on? As I stared at my fingertip. What? Did the cut on my finger just, dis, appear? I touched my finger with my left hand. It should have been right there, but there was no scar, and when I poked it, there was no pain. Could this be magic? Thinking about it, this is a fantasy world of sword and sorcery, but there wasn't anything like healing magic. Rather than healing magic, there's an abundance of medical experts who've studied medicine, like Mimaku. Even at school, there's a school of medicine where the subject is studied academically. In this country that relies on magic, there are many areas that feel a step behind in civilization compared to my previous life, but in pharmacological studies, because there's no healing magic, the country is comparatively advanced, but healing magic exists, could this be the healing magic technique that everyone until now thought magic couldn't do? If that's the case, this is a really convenient power, healing magic is amazing. Ah, but, could I be celebrating too early? It was a very small wound. I'll just do a little experimenting. The results of my experiments. I've confirmed that Chigairi Akishi says Magatsu Iyuwoe no Chenai Da Hair Katoshi no Ikamoi Numeri is indeed a spell to cure wounds. With a knife I had on hand, I gave my arm a small slice and chanted the spell, and the wound healed instantly. Even if I made deep cuts one after another, as soon as the spell was cast, they healed. Amazing. This spell is a healing spell as I suspected, the only problem is that when the spell heals, it feels really painful for a while, for a moment it feels like I'm being electrocuted. When you think of healing magic, it feels like it should treat wounds with a soft, warm light. As an experiment, I tried casting other spells after making a wound, but there was no reaction. 
Probably the other spells invoke some other kind of magic. I don't know what other kinds of handy magic they could be hiding, but I'm getting really excited. It's probably a similar kind of magic to healing magic, right? Could it be magic to cure not only my own but other people's wounds? Or is there a different spell to cure other people's wounds? I'm curious. I'm dangerously curious. I'm sorry, but I really want to catch a snake in the wooded area of campus and experiment on it. If they're too hard to catch, the butcher sells live frogs. But I'm a little worried. Why would the country go so far to hide such a convenient spell? Although, maybe it's because it's so useful and convenient. Is it really useful? Maybe there's something I don't know yet. Today, Miss Katarina, Charlie, and I came to cheer on Salamata Sword Fighting Tournament. Apparently the final exam for the fourth years in the School of Knighthood was participation in a sword fighting tournament. The School of Knighthood is almost all boys, but Salome belongs to it as well, and she's actually pretty strong. Making it to the Elite Eight of the Sword Fighting Tournament, we were brought along by Miss Katarina to cheer for her in her match to advance to the semi-finals. Look over there, Ryu, there's Salome. Hey, look. Miss Katarina pulled vigorously on the hem of my uniform. Why yeah, I know. I'm looking too, so please don't pull so hard. You're strangling me. Calm down. The athletes came into the center of the small dome-shaped building, surrounded by spectators. It looked like the Colosseum in Rome, Italy. When Lady Salo entered, looking unruffled, she seemed to already have fans, because bold male shouts of Salo broke out all over. Seriously? Those disgusting voices, so familiar. Really? Ah, Salo waving at those filthy men who talk like that, you don't have to do that, Paul, Miss Katarina, you're grabbing my clothes, please stop jumping up and down, my skirt's about to tear, in fact, it's already torn, I finally pulled my clothes back from Miss Katarina and got them back in order, they're wrinkled, ah, ah, I'm sorry, you, it was just a convenient thing to grab, Please be more careful. Well, I know the feeling of getting fired up at an event. As I smoothed the wrinkles from my skirt, Charlie, who was sitting next to me, got up. Ah, Miss Katarina, look, Miss Salem is looking at us and waving. As Charlotte shouted, Lady Katarina craned her neck around the arena so fast I thought it made a boing sound. Oh my, she sure is. Salem's looking at me. She knows, even though we're so far away. Mew, Charlotte. Don't get the wrong idea. Salome's waving at me. It's fine. We're not misunderstanding. Calm down. Also, please don't grab my shoulder. That is a surprisingly firm shoulder grip. Then her opponent entered. He was a tall young man, with plenty of muscles. He looked like he was about 13. The opponent's weapon was a standard double-edged sword. Lady Salome had a long, slender sabre. Both were wearing light armor. When the match began, they both took up stances with no openings, as you'd expect of remaining elite eight fighters. In particular, Salem gave off a sort of refined or flexible feeling, but with a solid core. No way, Salem is so cool. Next to me, Lady Katarina was watching intently with her hands folded as if praying. Salome moved quickly, with a fighting style as though she were toying with her opponent. Her opponent was a power type, who didn't move much and seemed to be watching to take advantage of his opponent's attack and cut deep. It was quite a fight. Even so, School of Knighthood people are covered with wounds and bruises. Although Salome didn't seem to have anything, her white skin barely marred with any trace of a cut. I could see the opponent's bruises and wounds occasionally through the gaps in his armor. Well, of course, if you practice every day, you'll get bruises like that. Bruises, huh? This is good. I want to use those. I want to try something. Healing magic, because they're so full of bruises. Ah, no, I can't. I shouldn't do human experimentation. I broke out of the rhythm of murmuring the spell. B but, even though it's human experimentation, it's true that they're already wounded. It's not like I'm kidnapping them and keeping them blindfolded and with plugged ears as prisoners. No, you can't. You out of the question. Stop thinking like a mad scientist. But, frankly, my study of spells has plateaued since then. I haven't discovered the effects of any other spells. Furthermore, I recently discovered that the healing magic can only treat my own body at present. Other bodies, like those of frogs, 
weren't healed even when I wounded them and cast the spell. How can the spell be so useless? It's possible that there is no spell that has the ability to cure others. If so, if it can't be used to treat the wounds of others, I can kind of understand why the country hid it, because since neither sorcerers nor spiritualists can cast the spell for healing magic, their wounds can't be cured. Comparatively, we who can cure our wounds should be nearly immortal. In the worst case, if it came to war, wouldn't the magician's side be at a major disadvantage? Just like they control the weapon supply with magic, they're hiding healing magic. No, but, I can't say that yet because I still haven't determined whether it's possible to heal another person's body with magic. What I just said only applies in the scenario where healing magic practitioners can only heal their own bodies. If we can heal other people's bodies, healing magic would be useful for magicians, too. I don't understand the principles of magic well, yet, but I think that if you can heal your own body with magic, you should be able to heal others, as well. Could it be failing because I'm experimenting with frogs? As I thought, I really need human experimentation. Looking at the bodies of the School of Knighthood members covered in wounds, I drooled a little. I really want to do just a little bit of human experimentation. But, as you'd expect, that's a dangerous step to take. I can't just blurt out a strange spell or I'll be exposed. I'd have to use information control, like blindfolding them and plugging their ears. So it seems like kidnapping them as prisoners is the only way. While I was troubling myself with such thoughts, the atmosphere of Lady Salem's match changed. The two had been maintaining a set distance from each other as they fought, but now Salome drew back a bit from her opponent. She loosened her stance and relaxed letting the tension drain from her shoulders. As her opponent cautiously watched Lady Salome's sudden change, she slowly undid the top three buttons of her blouse. What amazing moves she seemed to make, smiling as she undid her buttons. As a thirteen-year-old, she's already showing a fair amount of cleavage, I see. The hall fell silent as everyone watched with bated breath. Lady Salome silently slunk up to her red-cheeked innocent opponent and quickly thrust her sword at his throat. Ah, I, I give up. Her opponent said, looking at the sword against his throat and the girl's gleaming chest, and called the match. It was Lady Salome's victory. Everyone in the hall was caught in the Salome honey trap. W wow, Salome. Making use of everything you've got. I like it. However. It seemed the young lady next to me was dissatisfied. Well, Salome, do not do that. I've always told you that's not okay. She stamped her foot. 107. The mystery of magic 10, to grow up is to hurt each other. See? I believe they're good for one's diet and beauty. Yeah. Mamaku eyed me suspiciously, since I kept bringing her frog meat every day. Mew, <laughs> you're not keeping any secrets from me, are you? Pow. Mamaku is really sharp. She can see through anything. Frog again. It's been a while since I've eaten so much fatty meat. Henchman Allen, who of course had gotten to Mamaku's house before me, complained. Be quiet, you thieving henchman. Well then, Allen, you don't have to eat here. In fact, Allen, you've been coming here a lot. Haven't you been here almost every day recently? S. So what? Anyway. I'm doing all kinds of stuff with magic to make up the cost of the meal, and even Kuki said I could come. Ku is just kind-hearted, you're getting carried away. I don't think it's right to enter my house without my permission. Let me come in first. But when I asked you, didn't you say you couldn't? That's not it. It's fine to come about once every five days. That's not gonna happen. Th this. As I quarreled with Alan, Minmaku watched us with a happy look then took the gift of frog meat into the kitchen. I guess she's going to cook the frog. R. today's another frog meat dish. Why do you only ever buy frog meat? I like it. I can't tell him. I can't tell the truth that they're for my experiments. Alan raised his eyebrow at me, a little suspicion in his eyes. Oh boy, I'd better change the topic. And if you don't like frog meat, you're welcome to stop coming and eating at Ku's place. W.H. what? It's fine. Anyway, why do you hate it so much that we're all eating together? Do you hate me that much? N no. It's not that I dislike it. Uh oh, my henchman is getting a little depressed. 
Don't stare at me with those pitiful little henchman eyes. I it's not that I dislike that, specifically. It's fun to have dinner together, but... But when Alan's here, Mamaku isn't really able to let herself out. Because in the capital, other than with me, she has to play the part of a normal man. Even though she occasionally lets Alan see a bit of her big sister personality, she's hiding the bulk of it. Because, when she came to the capital, people would say hateful things, so she sealed up her big sister side. So when Alan is here, it's tiring for Mamaku since she can't really let herself out. But, look, I think that it's harder to cook the more people there are, so Ku gets tired. But I've been helping out, and Kuki even said it's easier with me around. Th that's just because Ku is so tender-hearted. Mew, could it be that you think that when I'm around, Kuki has to hide their true self? Is that what you hate? My breath caught for a moment. Even Alan can make good guesses. Even Alan. WH what are you talking about? I it's not like Ku has anything to hide. You know, when we spend time around one another, our true natures are bound to come out. We don't have to hide it. I don't care at all. If you don't like that Kuki has to pretend in front of me, I'll just tell Kuki that it's not necessary anymore. Eh? Did Alan really notice? About Mamaku. Well. It's true that he's spent enough time around Mimaku, but even saying that. But, but, when we came to the capital, the people who knew Mamaku's big sister side only focused on how weird it was. People would say things like, what the heck, and disgusting. You say that, but aren't you just gonna say it's disgusting after all? When I said that in a loud voice, I heard a clang of silverware. Looking at the sound, there was Mimaku with a dish of soup. Apparently, she'd just come in from the kitchen to set the table for dinner, and then I realized she must have heard my words from just now. What the hell did I say just now? It's disgusting after all. As if I thought of Mamaka that way in my mind. That wasn't supposed to come out like that. That, that wasn't. Mamaku isn't disgusting. She's the best mother ever. But when he came to the capital, people around us looked at her like she was disgusting and said ugly things like that. Oh no. Did you notice, Alan? When we came to the capital, people said all kinds of terrible things. But, if Alan says he's fine with it, I guess I can show my feminine side. Mamaku said in a bright voice, and gave a clatter of tableware. Mamaku kept her usual smiling face, skillfully preparing the table for dinner. It's how Mamaku always is, like she doesn't give it any special mind. But, as I thought, you can't judge Mamaku by her face. Because if she's hurt, she doesn't show it on her face. So that nobody remembers afterward. Mamaku stayed vanilla in front of Alan for the time. But it felt like the meal was over before I knew it. And Alan and I were walking through the school gates. I couldn't remember the rest. What kind of face did I make in front of Mamaku? What kind of face did Mamaku see? Alan, in front of me, began trudging toward his dorm. Wait, Alan. Alan can tell me. Hey, Alan. Alan gave a heave of his shoulders and turned back to me. I could hear him say, have you woken back up? But I ignored him and asked about Mamaku. Was Ku okay? After I said something weird about. About Mima. She was the same as usual. You were the weird one, were you? Because I said something so terrible. I didn't mean to make her feel bad. It just came out wrong. I definitely hurt Mamaku. Okay, I don't think she really cared. Well, she was worried seeing you looking so down. How could she not care? I love Mamaku. I never meant to say something so revolting. Why did I say such a thing? You, when she sent us home I get the feeling you were off in your own world and weren't listening, but Kuki talked about it. When you came to the capital people said various things, but she was fine herself, being used to it. She thinks you were the one who was hurt. Don't you think Kuki understands? You don't think of her like that. It's true I felt extremely bad back then. But after all, they were saying all those bad things about Mamaku. Who's my most important person? Will Mamaku forgive me? Not just forgive you, I don't think she cared in the first place, will you? I think she would feel worse if you stayed depressed over it. That's true, that's how she is. No matter what anyone says, she just murmurs, whatever. I'm sorry. Instead of feeling bad, I'll just tell her I love her. I'll believe Alan. 
Alan said Mamaku would definitely forgive me. Sorry, Mamaku. Really? What am I doing? I hurt Mamaku. Suddenly I remembered the words Sir Kane said to me. I believe it was when I had first come to school and gotten in a big fight with Alan. While we were crying and making up, Sir Kane comforted us. People grow up by hurting one another and getting hurt. That's what Sir Kane said. Has Sir Kane ever actually hurt anyone? I might have hurt Ku. Was this necessary for me to become an adult? Is it really necessary? In my previous life, I was very awkward. If I have to learn to grow up by hurting people over and over again, I don't think I want to grow up. But to go as far as hurting my most important person. Hey, Alan, do you remember what Sir Kane said that time you and I fought about becoming adults by hurting each other? Of course, I remember everything Brother Kane says. Ah, that's right. He wouldn't have to work hard with such a powerful memory. A brother complex as always. Well, I also have a fath. A mother complex. If it's true that you can't become an adult without hurting anyone, I don't think I want to grow up. Because I don't want to hurt anyone. It's best not to hurt anyone. I regret hurting someone I know. If I have to repeat that many times to grow up, then growing up is no good. I felt Talon's feet stop next to me. He must have been surprised. To hear me say such a strange thing. Even if I say that, my body will grow anyway and it might be hard to live without hurting anyone. After all, I can't even live as I am now without interfering with other people. Because I've finally found some people who see me as important. You, don't say that. I was a few steps ahead of Alan, who had stopped, and when I looked back he had a sad look on his face. Because, I'm really inconsiderate, and I might hurt someone without even knowing. Really? I just want to be more important, and in the end I just selfishly impose. And, so, Alan turned suddenly and looked straight at me. He looks like this sometimes, such a straightforward person that you get embarrassed seeing him. Also, I, kinda, it's okay if you hurt me, you, I wouldn't mind being hurt for you. Alan said with such a serious face that I stared at him in surprise. Then Alan's face turned red and he dashed off into the men's dormitory. He ran off so suddenly. What? I was just about to say something to Alan's retreating back when he stopped halfway and looked back. A hey, anyway, Cookie might be thinking the same thing. Alan said, and ran back into the dormitory. Alan, it's okay to get hurt. Was he just comforting me? Or could Alan? Perhaps. 108. The Mystery of Magic 11. Henchman can't declare love in a parallel world story. Or should I say, I apologized. I told her I'm sorry for saying something weird. And I love you. And talked about my anxiety that I hadn't even known myself. How I couldn't forget those insults to Mamaku when we first came to the capital. Mamaku, before I even explained, understood those things already, as expected of her. It's been a few days since I apologized and Mamaku has broken the seal on her big sister voice because I told her it was fine already. Even if people say anything, Mamaku is still number one in the world to me. I don't care what strangers say. It's a little unpleasant feeling, but it's fortunately only at the level of the prank where some jerk gives you an oil stain that can't be rubbed out. It turned out the one whom Mamaku was sealing everything up for was me, in order that I wouldn't feel uncomfortable. Although I told her that I'd bring the boss back to her, and even with all my effort to support her, it turned out I was being supported by Mamaku. I'm no match for her. Mamaku, thank you, for everything. When I said that as the two of us were relaxing after dinner, Mamaku laughed and said, What's this all of a sudden? Thanks for everything, too, you. But honestly, I just feel really grateful to be with her, even including my previous life. Sometimes I think Mamaku is too wonderful, that she's a dream I conjured up. An illusion. A, eh? she's not really an illusion. Is she? She's not, right? Mamaku, you're real, right? A, eh? well, of course I'm real. What's wrong with you? Relaxing in our rooms with her after dinner, after so long a time, made me too happy, and I dreamt up a Mamaku phantom theory, but it's all good. She's not an illusion, just to be sure. I measured her pulse, but there was no abnormality. You, really? Sometimes you're so wild. Well, that's cute, too. Oh, by the way, Alan hasn't been here recently. 
R, that's true. I'll invite him tomorrow. Recently, in consideration for Mamaku and me, Alan's been holding himself back from having dinner with us, but we were done reconciling, so I ought to re-invite him. After all, I had Alan to thank for realizing what I did. By the way, Alan said something to me. Could he like me? At the time, Alan said, it's okay if you hurt me. Could this guy have fallen for me? I thought for a moment, but at school later he acted the same as always, there was no change. I want to imagine Alan falling in love with me. No, well, I know that he likes me, and I like him too, but I think it's more of a boss henchman kind of feeling. Rather, how could Alan who was such a brat like me? Was it the moment I got muddy water on him? Well, but to be sure I am cute. Because Mamaku said I was cute, and when choosing clothes for me said, you should wear cute clothes, new, so they match you. So I have Mamaku's seal of approval on my cuteness. It's undeniable. Be but Alan, I'd understand if I only got attention from the other boys. After all, Mamaku says I'm cute every day. And although she may be misrepresenting the mood a bit, I must be somewhat cute. I'd even understand if there was a fan club of boys that said they liked me. Because I have Mamaku's seal of approval. But Alan, since I'm basically a boss in front of Alan, well, I actually am his boss. If I were a man, I wouldn't want that kind of heroine. But maybe if he likes the kind of bossy heroine like me while he's young, Alan could awaken some kind of masochist tendency. Or rather, his last words to me. He doesn't mind if I hurt him. A, eh? no way. Did he mean he's an M? Oh no. That could actually be it. And most of all, rather, aren't I being too forward thinking about like or love with Alan? I don't think that range of feelings is even growing in me yet. I still haven't had my first love not even in my previous life, my previous life, even, and even so, whether that bratty henchman Alan likes me or loves me, to shout out my love in the middle of the world, I can't let myself be a boss like that, could it be that I, the boss, am inferior to my henchman in emotional growth, yeah, thinking about it calmly, that conclusion is impossible, in that case, I can consider Alan's remark from the other day to be, as expected, a clever line he said in an extreme effort to comfort his sorrowful boss. Being okay with being hurt for my sake must be, must be his ardent chivalry. I'm deeply moved. How should I say it, Alan, being willing to be hurt for my sake. Is that so? I see. 109. The Mystery of Magic 12. Welcome to my laboratory. This will just be a little jab. It may be a little sting at first. But just for a moment. H. Hey, you. Why do I need to be blindfolded? You can't say that now, Alan. You accepted the blindfold. Oh, and later you'll need earplugs. Eh? Why? Also, why are we doing this in your room? Oh no, Alan. Didn't you say it yourself? That you'd be willing to be hurt for my sake? So it's only a little wound, but also the wound will be immediately healed. No, when I said that. I wasn't meaning I was fine being hurt in a physical sense. S-H-H. Alan, don't shout so loud. Please. This is the women's dorm. If we're found out it would be serious. I've prepared soundproof equipment just in case, but it's not perfect. I had lured Alan out with cunning words and brought him to my laboratory, that is, my dorm room. Since I had done my matchstick making in my room, I'd made many improvements to it. In order to strengthen it so it wouldn't be affected by a few explosions, I'd attached iron plating, and, of course, given its soundproof capabilities. I'd had Alan sit in a special chair, but when I'd offhandedly called it a magic experiment, his imagination had begun to run wild. Even if you say that, what's up with this chair? Some kind of belt-like things are holding down my wrists and feet. I'm scared. There there, cowardly henchman. Just a bit, it's just a little prick. Like an injection. Basically, I had said, Alan, I have a favor to ask. Earlier, didn't you say you wouldn't mind being hurt if it was for my sake? It made me very happy. So, um, it might hurt but I want to try something. Would you come with me to my room? When I asked, he quickly nodded with a firm look as though he were preparing for something. What happened to his resolve? Your hands and feet are restrained so you don't do anything wrong. After all, you'd struggle if you came to my room and I took out a needle. I did explain that you might be injured, 
So you were probably warned, right? Since you followed me anyway, please be prepared for the consequences. That's because I didn't think you meant this. Then, what did you think I meant? What? I, I didn't think. I didn't think anything. As he spoke, my cowardly henchman got even more flustered, with a crimson face. Okay, what's up with that? My henchman had come to my room, my lab, but didn't think he was coming there, or something. I gave Alan a long stare. After a moment, he bowed his head. I get it. I'll be quiet, so just fasten my hands and feet, quickly. Oh, will he really be quiet? But, well, I feel sorry for Alan, now. I want to release him. I've gone this far, but I don't particularly want to force him. Let's stop the human experimentation after all. I'm going to stop, after all. I had thought you might lose your cool and force your way out. But if you don't want to, that's all right. When I untied Alan's restraint, he used his free hand to lift the blindfold a little, with a sulky face. Not really, it's fine if it's just a tickle. I was just a little surprised just now. But, what's the point of all this? I'm sorry, I can't tell you yet. I still don't want anyone to know, if possible. I'm sorry, Alan. I can't tell you that. You can't even tell me? Not even to you. Someday I may be able to. Alan gave me a dissatisfied look. However, whatever dissatisfied face he shows, I can't give in here, I thought, smiling back at him. And he sighed in resignation. I hope you will be able to tell me someday. Should I put in the earplugs? Alan seemed to have somehow decided to cooperate. I'm very sorry. Well, but as a henchman, this boss would be happier if he listened to his boss more readily. He doesn't seem to be thinking of me as his boss. I passed Talon the earplugs and he put them in, then tied his blindfold on again. Okay, we're good to go. Although I thought the way he stiffened his face a little was pitiful, since he didn't know when the pain would hit, I stabbed his fingertip with a needle. He gave a momentary jump at the pain of the needle prick. Sorry, Alan. The pain should be over with this. In order to give Alan a little peace of mind, so he would know the pain was over. I clapped my hands. At that, Alan's expression seemed to soften a little. Thanks for the hard work, Alan. Then I returned my focus to Alan's fingertip, where I'd stuck the needle. Blood was oozing from the wound. I chanted the prepared spells in order. I had chanted several spells, but, ah, as I'd feared, they didn't work. It was no different from the frogs. There wasn't a single sign of Alan's wound healing. After a long time, the blood stopped flowing naturally, so I thought I might as well end today's experiment there. <laughs> Why wasn't it working? When I cast the spell, I could only see the magical aura around myself. I think that's the problem. If I could get the aura onto Alan, I think I may be able to heal his wounds. At least, that's what I thought. But when I put my finger with the aura on Alan's wound, there were no changes. Even if I hold my aura against someone, somehow I have a feeling that's not right. I think I have to transfer the aura itself onto Alan so that it covers him entirely. Basically, it feels like the magical aura is able to cure Owen's own wounds by collecting at the wounded spot, healing it automatically as it recognizes it. But how in the world do I get the aura onto Alan? Is it a different spell? Or, as I feared, is there no magic that can heal other people? It may be better to set aside healing magic for now and concentrate on spells with other effects. Once I've gotten some of those down, there may be something that lets me use healing magic. Oh, I'd better release Alan soon. Although there was no difference in experimental results from the frogs, I did notice some things trying it on a person. I have to thank Alan. It's over. I'm taking off the blindfold. As I removed it, Alan yawned, saying, You're done? And removed the earplugs himself. Alan, thank you. You've really helped me out. It's fine, but please don't ask anyone else to do such a strange thing. Yeah, of course I won't. Because it's easier to ask my henchman. I know. Anyway, what are you doing today? Will you come with me to Mamaku's? I wish I could, but it's going to rain again today. My clothes got wet the other day, so I'd rather not go outside anymore. Alan said, looking out the window. I looked out as well and saw the rain was falling heavily. Indeed, it's been raining a lot recently. Not just in the capital, 
but all over the country has been suffering heavy downfalls. During the last vacation, when Bash said this might be a year of heavy rain, he seemed to have hit the jackpot. Are the people of Ruby fallen all right? The letter I'd recently received from Bash said they were making do somehow. People in other territories would be able to recover with magic, even if their fields were destroyed, but not our territory. I hope the rain countermeasures work well. It may be difficult to get away with no damage when the rain is falling like this. Ultimately I decided to give up going to Mamaku's house that day, as well. 111. The Mystery of Magic 14. Attack of the Flying Demon, Part 1. Some students rushed to the library, the nearest building. W. Wait, don't run away. As I spoke, pink droppings fell near the kids who'd run away. As before, Alan immediately buried it but the panicked students seem to have breathed in the pink cloud that has moment really appear, and they dropped. I thought that the students watching that scene would also become panicky, so before anyone started shouting, I took a deep breath and bellowed. Everyone stay calm, we have the powerful magicians Alan and Miss Katerina here, we'll be fine, the children who've fallen down are just asleep, it's not life-threatening. The students who haven't fallen looked at me. Looking anxious or scared would be bad right now. I put on a desperately calm face as I kept talking. You bigger kids, take the fallen kids to the school building. The library is closer, but it's better to have the doctor examine them. So I'd like you to carry them to the schoolhouse. It's a little far away, but it's okay. Miss Katerina and Alan will protect everyone. When I appealed to the two big names for safety, it felt like the students' faces changed a bit. A student from the Knights College, a fifth year or higher, said, Right, let's do as Lady Ryu of the Certain Victory says. Knights College students and those with good physiques, grab a fallen kid. The boys came to the center of the area and stopped by the fallen kids. Meanwhile, pink droppings continued to fall, but Alan immediately covered them with earth and no damage was done. Also, Ritz seemed to have succeeded in covering the entire area where the students are with wind spirit magic, so even if droppings fall, they're carried away and don't fall near the students. Amazing. Great Teacher Ritz. Should I have included the big name of Great Teacher Ritz in my speech just now, to calm the students? Protected by Ritz's wind, if we all move together, we may somehow be able to reach the school building. If we can get to the school building, there will be teachers. For now, let's go that way. In a whisper nobody could hear, I chanted my healing magic to heal the thigh wound I'd given myself earlier. My head was still woozy from the pink mist, but that's alright. My wounds were healed, so I should be able to move as usual like this. I was a little sleepy. Even so, why is a demon in a place like this? I thought. Looking up at the demon in the sky, the demon was going back and forth in the sky, dropping off dung. The manure dropped was obstructed by great teacher Ritz and buried by Alan, but they're still dropping. Most demons shouldn't even be able to come here where there were people, because of the barriers. However, it seemed there were some demons that can rip open the barrier from the inside and escape. Did a deer in the barrier just happen to occur this time? I remembered what I'd thought before. Right. The demon barriers are just things like rivers or ropes strung up. They might have failed because of the recent rain. Honestly, I didn't understand how the barriers work. But it's said that a barrier can stop working if there's a break. What if the river flooded with all the heavy rain? What if a barrier rope got washed away by a landslide or something? Would it be able to carry out the function of a barrier? It may be the case that there's more than one demon that made it to where people are. Even as I thought that. The demon's movements changed, it stopped dropping manure, slowed its flying, and examined our situation. It was clear we weren't falling down even when dung was dropped, so it might have noticed it was making no progress. Even though it was a demon, it seemed to have some intelligence. If the demon approached in a direct, low swoop, that would be bad. If it comes to a direct attack, I didn't think Ritz's wind alone could defend us. But I had the feeling a demon who'd grown tired of waiting could very likely do such a thing. Before it did something bad, I'd better take action now. Miss Katerina, are you able to direct your wind magic at the demon and fell it? I asked Miss Katerina, who was watching the demon's movements as we ran. I don't know whether I can, but I'll try. 
she said and glared at the sky. Sharatsa iuni kazan of yuka shiku akinu at jura nukitama nutameza kairai goyu. The wind blowing over autumn fields scatters the dew like unstrung beads. When she cast the spell a strong wind flew toward the demon and it faltered a little in the sky, its balance upset, but not to the point that it fell, it's hard, it's a little too far, my power drops off. Miss Katerina said, frustrated, and stopped. I stopped, too, to find out what the problem was. Miss Katerina, if you stop, you'll be separated from the group. She'd also be outside the protection of Ritz's dung warding wind. But if that demon strikes at us directly, Ritz's spirit twins won't be able to stop it. So I'll keep firing off my magic and catch the demon's attention. You, you run along with everyone else. Eh? No. Was she gonna become a decoy? No, but what about the danger? What Miss Katerina said was correct. If that demon plunged into this many people, there would absolutely be injuries. Some people were even carrying other people. There was no way they could avoid it. What Katerina's saying is pretty much on track. I'm going to stay here, too. You, you go. Miss Salom came up next to us before I noticed and spoke in my ear. This is the chance for me to defend Miss Katerina to the end. As she whispered to me, she had a face as determined as that of Miss Katerina. T then I'm staying with you, too. For when something happens, Miss Katerina, please continue to fire your wind magic. It stumbled. So if you keep hitting it, I don't think it will have a chance to attack. I know. In fact, I'm going to knock it down. Miss Katerina, full of motivation chanted the spell and sent out continued wind gusts. Apparently, if you cast a spell once, for about ten seconds you can invoke the magic repeatedly without chanting. Alan, who was a little ahead of us, noticed that we weren't following and ran back to us. Hey, you guys, what are you? I'm going to beat the demon down with my wind magic, you go protect the others. Miss Katerina said, continuing to focus her magic and her glare on the demon. Though the demon faltered, it turned its full awareness on Miss Katerina. She had begun her role as a decoy, over there, Ritz. I'm helping, too. Alan turned back to the group of students still running ahead, then back to Ritz, who nodded and continued with the students. Perhaps it was the men's bond of eye contact, giving a feeling like leave it to me. I was glad Alan was here. In case Katerina was in danger, it was reassuring that we now had two magicians. Alan. Do you have any way to attack enemies in the sky? If I throw some more, I can make a sword and stab it, but it's too far for now. I can also use wind magic, but my power is less than Katarina's. It won't have much effect even if it hits. Then, let's just go with wind magic. Can you make a whirlwind and hit the demon with my deluxe chili pepper bomb? Is the pepper bomb that powder you made me eat when we dueled a long time ago? Oh, okay that might work. Alan recalled the horrors of his past for a moment, but, though nervous, he agreed to my suggestion and cast the spell. I took the chili bomb from my bag and threw it to the ground a short way away. The container broke and Alan lifted the powder that came out into the sky with a whirling gust of wind. The red whirlwind, saturated with chili pepper, hit the demon head on, but it didn't seem to flinch much. I took out a binocular-like long-distance viewing item from my bag and observed that the monster was shedding tears with a runny nose, but it was otherwise calm. No, it might have been scowling a little. Ah, it sneezed, but it did so calmly. Or rather, Miss Katerina's wind magic seemed to be more troublesome for the demon, so it was caught up with getting rid of her and didn't notice the red whirlwind Alan and I had made nearby. Yeah. It didn't seem to have much effect. I have heard that birds have incredible eye moisturization to protect against flying dust and sand. That demon may be strong against dust and debris. It's no use. Seems to have no effect. This really isn't my strong point, but I could set it on fire if I had a spark. At the report of our killer move having no effect, Alan gave a timid proposal. R. Fire. That's good, right? If he needs a spark. I have just the thing. I took the matches out of my bag and lit one on fire. Eh? What's that? Fire? How? Huh? For now, please just use your magic on this fire and hit that thing. I, I understand. 
I pushed the lit match into Alan's hands. 112. The Mystery of Magic 15, Attack of the Flying Demon, Part 2. With a great ruhr, the fire flew straight at the demon as if from a flamethrower, but before it hit the demon, Alan's gout of fire petered out and disappeared. It's no good, with my fire magic. The enemy is too far, the fire runs out halfway. Seriously? Then how did your wind magic get the chili pepper bomb to swirl around the demon? If the fire can get to where a chili pepper cloud is, the powder could act as a fuse, and the flame attack may hit the demon. I checked the number of red chili bombs in my bag, there were two left, I feel like that's too few. By the way, Alan, can you make fire while manipulating wind magic? No, I can't, I'm good at water and earth magic, but with other magic, although I can use them, I'm not skillful enough to use them at the same time, Ritz might be able to. W what? Great fire magician Ritz makes a comeback, however, Ritz who was carrying an injured person with the advance group, was already quite far ahead. Oh, they're almost at the back door of the school building. The demon was paying no attention at all over there, facing us alone. It had stopped trying to fly overhead with the pink droppings sleeping drug and was just flying here. But when it tried to fly over here, Miss Katerina's expert wind sent it flying away so that it couldn't hurt us. The decoy was a huge success, for now. If the students carrying the wounded can reach the school building, our original purpose will have been achieved. After that, we just have to defeat the demon somehow. Yeah, well, I say that, but it's gonna be extremely difficult. Looking back at the demon, although it was flinching when Miss Katerina's gusts hit it, it kept moving closer and then further away, as if moving in a circle. It seemed to be building up a little resistance to the wind magic. It felt like it was better able to deal with the blasts. Oh no, that's bad. Since the wind magic was weaker when the demon was up in the sky, it was less likely to be knocked back. Once it noticed and got some distance, this demon that likely had a little learning ability could come attack by building up speed and swooping in. Depending on its momentum, Miss Katerina's wind magic may not be able to prevent it. The group of students Ritz was escorting had already arrived at the back doors. They seem to be giving priority to sending injured students inside. Good. He might be back to fight, soon. I examined the demon in the sky again. It was incredibly huge compared to normal birds. It was about two meters long, including the tail. If it spread its wings, it would probably be four or five meters wide. Its face was that of a human, like an old woman with messy gray hair. Looking at the crone's face, it looked troubled as it flew with a runny nose thanks to my chili bomb, and the demon didn't give the impression of being able to move too quickly even looking at its movements so far, excuse me, I have a suggestion, Miss Katerina, please hear me out, even if you keep hitting it with your wind magic, I don't think you'll be able to beat that demon, the other students have gotten to the school building safely, since we don't have to worry about our surroundings anymore, let's prepare for a real fight. I'd like to bring that thing to our location and attack it simultaneously, however, it seems like the only time we can get it here is when it's swooping in for an attack. So we'll need to go with attacking it while also avoiding it. Could everyone do that? I was a little unsure, and when my words faltered, Katerina and Alan gave me a powerful nod as if to show their resolve. I understand, that's good, let's do it. Miss Katerina replied still watching and firing her wind magic at the demon. It's fine, as a night student, I'm quite strong, you know. I have confidence in my reflexes. I'll also protect Katerina. Me too, since I've trained with the sword since I was a small boy. I should be fine. Miss Salom and Alan replied. Hearing everyone's words and seeing their faces, I felt my resolve harden again. Thank you all very much. First, Alan. Would you make swords for Salome and me? Also, Katerina, stop using your wind magic after this, but the demon may release more of its pink droppings, so if that attack comes, please have your magic ready to blow it away. Salome, please focus on protecting Miss Katerina, who will likely be its primary target. If you're directly attacked, don't try to counterattack, just put all your effort into getting away so that we don't hit each other. Alan and I will perform the attack on the demon. 
When we were finished with our little huddle, Miss Katerina ceased her wind magic that had been continually forcing the demon back from its attacks. The demon, suspicious at the sudden lack of attacks, flew doubtfully around in the sky. It casually sent some droppings flying. How can that demon poop so much? It wasn't doing what we'd imagined. It's being very cautious. Like this. It might not even get within the range where my attacks can reach it. It might just fly low enough to throw some droppings at us. If that happens, we'll rely on Alan, who has a medium range attack. Oh, okay. As I hurriedly pinned my hopes on Alan, being useless myself, the demon's movement changed. It stopped flying around in circles, pretending to keep a distance from us. It came down from the sky, facing us. It came. Having faced wind magic's attacks until just now, the demon, knowing it was Miss Katerina, aimed at her. Also, as I'd guessed earlier, it released droppings, as in our huddle. Miss Katerina blew away the droppings with her wind magic. And, though the demon decided to try aiming for Miss Katerina, who was neglecting her defense to concentrate on her magic, Miss Salome, the knight, protected her but she only succeeded in protecting her from the demon's attack by shoving her down. Just as the demon missed Miss Katerina, Alan made a magic wall of earth in front of us. The demon, running face first into the erupting earth wall, dropped like a stone. Then, although I'd only run a short distance, I smelled that sweet Roma again. The thing seemed to have soiled itself as it collapsed. Everyone stay away. It submitted that sleeping stuff again. Please blow the smell away with wind. After that, the wind blew again and it didn't smell sweet, but I had breathed in a little. My head buzzing again, I hurriedly took a sage leaf from my bag and put it in my mouth. It was a spicy herb so hot it brought tears to my eyes. Mamak who occasionally mixed it into her medicines. I, too, had taken to carrying around some herbs, since I made medicines and beauty products for myself. Thanks to the stimulation of the sage leaf filling my mouth. I was somehow able to blink away sleep, keep my distance, and throw my sword at the demon's body. I hit near the wing, I didn't think it would be able to fly anymore, but the demon still had its sleep inducing attack. I lit a match again. Alan, please burn it with your fire magic. Alan said. I got it, cast a spell on the match, and shot a flamethrower like spur to fire at the demon. Since the distance was so short this time, the demon was engulfed by the full force of the flames. Once the demon caught on fire, it spread through its whole body, driven by Miss Katerina's odor-dispersing wind. Ah, ah! The demon's dying screech sounded a bit human. With a face like an old woman and the cry of a human, it was a bit hard to bear. But even if it was hard to bear, we couldn't go easy on it. Unable to look away, we all stared silently at the squealing demon as it burned. And when we were no longer able to hear the demon's voice, Miss Katerina recollected herself and cast a spell. The fire burning the demon intensified a little, and the demon quickly collapsed. When the demon's form was lost to the flames, Alan and Miss Katerina stopped chanting their spells, and as the fire died down Alan put it out with some water. Only ashes remained. We had defeated the demon. That was my third encounter with a demon. Once, when I was a bandit, I was attacked by a demon that appeared in the form of my mother. The second time, I encountered a demon at the Mana Drain as a first year. At that second time, Sir Cain had cut its arm off with a sword, and Henry had quickly dropped it with his magic. I had also thrown a coin, but this time, I had gone head to head with a demon, holding a sword and facing off against it. It's a first. Honestly, I was terrified. And, maybe, if I hadn't guessed right, the demon might have. Everyone. Are you safe? Those ashes. You beat the demon? I looked over and Ritz was wheezing, his hands on his knees. Apparently, he'd gotten the students into the school building and come back before I knew it. I tried to give the worried Ritz an answer and realized I still had a mouth full of sage leaves. The tingling sensation was painful, and I spit it out. It left a refreshing taste in my mouth. But my head was still fuzzy. It seemed the drowsy effect wasn't conveniently dispelled when the demon was defeated. Yeah, we beat it. Obviously, with me here, it's only natural. While I was distracted by the sage, Miss Katerina answered Ritz. Miss Katerina who'd been looking quite pale just a moment ago, 
She actually still looked pale, but she must have recovered from the shock of the demon to be speaking so confidently now. Katerina, I got you out of the way of the demon's attack but I had to tackle you at full strength. Are you hurt? I'm fine, Salome. And, um, thank you. Because of you, I... I knew that you would protect me, so I was able to concentrate on my spells. Miss Katerina, who had looked pale a few moments ago, blushed and squirmed as she talked about Miss Salome's care for her. Miss Salome gave Miss Katerina a gentle smile and patted her head. We survived due to your wind magic, she praised, as though she were a good little sister, or perhaps a husband, or a pet. No, let's not think about this. If I let myself... I could imagine Miss Katerina's ringlets as dog's ears. Ah, I imagined it already. It might have been Ritz's arrival that chased away the tension and let in this cozy atmosphere, but somehow I was still afraid. I had a very bad feeling. When I caught Talon's eye, he looked down as well. But, why is a demon? The moment he muttered, a wind that was artificial rather than natural began to blow. I knew this wind. This was a magic wind. A magic that let voices carry and we heard a voice. This is an emergency. Multiple demons are invading the school. Students on campus should take refuge in the auditorium. Repeat. This is an emergency. Multiple demons are invading the school. It was the voice of the principal. He was probably casting his voice throughout the school via wind magic. The wind magic confirmed what I had most feared. Multiple demons were invading the school. Ah. As I suspected, the demon who had come to the school wasn't the only one. The barrier had been broken by the heavy rain. 113. Extra Chapter 3, Charlotte Cruel's Story. A type of village called a pioneering village, that had only recently been built. Our village had been ordered to grow primarily wheat in our fields, but it wasn't going well, and we always relied on the food supplied by our lord. Since I was a child, I had been able to see things that others around me couldn't. I later learned that they were spirits, but when I was in the village I didn't know that. However, when I talked about them to my friends and parents, they thought it was creepy, so I pretended not to see them even though I could. With that, I lived peacefully, until one day the Lord's envoy, who always distributed our food, didn't appear. At first, the adults in the village thought he'd be there in a few days but after waiting, he still didn't come. At that time, the thought that our village might have been abandoned hadn't even entered our heads. So the village people assumed that he must have gotten lost or something. But, since we couldn't live with the distributions, the village starved. Graves multiplied, the frailest of our children couldn't survive, and black things only I could see began flooding into the village. They looked like gnats and shone with a flickering black light so that I couldn't quite make them out. The black things swarmed around the weak people in the village. As there was no one in the village who had eaten their fill, nobody was free of the black things, either. Including me, the villagers watered their fields, hoping crops would eventually grow, but I could tell nothing would grow in them. The fields were already dead because the black things were all over them. The way things were going, the village would be annihilated so it was agreed that a representative would be sent to petition the Lord. Thinking back now, we should have done so much sooner, but we were a passive lot who had never even thought of it. End of Block 2